Hey everybody, it's Chugga Conroy, and welcome to the compilation of all of our weapon guides for Splatoon 2. In the description, you will find timestamps with every single weapon's initial explanation. If you'd rather not watch through seven hours, oh my god, I can't believe how big this was. Besides that, I want to thank you for your feedback on these. Numerous little changes made it into this video, from equipment recommendations to map recommendations to informative errors, those sorts of things. It would be kind of impossible to go over every single change that was made because there were just so many little ones, but I want to thank you all for commenting and helping shape this. Now, on with the show! Let's learn. We're starting off with the weapon that begins every kid's journey to be the hippest and hottest squid in town, the Splattershot Junior! And just because it's the first weapon doesn't mean it's bad, it's actually quite viable. With its high fire rate, good spread, and high mobility, it strafes all around covering the ground very, very fast. In fact, it has a lot of stamina to keep sustaining this over time. The bullets are already small and thus don't consume a lot of ink, but the special trait that sets apart the Splattershot Jr. from all other weapons is its high capacity ink tank, giving it 110% the normal ink capacity. Of course, the trade-off is that the gun itself isn't so strong at fighting. Ducking in quick, ducking out quicker is the way to go to make sure that you're not confronted in a situation where you're outreached. To aid in this, the spread of fire is so good that it often automatically covers the user's feet in ink, allowing them to swim away with ease. When staying to fight, the spread is so wide it can cause the bullets to curve around the target when not firing at point-blank range. This is at its worst in the air, where shot accuracy is at its lowest. As for damage, the bullets each do 28 of the 100 damage needed to splat. Having to give someone a hug to damage them and it's still taking 4 hits is pretty bad. Thankfully, every weapon is equipped with a sub-weapon to complement its playstyle, and the Splattershot Jr. is equipped with Splat Bomb! You'll be seeing a lot of this sub-weapon, as it's the most common out of any sub-weapon in Splatoon 2. How nice of them to put it on the first weapon so we can get used to it. These are grenades that explode one second after touching an object or surface, but the timer pauses if it's in the air. A great way to use these is to roll them off the ledge instead of throwing so the enemy has no time to react when it lands in front of them. The epicenter of the blast is a very certain one-hit kill on 180 damage, while the splash damage is 30. This can get a kill all on its own if thrown at an awkward time for the opponent or just using slope terrain to one's advantage. Even if it doesn't end up killing, it's still immediate pressure that can get someone to come out of hiding or move away. If they're advancing on you, throwing a bomb is a great way to stop them in their tracks. It's the spacing game. The bomb has good throwing range, and it's easy to toss it onto a super jump marker to instantly kill somebody coming in. Conversely, splat bombs are a nice way to bring someone down with you when you think you're gonna die. A last point about the splat bomb is that it counters many non-player objects. It instantly detonates and deals full damage to Ballers, Bubble Blowers, the Rainmaker Shield, and Brella Shields. When throwing a bomb at an object, nearby enemies take full damage from it as well. This is especially useful against Splash Walls, which will still take a lot of damage even if the bomb doesn't hit anybody. In Turf Wars, throw it at the very end of a time limit. Already thrown bombs are allowed to detonate and can be the difference that wins it for the team. Capping off the raw stats, sub-weapons tend to be costly and can usually only be used one time without a reload. But that's where the Splattershot Jr. is different. Thanks to that big ink tank, it can fire a respectable number of shots after tossing a bomb. Such a potent attack that reaches outside the Jr.'s normal range gives it nice attacking options. For best results, cutting off an enemy's route with a bomb and then opening fire as they're busy reacting to said bomb gives you the advantage. Hide, and make sure that you've got the initiative. Well, unless you've got your special. Every weapon has a powerful special weapon that is built up by covering the ground with lots of ink. The requirement is different for all weapons, even if they have the same special. So try out different weapons that have the same special because they're not all identical in playstyle and viability. For this little gun, it's the Ink Armor, easily one of the most useful specials in the game. This grants armor to every living member of the team, and it will negate at least 30 points of damage and turn it into knockback. And it doesn't negatively affect any stats in the process. 
Everyone affected can still shoot, use their sub-weapon, and do everything else as normal. In addition to the 30 points of damage it absorbs, there's a small window of invulnerability during the time that it breaks. To prevent hoarding it, Ink Armor automatically destroys itself 6 seconds after activation. Watch the special meter in the corner to visually see when this'll happen. Communicating when the Ink Armor is almost ready over voice chat assures that two players with Ink Armor chain it together instead of activating it at the same time and wasting it. Ink Armor is a good counter to other Ink Armors as a reaction play. Due to how flexible it is, high level play actually will run two Ink Armor users on a team quite a bit. Now, other specials are important and this doesn't mean every team should only have Ink Armor. What I am saying is that this is a great special to bring into randoms because it doesn't hurt to have it twice. Next, I'd like to talk a little bit about Super Jump. After 1.5 seconds of startup time, any player can move to any teammate's side or back to spawn with this. Ink Armor makes this 1.5 seconds less of a downside and makes it easy to super jump away if things are getting hairy. Retreating is a valid tactic. Every special weapon gives an instant ink reload in addition to its normal effects, but just because it looks like a defensive shield and gives free ink, don't use it as an emergency panic button. Very rarely will a special be viable in immediately threatening situations because they take a moment to activate. As you can see, the ink armor lost all of its charge because it died just far enough into the activation, whereas if I just took the death, I would only lose half. While I'm telling you what not to do with it, there are two major downsides of ink armor to balance out its usefulness. For one, ink armor makes all squid's eyes glow during activation. There is no way to mitigate this. Second, ink armor can be pierced. You'll see this when being shoved backwards significantly if the damage is greater than 100 in a single hit. All the damage over 100 gets through. This gets into the only situation where a player can die in ink armor. While fumbling around an enemy ink, the ink armor can get so damaged that the pierce damage is over 100. On the note of weaknesses, ink armor is well countered by explosions. Remember how the splat bomb had splash damage that was exactly 30 at bare minimum? That's a common trend. Pretty much any indirect blast damage is exactly enough to destroy ink armor, and it's how others are going to try to get you out of it. So what does all this mean for the Splattershot Jr.? First of all, it has one of the cheapest special costs of any ink armor weapon. It has the easiest time building it up out of all of them. It's already great for a weapon that's not so good at fighting, allowing it to take more gunfire. But with such good mobility and turfing prowess, that means it's going to earn this ability all the time and be a help to the entire team on a constant basis. It's also nice being able to throw out a bomb for free while effectively having more health than the opponent when using all three pieces together. The frequent ink armor is what I would call the Splattershot Jr.'s greatest asset, and your decision to play it is going to come down to whether or not you feel not being a good fighter is a fair trade for that. That's all this weapon does for you, now to move on to what you can do for your weapon! I sound like I'm running for president. <laughs> Everyone in Inkopolis goes into their fights wearing clothes, you sloppy pig! Like it or not, you're wearing a hat, a shirt, and some shoes. Each one of these has one main slot that contributes greatly to your abilities, and three smaller sub-slots that contribute less and are rolled randomly upon leveling it up. Chances for certain abilities to be rolled are weighted depending on the clothing brand that manufactured it, so pay attention to the brand just as much as you would pay attention to the ability. In this section, we'll be covering not just abilities, but clothing brands that commonly benefit the weapon. Since this is our first time seeing any of these abilities at all, let's go over what each of them does. First of all, I'd like to give special attention to Damage Up! Because it's not in this game, good thing to be aware of. Moving on to what is in this game is Main Power Up! This raises the performance of the main weapon in some meaningful way, and it's different for every weapon. We'll be going over its effect for every single new main weapon so you know what it does. Main Power Up makes the Splattershot Jr.'s bullets expand after hitting the ground. I don't recommend it, but at least now you know. With each new introduction of a sub-weapon and a special weapon, I'll be going over the effects of the ability Sub Power Up and Special Power Up, as they have wildly different abilities that are good to know. Sub Power Up on Splat Bombs raises the throwing range and throwing speed. Probably not going to be much help either. Special Power Up unfortunately does not give Ink Armor more health, and that's what I'm here to debunk. It very slightly, and I mean slightly, reduces the activation time and gives it to the special duration. 
Now for the abilities that actually don't suck and that I do recommend, Run Speed Up! Affects movement speed and kid form, whether or not you're firing. The junior wants to move around and keep shooting. This allows it to strafe around covering more ground faster. Run Speed Up is a stackable ability, and all stackable abilities have diminishing returns to discourage stacking only one power. I hate to tell you, but they want you to have creativity. Special Charge Up is an ability I recommend alongside it. Less points necessary to build up that ink armor. Compound this with Run Speed Up, and it'll be getting that armor swimmingly. Speaking of being fast, Swim Speed Up is one of the greatest abilities out there, and there's very few weapons that wouldn't play it. Every weapon has a defined weight class, and even though the Splattershot Jr. is a lightweight, meaning that it gets the least amount of return out of Swim Speed Up, being able to outmaneuver and get away from an opponent at close range is a great thing indeed. An ability that I recommend playing just a teeny bit of, doesn't need more than one or two sub-slots, is the incredibly over-the-top name, BOMB DEFENSE UP DX! Reduces the damage taken from most bombs and some special weapons too. Plus it mitigates any tracking abilities for those who need stealth. One sub-slot goes a long way, instantly making it harder for ink jets to take you out. The benefits even expand into ink armor, making it so that less indirect explosions are likely to destroy it. Next is Ink Resistance Up. It reduces damage and movement penalties from touching enemy ink, but that's not what we like about it. We want it because ink armor gets less dinged up from touching enemy ink when it's on. I don't recommend running a lot of this. Two sub-slots is the optimal amount. Normally, it only takes one frame in enemy ink to start taking damage. With two sub-slots, it's 40 frames. Another very commonly played ability is Ink Saver Sub. With that big ink tank on the Splattershot Jr., it's possible to throw two splat bombs on one tank with two mains and one sub of it. Being able to spam splat bombs Splam bombs is a unique trait that only the Splattershot Jr. can do. It's very worth running and makes the bombs available in more situations. Next, I'm going to tell you about a situational ability that I personally really, really like. Last Ditch Effort. This is our first example of a mutually exclusive ability. In this case, it's only found on hats, so it must be considered over other hat exclusive abilities. Last Ditch Effort begins its activation 30 seconds from the end of a turf war, or when the enemy is within 50 points of winning a rank battle. Other than that, it does nothing. But when activated, that one main slot turns into eight sub-slots of Ink Saver Main, Ink Saver Sub, and Ink Recovery Up. It's able to keep up the pressure, keep those reloads short, and this by itself will allow double bombing. It can be a great ability, but it can also do nothing for you. I don't recommend this in most modes, but in splat zones where there's the most back and forth and your opponents are likely to at least score some points, this is a good ability. And now for the last section, some hip hangouts. It's just as necessary to know the maps that play to a weapon's strains as it is to know how the weapon itself works. These aren't every map that the Splattershot Jr. is good on, just some cream of the crop options that should get across how it plays pretty well. I'm doing it this way because I want to help you find your favorite weapon you didn't know existed, and also because I want to encourage not blindly only playing one weapon. One of the best pieces of advice I can give is to adjust to the situation. Today is the most basic average automatic gun with balanced stats, the one to get you used to all the game's mechanics, the Splattershot! It's easy to learn and just good enough at everything that it can still work at high levels of play. Beyond the average range, average damage, and average fire rate, this is our first example of a middleweight weapon. In line with everything else, middleweight is the most common weight class of all weapons, so yeah, it has average mobility too. It might sound like it has no identity of its own, but if anything sets it apart, it's its great ink economy of the shots combined with its decent spread. In addition, it's a great fighter having a short time to splat. The bare minimum time it takes is exactly one fourth of a second, making it one of the fastest killers out there. If there's any outright weakness to this weapon, it has nothing to do with the gun itself. It's the Splat Dualies. They're very similar in terms of stats, but the Splattershot lacks the additional tool of being able to dodge, a unique trait to the Dually weapon class. So oftentimes, it takes more work for a Splattershot to win once Dualies have challenged them. It's a standout, frustrating matchup to look out for. Basic mechanics are out in the open, let's talk strategy. Specifically, I want to talk about a technique known as substrafing. Don't be intimidated by the name, this is not one of those 10 frame perfect input in a row fighting game techniques that who has the time to learn it, no. 
Just hold down R to get your sub weapon ready, turn into a squid, and while still holding R, pop out of squid form to change direction. Simple as that. This allows turning on a dime, being instantly at full speed, losing the least amount of momentum possible. It is the best way to strafe and the fastest way to move all around to dodge attacks. This is possible on every single weapon, but is most helpful on shooters meant for combat. Between this technique and the core stats being good at everything, the splatter shot is what you make it. It's an easy to learn weapon and excellent to pick up for anyone wanting to learn the shooter class. It's able to play defensively and outmaneuver the heavy stuff. It's capable of sneak attacks and getting out of trouble. It's capable of zipping around all over the place and getting in people's faces. And speaking of doing that, its sub weapon is a first bomb, the burst bomb. This is a less lethal bomb that detonates on contact with any floor, wall, or unfortunate sap, costing only 40% of the ink tank to use. On its own, the burst bomb can be thrown twice without a reload and gets a kill in two hits if your aim is true. It's not without its combat uses either, even if it doesn't immediately kill. It's quick pressure at range dealing with snipers or just checking if there is one there. The damage is just enough to destroy objects instantly, get other players out of ink armor, or finish someone off if they just barely didn't die in a scrap with a teammate. If your friend's involved in a fight and you can't get over there to help them directly, toss a burst bomb their way. It might be the difference. But my favorite application personally is that it gives far more movement options to whoever's carrying it. No more having to shoot walls. It paints almost any wall in an instant and you don't even need to slow down to climb up it. It also functions as a nice touch-up tool. If that ink isn't going to anything, might as well cover up the bits of enemy ink to keep moving and get some free points. As for what this does for the splatter shot, it's excellent as an immediate way to ink up an enemy's escape route just before getting the jump on them. Because we like exact numbers, a direct hit is always 60 damage while an indirect hit is 25 to 35 depending on proximity. Given that the splatter shot hits for 35 per bullet, it's always at least two shots to kill after using the bomb. Bombing then shooting is slower than shooting alone, but it's insurance making sure they don't get away or just making it easier to land the kill. Of course, in some situations, it seems more advantageous to just shoot, and that's fine. Versatility is what makes the burst bomb so potent. If someone's getting away and it seems like you're gonna have to give chase into their ink to go after them, don't play their game. Toss a burst bomb at them from out of range and there you go. It's not often talked about, but the burst bomb is surprisingly a very rare sub weapon. They're very sparing with giving this to strong weapons, so that might be a reason to play this kit all on its own. For the last point about it, the effective sub power up on burst bombs is the same as any other bomb. Increased throwing range and increased throwing speed. Not recommended. Time for the special and it's a first timer. Redundancy on both of the explanations, it's the SPLASHDOWN! This is a weird one, and not just because it evokes the question of, hey, this isn't a weapon, so why don't they just punch the ground all the time? This attack has a windup of leaping into the air, staying there for a moment, and splashing down. The Swirling Vortex of Death does 180 damage to anything it hits, while the splash damage is anywhere from 55 to 70. The one hit kill range is outright shown to all players with a marker as soon as the animation starts. A splashdown will always defuse bombs in its area and gets massive bonus damage against bubble blowers, booyah bombs, ballers, and even just the splash damage alone is enough to defuse ink armor. Splashdowns also hit surprisingly high up, making them a decent counter to ink jet as well. This is very much the anti-special special. It is not an emergency panic button to dodge attacks and counter with a one hit kill, contrary to what earlier balance patches would have you believe. Other players can see when you have your special and with practice, its predictable movement can be reacted to and shot at especially if clicking the stick is a first reaction to already being shot. It won't take many bullets to take down the little health you have left. Thankfully, if it's shot down mid-attack, it only loses 25% of the special gauge instead of the usual 50. So, glad they thought of that. The best uses for splashdowns are when it's not easily seen and reacted to, or from up on high ledges where it's much more difficult to shoot at and the height is rewarded with a larger damage area below, though no additional surfacing. Just so you know, jumping is always a part of the animation even if you are already jumping. That is, unless it's a super jump. Yep, splashdowns can be activated mid super jump and attack upon landing. This is useful in punishing players camping the super jump marker, or just in remembering that super jumping is allowed at any time during a fight and could be a big help to push forward. 
Following the rule of greater height being rewarded, the most bang for your buck is activating it at the apex of a super jump because it's the only situation where the jump part of it can be skipped. The one hit kill area is still announced to all players when super jumping, but with this good timing, it means the damage comes out in two thirds the amount of time mitigating this downside. In splat zones, this is often a free stopper on the enemy timer, if not an instant kill on whoever was locked in a firefight with the person you were jumping to. Onto mode specific properties, all clams are dropped upon splashing down. If you don't know what this means, don't worry. As a last usage, splashdown should be used at the end of a turf war for some free points as the last seconds are so crucial. Special power up has a weird effect on splashdowns, increasing the size of the maximum splash damage area, but does not make the one hit kill area any larger or turf the ground any better. Had a lot to say about this special, but everything we've been over already applies to the splatter shot. Furthering the versatility of the burst bomb, it's great getting enemies stuck in the ink from the splashdown and then following up with a burst bomb thanks to that splash damage. You get a free reload and even regain control before the splashdown animation is over. It just gets so many kills. The requirement for this splashdown is 170 points. Low cost, mixed with easy turfing. For gear on the splatter shot, there's some first timer abilities to go over, such as comeback. For 20 seconds after every respawn, the user is granted four subs of Ink Saver Main, Ink Saver Sub, Ink Recovery Up, Run Speed Up, Swim Speed Up, and Special Charge Up. Any frontline fighter who's fighting and dying a lot in ranked battles benefits from this a lot, and it pairs well with another mutually exclusive ability. Found only on shoes, Stealth Jump. It hides the super jump marker from other players if they're standing even just a short distance away. And this pairs with yet another ability, Quick Super Jump, does exactly what it says, shortens the startup time for super jumps. It's one of the most economical abilities in the game. The base windup is 1.35 seconds of vulnerability, and just one sub-slot of Quick Super Jump lowers that to 0.97 seconds. No need to stack, just one sub-slot will do it. The effective main power up on splatter shots is less shot deviation while jumping. Might help a little, but not worth stacking a ton. Other than that, due to how remarkably average the splatter shot is, pretty much every ability will offer it some meaningful buff. You can't go wrong by running a little bit of a lot of different abilities. As an extension of that logic, your map rotations are very open-ended for this one. It's a nice safe pick pretty much no matter what the rotation says. And now for something a little different. All weapons have multiple kits available, offering different playstyles, and the first of these is the Tenatech Splattershot. On all alternate kits, the main weapon is exactly the same in every way. The difference comes in the physical appearance, so it can be picked out during normal gameplay, the sub-weapon, the special weapon, and the amount of ink required to charge up that special weapon. The Splat Bomb is back once again as the sub-weapon. Told you it was common. With a more well-rounded gun, it's easy to use splat bombs to manipulate enemies into doing what you want or to trap them. Now that we have a combat-oriented gun with splat bombs, I'd like to tell you about an easy-to-grasp tactic known as pre-firing. Whenever you know an enemy is hiding behind an object or inside a corridor, use the bomb to force them to move and gain the advantage. A bomb is an immediate threat that will kill them if it explodes too close by. So throw the bomb in a way that blocks their retreat, fire where they have to move, and make them swim into you. By firing in the natural direction they have to go to avoid taking the bomb, it creates a pincer effect that gives you the advantage. All weapons with bombs are capable of pulling this off, but I feel this is the first time where it's a very viable strategy. Just watch out for your ink consumption. Moving on to the special weapon, not all is familiar here. We have the special weapon known as Ink Jet. A jetpack armed with a cannon, because one of those things on its own wasn't kick-ass enough. Upon activation, a marker is placed on the user's current position. Remember that bit for later. Getting airborne takes a moment and is a very vulnerable time, so we're three for three on specials not making good panic buttons. Once in the air, it gets a maximum of seven exploding shots with the range of a splatter scope. Since most would argue the splatter scope is the longest range viable weapon, that's some damn good range. Direct shots are certain death, while indirect shots are good for finishing already damaged foes hitting for 30 to 50 damage. Though, the shots travel slowly and the crosshair is often dated by the time the shot arrives. Leading fire is important, but the shots are also good at cutting off enemy escape routes and hitting them with a little splash damage to make them easier to take out than shooting directly at them. 
I hope you remember the first bit because after 7.5 seconds of base time, or after falling into a death plane, the inkjet will eject its holder back to the original marker. The inkjet also comes with some more obscure properties. It's held in the air by two streams of ink. These do 0.5 damage per frame of running over an enemy, which is... something, I guess. More importantly, I bring this up because these jets need to push off a solid object to stay elevated. If it's over a grate, the whole thing plummets. The special is pretty intricate, so how are we gonna use it exactly? First, hiding the activation in places not seen by common camera angles is a good start. Another option is activating it high up to get a good view of the action and make it so enemies who want to challenge you make themselves very obvious when climbing up. It can reach high points on maps that no other weapon can, making for unique sniper perches the user can duck behind or just sitting too high for anybody to hit. Get a good view of the action and shoot. Because it has a hard time hitting its mark by itself, shooting where allies are fighting is where you're going to be most helpful and likely to finish off damaged targets. While the flight might offer some unique shot opportunities, the downside is that it turns you into a slow, attention-grabby target. If the heat's on, remember the inkjet has more movement options than merely moving side to side. The inkjet can jump to dodge or jump repeatedly to slow a descent while falling. A lot of players spam this because they think it makes them harder to hit, but it doesn't give a lot of benefit and can be very predictable. It's better used for quick corrections and dodges. Don't be in mid-jump when a charger can shoot you, have it ready when they open fire. Another way to mix it up is turning into a squid briefly to shrink and be harder to hit. On that note, you are allowed to go back down into the ink and swim around with it, but this wastes a lot of the special duration and I wouldn't recommend doing it if it can be avoided. A really weird property is that the eject marker is placed in the player's last ground position. This can be used to not die, but it uses up the entire special gauge, whereas just dying would only lose half. You can use it if you want to, but you probably don't. All in all, I would say the inkjet is a weird special that takes considerably more skill to play than others. You're not gonna waste an ink armor as long as you know the right time to activate it. Meanwhile, you could activate an inkjet at the right time, and the shots are just wasted if you suck. The inkjet is a more situational special that might not be everyone's cup of tea, but it has its merits because it's a hard counter to the Stingray, a very prominent special in ranked battles. Stingrays have bad mobility and often fire level with the ground hoping to find targets there. The inkjet elevating itself is a good defense against this, and with a long range, it can usually one-shot a Stingray because they can't correct their aim very quickly. As for what this does for the 10 attack, the only synergy an inkjet gets to have with the rest of its kit is how close it likes to be to the action normally, and how well the main and sub can defend themselves after landing when it's over. The 10 attack being decent at fighting and having a good bomb means it isn't totally doomed in these situations. Remember that specials are free reloads and none of those cannon shots used up any real ink, so almost always throw a bomb after landing. A trend not easily observed is that every inkjet weapon has either a bomb or toxic mist for its sub, so the playstyle of the Tenetech is pretty constant for all inkjets. Since this is a first timer, the effect of special power up on inkjets is an increase to the duration and the splash damage radius. Don't play this for the duration, it takes one main and two subs just to potentially get an eighth shot out of it. Play this purely for the blast radius if that's wanted. Moving on to the other abilities, no matter how good your inkjet game is, Sometimes the enemy's just gonna get at the marker and be ready to ambush. This gives special attention to Drop Roller! This is an ability that is technically helpful to every weapon, allowing them to hold a direction on the control stick and dodge that way upon landing from a super jump. The Tenetech gets double duty out of this, be it from the frequent normal super jumping or from the inkjet's eject button. Not only that, but this is more than just a dodge. For three seconds after dodging, the player has effects of run speed up, swim speed up, and ink resist up. These buffs combine with a dodge and the Tenetech's good fighting ability, and it means that it can counter ambushes and live to tell the tale. In case you think this is a replacement for the dodge roll on the dualies, it's actually much slower than the dodge on those weapons. Can't emulate the real thing perfectly, I guess. I'd also like to showcase run speed up in the spotlight. Because there's no such ability as fly speed up, the inkjet benefits from this ability, though only on grates. This is one of the most absurd gear perks there is, and I don't think that many people are aware of it. The whole package here is pretty good at every mapper mode, not bad at anything in particular. 
Just sort of works, doesn't really excel. It's the jack of all trades. Some, but not all weapons, actually have a third kit available. In this case, the monochrome Kenza splatter shot. Its sub-weapon is a first, the suction bomb! These tin cans of compressed death attach to surfaces, have a slightly larger area for one-hit kills, do significantly more damage than splat bombs, and get a slightly larger splash damage area. In return, they take twice as long to detonate as a splat bomb and use a whopping 70% of the ink tank. Due to its long detonation time, use the things that set it apart from the splat bomb first and foremost. Either throw it at objects to instantly detonate and take advantage of the best object damage in the game, or use that suction! Play around with which services it can stick to. Why not try out recon mode on the current map rotation and see everything you can make it stick to? It might surprise you. Some good map terrain to be on the lookout for are corners the enemy has to walk past but might not see a bomb there, the undersides of grades because they can hit anybody standing on top, or just placing it in a gap somebody wants to jump over. In plain sight, it gets some good usage too. Remember pre-firing and treating the bomb and yourself as two halves of the same player. Its long detonation time and large explosion makes it a long-standing threat to anybody who wants to move a certain way. Either use it as a suppression tool to stop a retreat, or use it as a spacing tool to keep them from advancing. Speaking of suppression, it can stop a super jump like a splat bomb does, but because it takes so long to explode, it has a tighter window of time to make it work. The 220 damage it hits for seems superfluous, but this is such a good deal against splash walls, ballers, and the rainmaker shield, shredding through all of those with ease. One of the biggest reasons to play the subweb. In all, it's a great suppression and manipulation tool, but the high ink consumption is something to be wary of. Thankfully, the splatter shot has nice ink economy, but still make every shot count. Since it's our first time, the effective sub power up on suction bombs is faster travel time and a longer throwing range. That's it. Helpful on some longer range weapons, not so much on the short Kenza. It's a pretty nice sub weapon for a splatter shot, allowing for even more tactical play than you would see on the normal version or the 10 attack. But its special weapon is the Tenta missiles. A special weapon you all said was bad for a long time, but I always knew it was good. Upon activation, you are locked into only holding the missile racks in kid form for 10 seconds or until firing. Swimming is still allowed to reposition, however. When holding the racks, you are a sitting duck. Hey, at least it was honest, it didn't look like it was a good shield. The missiles hit for 150 damage on direct hit, 30 on indirect. It can target five opponents at a time. That's four players and the Rainmaker shield in Rainmaker mode. The number of missiles, however, is determined by the number of locked on targets and should be considered before using it. Two targets take five missiles apiece. Three or more targets take four missiles each. Whereas one target on its lonesome takes 10 to missiles! Ah? Uh, that's probably what they were going for, honestly. To maximize the benefit of using it and minimize the risk involved, maybe get behind a wall before using it. Maybe even super jump back to spawn if you want to go back that way anyway. The farther away, the more stuff will be in that circle. On the enemy side, once you pull the trigger, they're immediately alerted to the fact that they're being targeted. A ring appears, lined with an arrow for each missile yet to land. The landing points are even telegraphed to them by circles on the ground. On top of that, the missiles make a loud whizzing sound as they travel through the air, making it impossible for these to surprise someone as long as they're, you know, paying attention. A target that stays swimming at top speed can't possibly be hit by a missile that was intended for them. If a ten of missiles gonna land a kill, it's due to inability to move or because their escape route has already been painted. Remember that specials give free reloads, and certain sub-weapons, like the suction bomb, prevent foes from swimming a certain way. It's generally best to fire at a cluster of enemies to maximize the chances of them swimming together and tripping over each other's missiles. This all sounds more like a minor inconvenience than a powerful super weapon, so what's so good about it anyway? It creates openings, either by shutting down a backline weapon over unlimited range, or by scrambling the enemy to stop one of their pushes. Another valid use is interrupting a stingray. They're forced to swim around, wasting their special timer. They also should be fired at the end of a turf war because they're quite good at painting and are allowed to explode after the time limit is over just so long as they're deployed. Though my personal favorite use is in tower control where they're a nice cheap tower cleaner. A lot of Tenda missiles are easy to activate and on good turfing weapons, unlike the expensive stingray. Tenda missiles are on a lot more weapons too. 
But even with these uses, I could see some people going, well, this doesn't sound like it actually kills anybody. That's because the most useful tool it provides isn't the missiles themselves. It's the targeting system. It provides all enemy locations over a sustained period updating in real time. So if playing on voice chat, use that information. Tell it to teammates. Don't just say, I shot two. Say, the end zap in the zone is going right, the roller is swimming back. This is a special that's made a lot better by observing and watching where enemies are going than just letting it rip right away. It is the easiest way to track multiple enemies. That's all for the properties and uses, so how does this work with the Kenza? The answer, not very well. The Kenza likes being close to the action, and if it needs to pull back for a reason other than using it special, it's because your team is not in control. All it really does is shut down those long-range weapons the Kenza doesn't like to tangle with. If there's any positivity left to be mentioned, it's that the Kenza's 10 of missiles are 180 points, making it one of the easiest ones to build up fast. As for special power-up, on 10 of missiles, they offer a larger targeting circle and more painting from the missiles themselves. I sort of like this ability, and of course it was going to be good. The ability has the 10 of missiles on the packaging for crying out loud. Yet again, a well-rounded weapon that wants to run little bits of lots of abilities. For the stages this plays well on, I'm gonna say that narrow pathways and objects to hide behind are definitely the way to go. Both to use the suction bombs in opportune places, and to use the Tenta missiles from behind. Dun dun. Dun dun. Da-da! You wanna see something new? Well, what other shooter game allows you to attack using a paint roller? Splatoon 1, that's what. This is a melee weapon that specializes in covering the ground very fast. Every roller's regular attack has two phases. It starts off as a fling that insta-kills on a direct hit with the center of the roller. Then optionally, if the button is held, a roll that instantly kills anyone unfortunate enough to run into it. Let's talk about these one at a time. Flinging on the ground covers a wide area and is meant for close range attacks. At point blank range, it's very likely to exceed 100 damage. As with any weapon, additional distance outside the effective range results in damage fall off, but in the case of a roller with it being such a large area of attack, distance away from the center of the roller also results in damage fall off. The minimum possible damage in a single attack is 35. In the air, however, the roller switches to a vertical stance. This turfs less ground and is harder to land a hit with, but is rewarded with longer range and higher minimum damage. The range on the roller is actually very good despite appearing to be a melee weapon, and the vertical fling outranges many common shooters. Because of that vertical range, it makes for a good spacing tool from foes that have noticed you, can make long thin lines of ink to swim through, or long thin lines up walls to swim up them quickly. Every attack from a roller has a wind-up time, and all that determines the fling type is if the player was in the air at the time of pressing ZR. So vertical flings can be done on the ground if done just before landing, and horizontal flings can be done in the air if ZR is pressed and then you jump. Regardless of the stance, every single roller fling is very ink-hungry, consuming 9% base ink and requiring a reload every 11 attacks. This sounds like it wouldn't be unforgiving at all, but remember that if an attack misses, you might be forced into attacking repeatedly to keep spaced out from the enemy. Getting even a little trigger happy can result in being out of ink often. As a final mode-specific property, roller flings are a much more limited method of attacking in tower control due to the spire in the center of the tower blocking attacks. As for how the roll works, it must always follow a fling by continuing to hold ZR and is a very fast way to move around and cover new ground. The roll speed and handling of a roller is based on the roller-specific stats of... ink speed and handling. While it sounds fun to run people over, and uh, trust me, it feels great when they just swim into you at random, that's often out of your control and not what it's primarily for. The most important thing to know about rolling is that rolling into enemy ink sucks. Rollers don't get continuous fire, and a thin trail of ink makes it vulnerable from all sides. One miss, or just one squid coming to their aid, and your rush is over. It does have applications in fights, being quicker than a second fling for little corrections, or to be a less noisy approach than just flinging at the opponent repeatedly if you think they can be gotten with a roll anyway. Now that we understand the basic rules, there's generally two rolls that a roller fulfills. Stealth and painting. 
Rollers do well at picking off frontline fighters who don't see it coming, mainly hiding in ink in hard to reach places and getting the jump on the enemies. This is referred to as sharking. Any weapon can do this, but it's commonly seen on assassin type weapons like this. When sharking, wait till they're up close so they're easier to hit. A vertical fling can be difficult to hit with from far away. It's generally better to hide in the ink, make sure you have the advantage, and take an easy shot with a horizontal attack. Make your attacks count. Don't just throw yourself at enemies that can already see you. They will swim back and outmaneuver your attacks in any way that they can. A part of the roller's identity is attacking above it, something that weapons can't usually do easily. Due to the way the ink comes out, it can even attack up on ledges up close. If sharking's the way you want to go, a lot of maps put ledges for rollers to hide on just outside a center to drop onto people's heads. When it comes to painting, being honest with you, I think this roller is far more suited for fighting than painting. There are safer and faster working weapons at turfing the ground. This one's not bad by any stretch, it's the standard all-around roller and can definitely make use of its powers to cover lots of ground in turf wars. But I consider it only of importance when gaining map control is imperative to being able to accomplish a goal. In fact, a lot of its painting will come from fighting normally because its sub-weapon is the curling bomb! They treat curling just like it's a real sport. It travels in a straight line, leaving a trail of ink in its wake, bouncing off any vertical surface it hits, and then slows down to a stop and explodes. The distance traveled is based on how long the button is held. Holding the R button cooks the little portable stove growing larger, and it travels slower and goes less distance as it grows, but also gains a larger blast radius, explodes sooner after deployment, and has a fatter trail of ink. To get a feel for how this works, the circle of LEDs on top is actually a countdown for the explosion and is a good training tool to learn the timing. Running over an enemy hits for 20 damage and keeps traveling. Minus a few toes. Splash damage bottoms out at 30, and a direct hit is 180, the highest object damage in the game other than a suction bomb. It's certainly a weird sub-weapon that can take a lot of practice to get used to. But it throws ink all around, pressures from a distance, makes pathways, and can even trap foes from swimming away with its lines of ink. Curling bombs should always be thrown at the start of a match and at the end of a match. At the start, it's a great way to help the entire team swim to the center of the map and get a first push going early before the other team arrives. Trust me, you'll be getting some booyahs for that one. At the end of a turf war, it'll cover a lot of ground and then explode after the time limit is over as long as it's been thrown and could be the difference to win the game. One final mode-specific tip for curling bombs is to deploy it just before grabbing the Rainmaker for easy points. As for what this does for the Splat Roller, making those ink trails is so central to how the Splat Roller as a whole fights. It's much better to throw a curling bomb, then swim behind it, than it is to roll a long, thin line through enemy ink. Swim speed is always better than roll speed. They can't easily see you doing this due to there being ripples behind the curling bomb anyway and it allows a roller to fling right away instead of leaving you wide open as it would from a roll. Launching a curling bomb in order to approach a target without having to announce your presence is as good as it gets. If you're thinking direct, that's one dimensional. Many experienced players already know that splat rollers love to do this, so they might be preemptively shooting at a curling bomb to test you, and it can be just as effective to launch a curling bomb that you want them to see, swim around from the other side, and hit them while they're busy checking the curling bomb. Because of the great mobility, generally not cooking the bomb is the way to go in order to do this. Cooking has its uses when it can be used to trap foes at close range or uninkable surfaces, but not much else. This is a main sub combination that's definitely fun to use. It makes playing the roller endlessly more fun and strategic than it would be alone, and that's what a good sub weapon should do. A lot of the weapons that have curling bombs are more on the fighty side and either short or mid range, so the Splat Roller is a great example of how curling bombs work in general. As for sub power up, it raises speed and travel distance. Also not very useful. Its special weapon is the Splashdown. With the roller playing stealth so often and hiding up on ledges, this is great. It can be used to jump off said ledges and get the jump on multiple targets or just to super jump to somebody already in a fight and then throw a curling bomb to get away thanks to the free reload. Conversely, a curling bomb is also an opportunity to approach unsuspecting foes quickly with a splashdown, even cutting off their getaway with the trail of ink that the bomb leaves behind. The special charge is 170, making it pretty average for splashdown costs, but again, it's pretty good at covering the ground too. A general tip that I'd like to talk about with this weapon in particular is checking the map often. 
When it's sharking and doesn't have anything in particular to do, the map can show where enemies are going, can show where to super jump to with that splashdown, or it's actually possible to use a main weapon just before landing from a super jump, meaning that rollers can effectively skip their wind-up phase and smoosh someone on the way down. Not to mention, the free reload from a super jump means another curling bomb if you want to use it for that. All parts of this weapon have more benefit than usual to checking the map. The Splat Roller is your quintessential melee weapon. It might not be the strongest weapon due to its limited capabilities and some weird quirks about how the main weapon works, but it manages to be fun and unique for those who enjoy the roller class. In particular, the Curling Bomb is likely to score free points if deployed just before grabbing the Rainmaker, or just to get to the goal quickly in Clan Blitz where it's likely to score free points. In the way of equipment, there's a new ability on the block, and its name is Ninja Squid, found only on shirts. This turns any ripples made by swimming on the ground invisible in return for 10% of a weapon's default swim speed. However, ripples on walls are still visible, as are the slight indentation left in the ink. Ripples are produced with very slow speeds in Splatoon 2, so this is a very valuable ability that cannot be replaced by merely swimming slower. Naturally, movement speed is important, and when hearing that you're going to lose some of it, you might think, well, what about swim speed up? Does that make up for it? Well, you'd be right. Lightweight weapons need two mains and three subs of swim speed up to mitigate this 10% loss and return to normal. Middleweights, like the Splat Roller, need only seven sub slots, and heavyweights need only one main and one sub. To avoid detection and play further mind games with the Curling Bomb, Ninja Squid is a good addition to the set. An ability worth running a sub slot or two of is Special Saver. This is a stackable ability with the simple effect of less special gauge lost upon death. Should you die during a splashdown execution, normally you lose 25% of the special gauge, but with only one sub of Special Saver, that becomes 16%. Two subs becomes 10%. With the roller having to get in close to make sure its attacks land, this is a great ability for it. <sighs> okay, fine. I've been putting it off. The effect of main power up on splat rollers is damage up. And yes, I want to recommend it. Running just a little bit can mitigate some of that damage fall off. Our sucky shout out of the day goes to run speed up. It seems like it would improve the roll speed, but no, that's not a running animation, it's an attack. Yeah, that's right. Your feet help a jetpack, but do not help a thing that you push. This only helps when strafing in between flings. Don't equip this. Here's all the abilities that I would recommend in any capacity. Really, as long as you got swim speed up, potentially ninja squid, and ink saver sub for those curling bombs, you're probably doing a good job. We got multiple kits to talk about, so let's get crack on! Splat Roller. This alternate kit is less mobile and more based on supporting the team and contributing in ways other than just slaying alone, which is apparent right away with its sub weapon, the Squid Beacon. This is a different kind of sub-weapon, functioning as a super jump point for the whole team with no tells to show enemies when it's currently in use. It's the most expensive sub-weapon to cast at 75% of the ink, but it likely isn't going to be used in tight spots like a bomb is, so it's not that big of a deal. In order to super jump to a beacon, it must be the last thing the map cursor overlapped. It has no D-pad shortcut. It breaks after one use if a user with a squid beacon jumps to it, or two uses for players with other sub-weapons. After a jump that would break it has started, it may still be selected as a jump point at any time before it actually breaks. As long as the jump was started, it's allowed to finish. Every player with squid beacons is allowed to place a maximum of three. A fourth one placed will destroy the oldest one. If it's your sub-weapon, take a beacon and leave a beacon. Keep replacing them after breaking them. Enemies can get rid of squid beacons, and there's quite a number of vulnerabilities to be mindful of. One is that they don't have much health, but it varies from weapon to weapon exactly how much gunfire it takes. Any roller or brush can just roll over it with ease, including the ink brush that normally only hits for 20 damage. Meanwhile, splatlings need to do 100 damage to it, and it takes multiple bullets. Stingrays will break it without even trying. It's honestly very strange, and I think this is something you can only truly get a grasp for with a lot of time. As for other weaknesses, beacons are visible on all players' maps. Once destroyed, any in-progress super jump is now telegraphed to all players by the normal super jump marker. It's advantageous to spread squid beacons apart so they can't all be destroyed in one fell swoop, but also because 
they function as enemy detectors. Enemies within a certain range of beacons will be pointed out on the map to see if it's a safe place to jump to, and by spreading these around through key choke points of the map, you can see where enemies are at all times. That's all the properties for the squid beacon, so on to what it means for applications. This is another sub-weapon that I think becomes better if recon is used to see where they can be placed out of sight and in hard to reach places. These bullet points are all well and good for the stated purpose of the squid beacon, but what if you want to play mind games? Enemies are very likely to destroy a squid beacon even if there is something more pertinent for them to do. Placing beacons where you want them to see is a very viable strategy if you can hide nearby. A more silly use is as a shield. This isn't going to be viable in a lot of situations, but it takes some weapons over 100 damage to destroy it. This is a multi-purpose sub-weapon that gives the player a lot to do when they aren't fighting and can keep the pressure on when the other team doesn't have any good way to super jump in. If there's a bloodbath where both sides lose most of their numbers, the side with squid beacons gets the clear advantage coming back in. When coordinating weapon picks with the rest of the team in more organized matches, I'd advise against having too many players with this particular sub-weapon. Is it really necessary to have two to four players laying these out so you can have six, nine, or twelve of them on the field? Honestly, no. Coming back around to the crack on splat roller and how this works with it, it meshes very well with the sub-weapon. It's going to need to hide in safe places to fight well, and often, these high ledges that it likes to sit on make for good beacon points anyway. It wants to super jump out of unwinnable situations, and this gets it right back into spots it wants to be in. A stealthy weapon might end up hiding for a while with nothing to do, and this makes all of that recovered ink not go to waste. It serves as bait, and that rocks when paired with a one-hit KO move. This last usage is something I couldn't believe was real. It's a valid tactic to place a squid beacon at the bottom of a sniper's perch, launch yourself sky high, and clip them on the way down. Being able to attack directly above is rare, and the roller's one-hit kill enables it to do this very well. Since this is our first time talking about squid beacons at all, the effect of sub power-up is great. It actually gives quick super jump to any teammate jumping to the beacons that it created. And that's downright cool. First sub-weapon that I would recommend for. Moving on to the special weapon. I always wanted to be a hamster. Baller! This is a sticky shield that rolls on the floor and up walls alike. It doesn't judge a floor whether it's uninkable, but does judge walls. When holding ZR, or after six seconds have passed, the baller slows to a stop and explodes into a sphere of ink! As for the numbers, running over a foe is a respectable 50 damage. The splash damage bottoms out at 55, whereas a direct hit takes them down with one hit. This is solid at picking up those that have sustained damage. The area is smaller than a splashdown, but the special itself is a lot less vulnerable and more portable in nature. Say it with me, it's not a good panic button. Upon activation, it's locked into a fixed animation, and for a fair number of frames, the shield hasn't activated yet. Due to latency and the impossibility of assuring every player has strong internet, the duration of these few frames can be closer to a few seconds. Getting hit removes the tape until the baller is completely destroyed. It's a running theme here that HP of this thing is a nebulous concept and would take far too long to explain every weapon's effect on it. Generally, shooters and duelies are useless against the shield but it's mere plastic against high damage hits, such as bombs, blasters, chargers, and splashdowns. Seriously be careful when challenging a splashdown with this. It's also countered very well by Brellas due to their good damage against non-player objects and their attack shielding from the explosion. The Baller is a loud special weapon, announcing its presence upon activation, when rolling, when exploding, and yes, even when breaking. It's possibly the noisiest anything in the game, so always assume the foe will be reacting to it even when it's out of sight. After the explosion is over, you're left vulnerable and stuck in kid form for a moment. Because of this, chasing enemies into their own ink where they can easily swim away and then shoot you sucks. Have a plan before going in. Exploding at awkward times by getting behind enemies that are focused on one thing and quickly trapping them is often more reliable than just rushing. It's a great idea to camp on a ledge that the enemy wants to go near, activate the baller on top of the ledge, start detonation, and make their heads roll too. 
In the way of defense, it can get you out of a bad situation that you see coming to a place you'd rather be. The baller's movement speed is affected by weight class, but every single weapon to have it except for two are middleweight weapons. This is one of the middleweights. And ballers are not immune to toxic mist, just nipping that in the butt. That's all the properties and everything to watch out for, so what does the baller have an advantage against? The good mobility, as well as the shield, protects the inkling inside against tenna missiles and stingrays especially well. Since it'll come up, baller on baller action. First to explode destroys the other with a direct hit. For specific modes, ballers show up a lot in ranked battles for one big reason. They can't super jump themselves, but can be super jumped too. This is one of the most loved features, especially in Clam Blitz, where it can get behind enemy lines and score free points by just having a power clam warp to it. Rushing into enemy territory like this needs to be done with purpose to the objective, and when the weapons that would counter it are down. It's only going to overwhelm the small stuff like shooters. Unfortunately, even though we have a this way command on the D-pad, almost no one in solo queue actually listens to it as a request for super jumps. Enable voice chat for this one. It's about the only way that randoms are going to listen to you. A less coordinated strategy is building up the power clam yourself, getting within range of the goal, letting them shoot and destroy the baller, and then throw your power clam once throwing it is re-enabled. Normally the explosion knocks the clams away to avoid special abuse, but a destroyed baller by enemy shots will not explode and thus will not get rid of your clams. Whether it explodes or gets destroyed, it's a good special to use at the last second of a ranked battle where dying to get some last few points is worth it. In Rainmaker, a full health baller will always survive a Rainmaker attack or a Rainmaker shield popping. One of the few times it is a good panic button. Just as much as rank battles, it should be used at the last second of a turf war because it can be the difference. Similarly, it can color in a splat zone very safely. That's a lot of modes for just one special to have a very clear edge at. The effect of special power up on ballers gives it larger splash damage area and gives it more health. The health upgrade is tiny and often doesn't even afford one more bowler. Let's face it, if it looks like it might break, you're gonna explode before that happens, unless you want them to break it. The splash damage increase is the only benefit seen, and even then, not overly worth it. This is a decent special for a roller, covering some of its weaknesses. If the baller is wanted, this weapon has one of the cheapest ballers and is one of the easiest to build it up with its main attack. The kit on the whole is about keeping up pressure so that the whole team is able to make more pushes than they might have been able to otherwise. For the map recommendations, I would suggest having larger maps, as more time to swim to the center gives more value to squid beacons. You want ledges to hide up on, and you want to be playing splat zones or clam blitz. On to abilities, we have a new one to talk about, Ink Recovery Up. This makes Ink Recover faster, simple as that. No swimming around required to see the benefit, because Kid Form also recovers ink, albeit slower. With the most expensive sub-weapon and a costly main attack too, this reduces your downtime all around. There's a third splat roller, known as the Kenza Splat Roller, and we're not going over it today. <laughs> I'm choosing to save this one for later because it's the first appearance of a very prominent special weapon, and it's a horrible weapon to explain it with for the first time because it works nothing like all the other weapons that have it, so we'll see it for the first time on a more traditional weapon for it, and then we'll come back and talk about that one. Some people just like to watch the world burn. They're called snipers! The all-around basic version of this jerk is the Splat Charger! This is a getting kills and supporting the team from the back kind of weapon. The main attack's power and range is determined by how long the shot is charged for. A full charge supports some of the highest range in the entire game, 160 damage, and takes just barely over one second to get. Any less of a charge and it cannot possibly score a one-hit kill at full health, hitting anywhere from 40 to 80 base damage. This seems like the most natural time to tell you that there are no headshots in Splatoon. A hit is a hit, and the data I'm telling you is constant. Every traditional charger is equipped with a laser aim assist that shows exactly where the shot would be if it finished at the current moment. I say would be because with such long reach, it takes a little time for the shot to reach its intended destination. Leading fire to where you think the shot should be is important, but even more important is not leading it so obviously that the enemy sees you taking aim and swims away. The aiming laser is visible to all players and gives away the sniper's position. 
On top of this curse, a maximum charge is very resource hungry using 18% of the ink, meaning that it pays to hide an ink when it isn't worth telegraphing your position. The laser can't pass through solid objects, so aiming at the ground or readying a shot behind an object will show only the player where the laser would be if the object weren't in the way. Once the shot is lined up, peek out from behind and fire! Reminder that all Inklings are right-handed, so peeking out on the right side makes the attack come out quicker without exposing as much of the body. Jumping is another way to slide into a shot without having to adjust aim. A more advanced way to apply this knowledge is flick shots. This is aiming in a complete other direction and then flicking the aim right into the shot before they can even see it coming. Hard to do consistently, but can work. Well, all of this is just one way to play around this weapon's capabilities. The Splat Charger has a rare gift that barely any weapons have. In fact, including alternate kits, it's in the single digits how many can do this. The charge can be carried in squid form for one second. Moving certainly and quickly allows it to get into position and whip out attacks like they're nothing. Despite the gun's huge size, it's actually a middleweight weapon, meaning it has good movement stats to make this work. There are two downsides to using the swimming technique to be mindful of. One, charges are slower in the air, so it's rewarded to have your feet planted upon resurface. Two, the ink tank will glow upon the tank reaching 100%, and this glow shines through even when swimming. So it isn't meant for charging headfirst with the mindset that it'll one hit anyway. Moving on to the less straightforward uses of this weapon, just because it's oriented toward fighting doesn't mean it isn't good at turfing and map control. The long, thin lines of ink it makes are an excellent way of getting the whole team to battle stations right away at the start of a match. Not too bad for swimming out of harm's way, either. Once in position, the Charger has a very important job to do. Support. You're able to fight further from the action than anyone else, which does mean using the great vantage to pick off problems from far away. But possibly the most important thing to know is that before being a killing machine, you are everyone's lifeline. Sniper perches are perfect places to super jump to. When the enemy's gained a clear upper hand, it's better to swim away slightly to stay alive than to be out in the open as a charger. In concept, chargers aren't effective when they're outnumbered and need to attack rapidly. By nature, weapons in the rear spend a lot of time stationary in their ink waiting to act. This is an opportune time to check the map. Always look for information during these bits to see where your help is needed most or if somebody is trying to sneak up from behind. Or better yet, if the squids at the top of the screen are telegraphing a special that can affect you like a stingray or a booyah bomb. Now that the role is defined, let's talk about those shots and other ways to use them other than just one hitting, cause uh, it's not exactly easy to pull that off every time. There's something to be said for warning shots. If a shot misses an enemy and has a line of ink that's trapping them in a small area, it's useful for cutting off movement when you're ready to follow up for an easy shot. This way, they're easier to hit as they fumble the swim away, and it can turn a hard shot into an easy one. Typically speaking, if there's lots of enemy ink everywhere and their movement isn't limited in some way, they can dodge with ease. Know the maps well enough, and you'll know what they're about to do. Chargers are also good special suppression. It'll make any baller or inkjet think twice before activating when they know that a charger is around. Both are very vulnerable to snipes. Ink Armor does block one-hit kills, but it levels out a little bit when a full snipe pushes it back and does some pierce damage. With that wound, it'll be a little while before they try again. Lastly, since I'm sure it's crossed everyone's mind that less than full charges might have at least some use, the minimum 40 damage is the quickest way to attack in desperation, and that will happen from time to time. Best not to rely on it, but it's something. More advantageous is that chargers are great revenge killers. As long as they're within range, a less than full charge can make a partially damaged foe who just beat one of your teammates easy pickings. As the ranks of players get higher, players spend less and less time at full health, meaning that 100% charges might not even be necessary to revenge kill, and it can just fire right after swimming into position. That does it for the main weapon, so its sub-weapon is the... Splatter? Scope? Uh... Nah. Before talking about any stinking sub-weapon, long-range chargers have two options for play, one with a scope and one without. The scope activates alongside a charge, going full first person at 100%. This is the only way to go into first person in all of Splatoon, and some players of other shooter games might find it easier to aim with. Alongside this is slightly higher range. While the long range might seem like it's a natural win right away, it's not longer by much. 
In return, however, it loses peripheral vision and cannot hold a charge while swimming. All around, inherently less mobile and less aware of its surroundings, but it does well at peeking around corners. I won't tell you what to like, I'll just tell you once that every Splat Charger kit offers a scoped option if that is preferred. Since it's the first time going over this, the Splat Charger and Splatter Scope both get increased damage from main power up. Though this does not mean that a less than full charge can one hit. The requirements for 100 damage have not changed. This is merely helpful for picking off a damaged foe in less time and more pierce damage to ink armor. Now for real, the sub weapon is the Splat Bomb. This is immediate pressure. Should be used for manipulation to force movement out of whatever you're aiming at. A lot of enemies will hide behind a block just because they see a charger. This flushes them out. Unfortunately, using a sub weapon cancels any currently held charge, so any sub usage must come before or after the attack that's in conjunction with it. Use this to play the spacing game. It stops a rush dead in its tracks so that it's now possible to swim away, thus making good use of those movement stats from earlier. The key is to not play their game. A good charger is one that spaces itself out at the first sign of trouble. If it just so happens to land damage or cover them in ink in addition to the spacing, this enables an easy pickup. When attacking together, keep in mind that the bomb splash damage is 30, while a less than full charge caps at 80. It takes a bit of practice to take full advantage of that, and it might still be worth just waiting the extra fraction of a second to get full damage if you're not sure. It's a lot more reliable to treat the bomb as a spacing tool or as a manipulation tool than treating it as certain damage, only taking it as a nice bonus whenever you happen to get it. Another way to get a certain kill is using a warning shot to box in a target and then immediately throwing a bomb when they can't swim away right away. Overall, good synergy both ways, and it's nice to have something lethal that doesn't require a precision shot. Onto its special, the Stingray! Not a good panic button. This is an ink laser that hits for 108 damage per second through all solid objects and with unlimited range. When applying pressure, the laser is very narrow, but after three seconds of continuous fire, becomes much, much wider. When about to open fire, all non-swimming enemy positions are revealed to the user through walls. The effect is essentially thermal ink on the whole enemy party. Use the enemy positions and knowledge of the map to know where to shoot and tell this information to teammates. Only the inky part of the laser paints unless you count the splattered guts everywhere. In total, the special lasts for a solid 7.75 seconds of base time. It sounds like an unstoppable force, and it nearly is, but here comes the catch. When firing, there is a huge 0.7 seconds of input delay, and it moves its aim very slowly. In fact, it gets even slower when the laser transitions into phase two. Of course, with the charge up time taking nearly half the duration, Putting up with these negatives for continuous fire is rewarded more than just putting it away to aim again. To avoid being interrupted, try hiding behind something or super jumping back to spawn, which is freely allowed at any time. Keep in mind though that using a stingray inside spawn pushes the holder forward outside of the safe zone. No abusing that allowed. The last benefit to retreating before activating it is pivoting. With the origin point so far away, little movements translate into huge movements on the other end. This is a powerful special on flat stages or on levels with narrow corridors where it's likely to hit at least something each and every time. If not that, it's great at just keeping enemies from going a certain pathway for a sustained time. Stingrays might not seem very special in Turf Wars due to the objective not being centralized, but in ranked battles where objectives are telegraphed on screen, you can imagine this is an insanely good special. As much as I hate to say this, the Stingray is so dominant that it's a good counter to other Stingrays. If it looks like the enemy is going to get a good use of it, might as well save it and use it to shut down theirs. Its weaknesses are, as you would imagine, being rushed. It's so slow and prohibits any use of the main weapon, sub weapon, or super jump. So other players who know a Stingray is locked in will do everything in their power to waste its time. If there was ever something that shuts down Stingrays, it's Inkjet. They move vertically out of harm's way when a Stingray is aiming at flat ground hoping to find targets there, and Inkjet shoot from the air at very long range, forcing the Ray to swim away. Tena missiles aren't quite as good at shutting them down, but it's still good to be aware of when the enemy team has them as they'll naturally activate them as a response. The last weakness is the human mind. Make sure it's getting all the bang for its buck instead of just blindly replying with it when the situation doesn't allow the other team to score any real points. 
Since there's a first time for everything, special power-up increases the duration of Stingray and mitigates the effect of Bomb Defense Up DX on weakening the tracking system before it shoots. It might not seem like much, but remember that its duration directly translates to free points in rank, so it might be worth it for that alone. The Splat Charger could not have found a more harmonic partner in the Stingray. Since the rifle likes being far away from the action and behind little boxes anyway, it's often already in prime position to let loose. Believe it or not, there is a reason to choose the Splat Charger on its own, because not every Stingray is paired with a long-reaching main weapon contrary to what you would expect. Of course, it pays for it by being the most expensive Stingray in the game at 220 points. What more could you ask for? This is a much more active reimagining of the sniper class that would only be possible in the world of Splatoon. This particular kit is very oriented toward ranked battles and gatekeeping enemy objectives while being able to act as a stop button from anywhere else on the map. With this being such a different weapon from the others, it's time to go over some new abilities that I would recommend. On the logic that a long range weapon dies less than other players, I want to recommend the weird, weird ability of Respawn Punisher. In basic terms, this raises respawn time and special depletion on death for both the user of the ability and for victims splatted by the user. For reference, respawn time is normally 8.5 seconds with 50% of the special gauge lost. An enemy losing to respawn punisher will get a 9.2 second downtime and lose 65% of their special gauge. The user gets it worse at 9.6 seconds and 72.5%. Lastly, a user of Respawn Punisher losing to another user of Respawn Punisher will have the effect stack to 10.3 seconds and a whopping 87.5%. Respawn Punisher does nothing for assists. The holder must deliver the final blow to get the benefit. The abilities Quick Respawn and Special Saver reduce respawn penalties, but are not a counter to Respawn Punisher. It requires a ton of stacking to get out of the hole that it causes, so Respawn Punisher is good at suppressing these abilities. I would not call Respawn Punisher a fantastic ability, usage of it has declined, but this is one of the few weapons I might recommend it for. Another new ability is Tenacity. This automatically charges the special gauge when the player's team has fewer living players than the enemy team. It's 2.2 per second multiplied by the number of players fewer than the enemy team. Most Charger players will prefer a main slot of special charge up, but I thought I'd give this a mention in case you do like the sound of it. I would say this is one of the few weapons that benefits greatly from stacking a lot of special charging abilities. The last ability to get featured is Special Saver. I've already explained this, but want to give it attention here because Stingray at a spawn can be a good thing. Burn away all that lame kelp, it's time for the Firefin Splat Charger! It's got a first time sub weapon, the Splash Wall! Now this is a cool sub-weapon. Might even be my favorite one. In exchange for 60% of the ink tank, the user's team gets a selective permeable wall, where their players and shots may pass through it, but nah for the enemy team. Enemies touching it take 30 damage every half second. Watch the tank in the center. It goes down over time, or when taking lumps, until it disappears when empty. If it's never hit by an attack at all, it provides its services for seven seconds every time. Another property is that enemy bombs detonate on contact with the wall, making it very weak against them due to their high damage. If the splash wall has a nemesis other than bombs, it's the Tentabrella. Drains the health like a leech. The explosions cannot penetrate the wall, but they will do damage to allies standing on the same side as the burst or anyone showering underneath it. The last general property is that splash walls have a very long ink recovery lag as indicated by the white in the ink tank after using it. This is to make it impossible to just turn in the 60 ink for an easy full reload behind it. Going into the uses, it affords, yep, mistakes. <laughs> it gives a lot of free hits before anything reaches through, enabling pushes forward in narrow spaces. It can be tossed behind a foe to stop an escape, forcing them to fight you. With long range, this can be very effective. For defensive options, it's good for stopping a rush that's been noticed from far away. I say far away because the deployment time after throwing it is long, so panic throws don't work very often. Something that it does a particularly good job stopping is ballers, since they can't do much to a splash wall without detonating, all while saving the lives of those that are behind the wall. More commonly, it's good when dealing with other snipers. It makes chargers irrelevant for a few seconds while they spend time breaking through. 
or it just makes for a good edge in sniper versus sniper duels if you've got a wall and they don't. It can give a shield in direct fights, or can stop approaches coming from a given direction so you can focus on other things. Think of how often things would have been fine if your back just wasn't turned and use it in those spots. It sounds like these tips are specific to the splat charger, but most every splash ball in the game is paired with something long range, so these tips are very general purpose. Beyond just using it as a shield, it's also useful in mind games. The instinct is to destroy it, and this is predictable. Throw it, expect them to focus on it, and approach from the side once they've revealed themselves. Showering under it can make this process quicker and allow swimming to the opposite side no matter what the direction they come from, but again, it's risky due to how bombs work against it. When it comes to ranked modes, the immediate idea that sounds brilliant is just throwing it in the tower's path and tower control. Unfortunately, they thought of this. The tower shreds the wall on contact. Something actually realistic is throwing it at a wall so it'll bounce off and then land back on the tower, giving cover and making it harder to take the tower over. With this being our first time going over splash walls, sub power up increases durability against attacks. This does not mean that it gets longer duration. It's still capped at seven seconds if nothing comes into contact with it. It's strictly defense up. There isn't much to say about how the fire fin works with the splash wall that is not obvious from its basic workings. They are very useful depending on the map and mode, either as defense or as an enabler to buy time for a good shot, which is exactly what the fire fin charger likes about it. When using the non-scope version, it can be very easy to swim forward with a shot and let loose. It's the first time for the special as well. We got the suction bomb launcher. Bomb launchers are a new type of special in general that we'll be seeing a lot of. They allow spamming of the given bomb type for six seconds of base time. The suction bomb launcher specifically allows for a maximum of 12 bombs to be thrown within its duration. It might look like a sub-weapon spam, but it isn't truly the same thing as using the normal version of the bomb. Holding R increases the range significantly over that of a normal bomb. Holding and then tapping causes two spaced apart suction bombs to land at once, thus covering a lot of area and it being difficult to counter. Next, the bombs are thrown by the machine, not the Squid Kid, a surprisingly big distinction. For one, they're unaffected by equipment and there's no way to raise their stats in any capacity. For two, they don't contribute any special charge points, even if exploding after the special is concluded. For three, it's the only left-handed weapon in all of Splatoon, so keep that in mind when throwing them. And for four, because the machine's doing the throwing, it doesn't lock out the main weapon. Since this is about the launcher, let's skip over the basic workings of suction bombs and just talk about applications for the launcher itself. First off, suction bombs do 220 damage, and with the ability to spam, this is very much the anti-object special weapon. Going into mode specific uses off of this, it's such an unreal amount of damage output against the Rainmaker shield whenever you just need to burst it. All bomb launchers should be activated at the last seconds of a turf war if no better use for it is there. Suction Bomb Launcher in particular is strong at splat zones where it can take back a zone in just one use. And the fact that there's suction bombs, which linger for two whole seconds before the enemy can even think about approaching again, makes for some easy points that can decide a close game when guarding an objective. You never forget your first grenade launcher, and with this being our first, the effect of special power-up is increased duration. Three sub-slots gives the potential for a 13th bomb. This is not as good as it sounds. For the Firefin Charger, the launcher is a great way to cover the ground, keep enemies away from a large area for a good period of time, and just generally get a push going. This kit works best at shredding objects and in splat zones thanks to the splash wall's added safety, and then using the special from its default high vantage point to take back the zone in just a few seconds flat. These aren't things that chargers can normally do. With the bomb's long range, this also plays into the chargers hanging in the back and not being left vulnerable during a long special that locks out the main weapon. Speaking of which, the launcher is a free reload, so might as well throw the wall and take the extra protection if you have it, since the wall's base time is longer than the launcher's. This is the most common type of bomb launcher, but the Firefin Charger is one of only two long-range weapons in the game to have it. As the downside, it's the most costly suction bomb launcher. This whole set lets the Firefin Charger duel other snipers well, get closer to the action, and use its special to turf the center of the map well. Out of the abilities you see, I want to give attention to Ink Recovery Up because this does not mitigate Ink Recovery lag. I only have recommended it so that it reduces your downtime even if it does not affect that. 
The third and final kit is the Kenza Charger, which oddly doesn't follow the naming scheme. Why Kenza Charger and not Kenza Splat Charger when it's Firefin Splat Charger and Kenza Splat Roller? Uh, well, hey, they get the angry comments for calling it the wrong name instead of me now. Hooray! Okay, that's enough of that. Uh, this one's a little strange and not just due to the name, but being essentially a hybrid charger that can go between hanging in the back and pushing forward. Its sub-weapon is also a newbie, the Sprinkler. For 60% ink, it acts as a throwable sentry that sticks to any inbound solid object. This equates to free points in a turf war and more frequent specials. For the first half second after being placed, no ink is splattered, making it impossible to throw for cheap damage since that's not the intended purpose. The droplets hit for 20 damage. Once that first second is over, it makes up for lost time by firing a droplet of ink 15 times per second for the first five and a half seconds. For the next 16 seconds, the rotation slows down, but ink is created at the same speed. If it's still somehow standing after that, it will slow down even further and only produce an ink droplet every sixth of a second for the rest of its lifespan. What is the life expectancy? Sprinklers have 120 HP and are destroyed prematurely if the creator is splatted or when a second sprinkler is made by the same player. The ability Object Shredder counters sprinklers, making them break in one hit from any attack. Of course, with all freestanding objects, it's going to get shot at to prevent it from doing its job, and this can be predicted. So it works as bait if one is ready to flank. 120 HP Sand Object Shredder sounds like a decent shield, and I won't say it isn't, but it's best used when not in a firefight or as a way to cover the ground. At the start of every game, when ink isn't going toward any purpose other than getting to the center of the map, it might as well get thrown around spawn in a direction nobody is going. Particularly, Gobi Arena has a massive area around and behind spawn no one ever spends time inking, and this lets the sprinkler pick up a lot of free points. To get the most mileage out of it, place it in higher spots as opposed to lower. Slightly wider spread, and it's more out of the way when people want to destroy it. This is another recon sub-weapon. Test what it can be realistically thrown onto. It might surprise you and even be impossible for certain weapons to hit if it's stuck high enough. While sprinklers are good at turf wars, it cannot be used for last second points because it doesn't stall out the timer like a bomb would. With this being our first time, Sub Power Up raises the duration of the sprinkler's first and second ink phases before it fully slows down. Not that great, since it already covers the ground pretty well. As for how this works with the Kenza Charger, yes, it does build up the special a lot quicker than most other chargers would be able to tap. But sprinklers have a reputation for being hard to use. It's so expensive to throw and just isn't as helpful as bombs, splash walls, or having better movement options from other sub weapons. The only cooperation sprinklers get to have with the rest of their kit, other than acting as bait and more special points, is chip damage. This might land useful damage every now and then, and it is fixed at 30 while a less than full charge maxes out at 80, but otherwise, it's just going to feel like giving up having a sub-weapon in return for more frequent specials. Well, what do you know, getting back to it, getting a special weapon more often, we have the baller! This enables getaways when getting rushed at, which is pretty nice because the sub-weapon ain't letting you space out like the other two kits did. On the flip side, if it's time to make a push or just drop onto somebody's head from the sniper perch, it allows for a more offensive approach. You know, because it approaches. Well, uh, if you're still here, it, I, I feel like this is a hard charger to kill when it has that special, but still faces stiff competition from how good the splat bomb and stingray were. Jokes aside, snipers are usually in prime spots to drop onto heads with the baller anyway. Since baller does 55 splash damage, a near empty charge will be sufficient enough to whack an enemy that just narrowly avoided taking a direct hit from the baller. The two attack options this kit has are a lot more in sync than it would seem at first. The decision to play this largely comes down to whether it's worth it to give up spacing options with a sub-weapon in return for a baller charger combo. An ability that gets a big mention is Special Charge Up. This raises the number of special points awarded from the main weapon and the sprinkler. It's a far better buff than Sub Power Up. All right, here you go, the Splat Duelies. This is the one a lot of you have been waiting for because it's probably been killing you a ton and looking super cool every time it does. The Duelies have decent range, great movement stats, hit for 30 damage, and possesses good ink economy to let it keep shooting and moving for long periods of time. 30 is a good damage number as it's exactly enough to destroy ink armor in one shot. 
Pairs of guns have wildly different shooting and movement options from all other weapon classes, so let's get into how they reinvent the wheel first. Ink is sprayed from both the right and left hands, and the shots land at two separate reticles. To complement one another, the guns are pointed inward so the bullets are near touching at their effective range meeting at a vanishing point, versus most guns that shoot straight ahead. This isn't a bad thing and often won't be noticed, but it can matter when a target is too close and is only getting hit by one gun. One dually's range being obstructed will not affect the other as they are two separate guns through and through. This might sound attractive at first, as this means it's one of the few ways to attack left-handed, but the firing rate of one dually by itself is just half of what the continuous fire is meant to be. Duallys are equipped to overwhelm by moving all around their enemies. To aid in this mission, they feature a dodge roll built in as standard. This is a massive difference, as it's a whole new type of movement no other weapon class has access to. This makes the duallys naturally not have to work as hard to outmaneuver in quick duels. Pressing jump while firing executes a dodge roll in the direction of the left stick, but the user can still jump as normal if pressed before firing. The dodge roll has many properties aside from just a mere additional movement. First, it uses 9% of the ink tank to execute because it actually leaves behind ink and lessens the need to shoot the floor in tight spots. It does not require being in ink to move, and it can be used to play the spacing game in situations where swimming is impossible. In the air, the roll functions as a fast fall and can be used for faster approaches or to throw off a foe's timing when they're meaning to shoot you. Once a roll concludes, the roller, uh, wrong terminology, will catch themselves in a crouch and be unable to walk or swim for exactly half a second. Once locked into a crouch, the two reticles become one and shot deviation is disabled. If no direction is pressed, it's allowed to stay in this mode indefinitely. Alternatively, two rolls may be chained together, but movement is forcibly taken away for that half second at the end of the second roll. So it must count and not mindlessly spam just because you feel like you're harder to shoot that way. It's very possible to get a high from how much the game rewards quick dodging and not realize how much ink you're milling through. Watch your back. Literally. Dodge rolls allow super jumping into dicier conditions than normal. This is absolutely a constant threat that spends very little time away from combat thanks to that one change. Paired guns get the advantage against slower, more powerful attacks. The key is to bait an attack out of a slow attacker and leave it wide open. Get used to how the fire needs to be led and have them in the crosshairs when they're still reacting to the dodge. In the way of uses and strategies for the main weapon, a lot of this was gone over in just explaining how the mechanics work. The guns themselves are great at fighting and move around with ease. Dodge rolling is for quick corrections, outmaneuvering in close range combat, or just getting space when you otherwise couldn't. If there's any big shortcomings of the duallys, it's being challenged at long range, both due to being outreached and moves being easier to read over great distances. A splatling that's ready with a charge isn't going to care how many times you roll. It's going to adjust its aim and still hit you. If the duallys just aren't coming naturally, practice against splatter shots. That's one of the easiest ways to learn what sets them apart and makes them special. Splatter shots have near identical range and play similarly, but are far more rigid in how they're allowed to move, and that matchup illustrates the difference perfectly. Really make no mistake, the duallys are not just one strong gun split into two weak guns. This might be the most consistently strong main weapon in the entire game due to just how many options it has at any given moment, together with having no especially bad traits. Its sub-weapon is Burst Bomb! If there's one word to describe the Splat Dooley's kit, it's movement. It, like, it didn't have enough already. Burst Bombs instantly afford far more mobility options to whatever weapon they're on, so this thing's got it in spades. Just really anything that keeps you moving when the ink isn't going to anything else. Burst Bombs also control the movement of enemies. A great usage of this tool is to instantly cut off an escape route of an enemy, especially when they don't have a dodge roll, and you do. Of course, there's always the beautiful scenario when the enemy thinks they're gonna get away from your short range in a state of near death, but then you just plop a burst bomb onto their head to finish them off. In fact, burst bombs are just long range enough that they make for a good pressuring tool no matter what. The splash damage off the burst bomb is anywhere from 25 to 35, meaning it can actually reduce the number of bullets to score a kill with an indirect hit. A direct hit is 60, so that brings it down to two bullets. Using these two together lets it score very certain kills for roughly half an ink tank. Opening with a burst bomb makes them easier to hit. This is best when it looks like they'll easily swim away as this is slower than shooting alone when you've got the advantage. Its special weapon is... 
Tenta missiles. Hey, they had to give it something sucky to keep it from being totally overpowered, right? The Tenta missiles don't have immediate synergy with the rest of the moveset since they demand outright hiding away from any trouble, and this is a weapon that wants to challenge foes with its adept fighting skills. It may not seem useful, but remember the targeting system and how it reveals enemy locations. When ducking out of the action when things get dicey, this can reveal a pathway back in. It identifies the position of a weapon that you think you can win against, or just disrupts the backline weapon who's got their eye on you. Oftentimes, Tenta Missiles will get chip damage and not kill. This is in good harmony with the range of the Burst Bomb. Compared to other Tenta Missile weapons, the Duelies have little trouble building them up. In all, Splat Duelies are a fun combination where the main and sub play off one another well, and is all about making your foes head spin as you get the jump on them. Very few weapons have Burst Bombs, and even fewer strong weapons have them. So right away, that's a big reason to consider picking up the duelies as one of your regulars if you love that bomb type and can't get enough of it just as I do. Between the middling range, good sub weapon, and good main weapon, I recommend this as a good weapon for beginners to learn general game sense. This is a well-rounded kit that's not particularly bad at many maps or modes. It's a nice, safe choice when the rotation doesn't make it clear what to choose. For a first-time ability recommendation, Quick Respawn gets a quick explanation. That's a stackable ability that reduces respawn time as long as the user is not on their first life and has not scored any kills on their current life. Duelies fight a lot and thus die a lot. That's why I'm recommending. I've chosen to save main power up for last because I'm so excited that the effect is damage up! It's no secret that whenever main power up increases damage, those are the weapons that it's best on. I want to state up front right now that on no weapon does main power up reduce the minimum number of hits in order to splat, but it is possible to make a weapon do 99.9 .9 damage in one fewer attack, and if the enemy has spent one frame in enemy ink, that's a kill. For the splat duelies, two mains and two subs is optimal for bridging the damage from an indirect burst bomb and two bullets into a state of near death. For abilities, I want to debunk run speed up as a good option. There's nothing wrong with using it if the goal is better strafing, but the dodge roll is unaffected due to it counting as an attack. Similarly, Ink Saver Main does nothing to reduce the cost of a dodge. Now, would you believe me if I told you that the next weapon kit we have coming up is actually more popular than this one? I hope so, because everyone should get used to the name of N. Perry Splat Duelies. Stats are identical, of course, aside from the high special charge. Its sub is the Curling Bomb, as if anyone would think that the vanilla set wasn't going to get matched by mobility. While the vanilla excels at stages with verticality and obstacles, this one specializes in flat stages and long straightaways. The Curling Bomb gets the whole team to the center of the map quickly at the start of many fights, enabling them to take map control before the other team can even get there. Carrying this into flat stages might as well mean free points at the start of a ranked battle. After the first push is over, it's a tool for approaching or distraction, whichever the situation reads for. Swim behind it and set up for an otherwise impossible shot, or don't. Beyond even that, the dodge roll enables it to play even more games, dodging out of the way while they're shooting at the curling bomb. A curling bomb is probably not always going to hit a target, but say it does manage to. On the occasion, contact chip damage is 20 while splash damage is 30. Either way, if the curling bomb happens to nick them, it's a nice bonus that enables the end parry to three shot kill. Between the sub-weapon, the dodge roll, and then being a middleweight, this thing gets all over the map in no time flat. And to make the end parry truly a weapon for all situations, its special is Inkjet. Inkjet is a potentially powerful special that gets it out of the way of stingrays and enables it to challenge at longer range than otherwise possible. Since being outreached is typically the weakest point of the duelies, this does so much to lessen that shortcoming. Get up high to be hard to hit and suppress the backlines. I still think the end parry duelies are weak to splatlings, but this rounds out the set well, making it able to challenge virtually anything else. End parries are tied for having the highest charge of any inkjet, but this isn't without reason. Once ejecting, the end parries have a full reload to dodge roll twice after landing every single time, letting them a good fighting chance against those camping the marker. Inkjet lovers might prefer other choices, and that's understandable, but this still manages to be a decent choice for it despite the high cost. As for the maps, we've already talked about flat stages being great, but I want to bring attention to Schellendorf Institute. This is a map that normally favors longer range weapons, but the end parry is being able to get to the center of the map quickly and it making it very difficult for the foes to approach without making themselves obvious makes this a good choice for this weapon as well. The curling bomb raises usefulness in Rainmaker pushes, while the inkjet is good at pushes in any other mode. 
If your personal taste prioritizes constant movement and high kill counts, consider learning the end parry dualies. Here's the equipment recommendations. Main power up is still good and should be worth considering, but it's not able to bridge the damage gap quite as well as you could with burst bombs, as burst bombs can hit for 35 indirect while curling bombs only hit for 30. Let's give it up for kit number three, the Kenza Splat Dualies. So you follow the naming scheme and your brother d Well, same stats. And to get started on this one, you ever have those situations where you want to initiate a duel, but they have such an easy way to swim away and space you out? Well, the answer is suction bombs. And this makes the Kenza Dualies probably the most tactical dually option right off the bat. Throwing a suction bomb almost outright stops the enemy from going a given way for two whole seconds, and that's an eternity to approach them and make them fight you. Use it on escape routes, or on terrain that could otherwise be used to play the range game against you, then approach with a dodge roll to turn off shot RNG. In fact, it's pretty common for a squid to knee-jerk react to dualies and immediately just swim backwards. A lot of people hate fighting them and might just run into the bomb if they didn't see it get thrown. On the flip side, it's, yup, your spacing tool as well. Beyond just blocking an enemy's way out, it blocks their buddy's way in and turns a 2v1 into an easy 1v1. Another angle on this is using the showy nature of the main weapon to bait them into a suction bomb. Due to the annoying nature, people want to run right at it and they'll go straight into out of sight suction bombs. This is a very solid combination for the dualies, but is very ink hungry at the same time. Keep that in mind as this is one of the most expensive sub weapons, plus your guns and dodge roll are using ink up at the same time. Its special weapon is Baller. I guess you could say this is rounding out the kit. Well, this one certainly ditches mobility. That's not a bad thing either. The other ones might be more mobile, but this one's all about aggression and tactics. Baller is what makes or breaks a push in clan blitz or just locks in foes to an explosion. It's yet another easy way to kill, and it comes around decently often. Ballers are poor at following enemies into their own ink as they'll just simply swim away from it, but thanks to the suction bomb, that's not always a worry. This is the second most expensive baller in the game, and while the Kenza's not quite as good at turfing as its brothers, it's still decent. The baller's ink explosion leaves the user vulnerable, and the suction bomb plays off this well thanks to the free reload, buying it a stop button. The whole package loses out on the trademark dually mobility and guzzles loads more ink, but it makes up for it by being extremely oriented toward fighting. This weapon is a good pick for all modes, but is easiest to recommend in splat zones and clam blitz due to having a sub and special that can hold an area for a sustained period of time, and of course, being able to fight well along with having a baller as that shows up on almost every team in clam blitz. Moving on to equipment, when I say the ink cost is high, I mean the ink cost is high. Saving ink should be the top priority, and ink saver sub is the best way to do it. Between the suction bomb and two dodge rolls alone, that's already 88% of the maximum ink supply and barely anything left over for bullets. If that roll is not being used often enough in fights for this to be a problem, you're either fighting someone who can't aim or not using the weapon right. In other words, something's wrong. Continuing the stretch of new weapon classes, it's the Blaster! This gun is single shot automatic and fires exploding rounds. Think of it like a mixture between shotguns and grenade launchers and other shooters. I can hear you. the shots are what you care about, so we'll get to them first. They travel a fixed distance before exploding and then do 125 damage on direct hit. You'll know when it happens due to the oh so satisfying sound. The splash damage is 50 minimum, 70 maximum. Blasters have a second shot behavior, often referred to as sparking. It's when a shot collides with a wall or floor, explodes early, and produces sparks. This deals 25 to 32 damage and is useful for finishing off someone weak since it doesn't have to be precisely aimed. To balance out this sheer power, there are many drawbacks. The rate of fire is almost a full second between shots. After shooting, the user has recoil movement for a fraction of a second, and the ink consumption is very bad. Just one blast is 10% ink, and this is a rare main weapon that is cursed with ink recovery lag from its normal shots, requiring a full second after a trigger pull to start reloading. The range seems low at first glance, but it isn't as bad as the core stats would make it seem. The listed range is just where the epicenter of the explosion is, where it'll one shot. Since the explosion covers a wide area, it actually reaches much farther and can two-hit from greater distances and even around corners. 
This is very easy to pull off when right side peeking and not exposing yourself. A final property of how blasters are different from other weapons is how their shot accuracy works in the air. I want you to see just how much that reticle expands in the air. Shot RNG while jumping is terrible on blasters. It's only really useful for painting or when trying to be harder to hit in one fluid motion that gets you back into the ink. If there's a secret to playing blasters that a newcomer wouldn't realize right away, this is the one gun type where it's actively bad to hold the trigger over a sustained period. That's a great way to never afford sub weapons and telegraph your attacks. Your job is making sure those trigger pulls count and not being in a cooldown when they're needed. What's nice is that with shots taking 10% of the ink and the sub weapon, spoilers, taking 60%, it's easy to count out the exact number of shots left. Beyond learning to track the ink usage, I recommend training mode for blasters more than any other class. Use it to get used to the delay before the explosion, and especially to get a feel for the optimal range. I can't stress how important it is to lead fire and keep optimal distance. If spotted, you need a direct hit to survive. If it misses, it'll sail past the target and explode far away while they're right beside you. Make sure they don't see you from a distance. If you're afraid that playing at range means you won't land any direct hits, then indirect hits aren't a silver medal. They're a helpful friend. They hit around corners, confirm if someone is there or not, and do at least 50 damage, which means they force movement out of whatever they hit because they will die to a second shot. If you douse and hit someone trying to ambush, they just entered a direct fight with you at a disadvantage. Using the splash damage for setups is a lot better than forcing yourself to one-shot a moving body every single time. The blaster is terrible at turfing and doesn't gain map control by itself, but that doesn't mean it can't get the necessary ink to space out in a direct fight. It actually covers the space around the user's feet very well, allowing them an out in a lot more situations than most poor turfing weapons. It's nice that it has this because if there's one thing blasters hate dealing with, besides duelies, it's very long-ranged attackers. Unless the kit has something that allows it to fight back against this, it's often easily bullied by the longer reaching chargers and splatlings. Expanding upon the duelies point, mobility is a blaster's greatest enemy. Blasters are so slow and rigid while duelies have a whole movement option dedicated to weaving around attacks. It's a very perceivable hole in blasters playstyles. That's how the blaster deals with other players, so what about the other stuff you have to put a bullet into? It's very easy to land direct hits on the Rainmaker shield, so it's great at that. The direct hit instantly busts their ballers, the splash damage is a great anti-ink armor attack, and blasters have a very easy time against splashdowns who try to panic button after being shot once. Moving into the mode-specific goodness, if there's an objective where the enemies are gathering, this can hit all of them for a good amount of damage and force them to scatter. It might even get a multi-kill. Just be aware that hitting the spire in the center of the tower forces a spark shot, so again, get used to optimal spacing. Its sub-weapon is Toxic Mist! Another new sub-weapon? It's just full of surprises! For 60% ink, this AoE aura covers a circular area for 5 seconds, lowering the run speed and swim speed of any foe within it while draining their ink tank. Rude. The ink tank drainage is a constant percentage, depleting any full ink tank in 8.33 seconds, even if it's a Splattershot Junior. When an opponent is within the affected area, they glow and a distinct sound announces that they're hit. Surprisingly, throwing multiple toxic mists at once is allowed. It has ink recovery lag, but it's a valid tactic and precious few sub-weapons allow this by default. Toxic mist sounds pretty weak at first, but it's an instant acting effect that doesn't have a long startup, and that's the main thing that sets it apart from the more powerful bombs. As for weaknesses, that's a pretty high ink cost for no damage and the ink recovery lag is long. The punishment for just running right through it isn't particularly harsh either. The effects only work while in the circle and then goes away immediately. Funny, you'd think breathing in the stuff would have lasting side effects, but I guess not. In wide open maps, the Toxic Mist might not be able to do much more than slow someone down, but in a mode like Rainmaker, it's much more helpful. The lowered speed means they can't make a jump that the Rainmaker might need to make, and thus might shut down a push entirely on its own. This is a much more situational sub-weapon that could mean a lot on the right map, but could also do almost nothing for you. The effective sub-power-up is longer range and faster throwing speed. Not exactly great. For the blaster, Toxic Mist is great in theory. It wants to hit immobilized targets, but be mindful of the ink consumption and ink recovery lag from both the sub and main weapons. This sub confirms if someone is there outside the blaster's normal range and prevents foes from moving in a certain way. It can stop a getaway by a lightweight that you outrange. 
Then just in general, it makes the target way easier to pick off due to all the debuffs. Probably the best usage for this is against the aforementioned dualies. They get increased ink consumption when dodging all around, and blasters are normally very weak to them because of that. There's not much else to say about it. Use it to keep the other team off of the objectives when unable to get a good shot, use it to lower their stats, force the shorter weapons to fight you, and follow up with an easy one-hit kill. Its special weapon is Splashdown! Ah, this thing again. Well, I guess the main and sub combination is pretty alright, so we can't get too mad about the redundancy here. This doesn't have a whole lot of synergy with the main weapon, since it doesn't like to get in too close, and the Splashdown is a bad panic button a high-level play. I feel this is best used to hide on ledges and use at opportune times to score an easy kill that doesn't need to be aimed. Or for the good old super jump trick when pressure is needed at the objective. If the splashdown doesn't kill, its minimum damage is 55, meaning that any indirect blast will finish the job. That's about as good as it gets. When using all three pieces together, a toxic miss could be followed up with a splashdown once they're hit with a movement penalty. It takes 170 points to build, so players who like their splashdowns will need to score lots of kills to do it. Blasters paint with blood, not by covering turf, and this is probably the hardest splashdown to earn between the mid-charge and poor turfing. Now that I'm listing all these traits and strategies together, this made me realize what a unique and interesting experience the blaster really is. This is a main weapon that's about as fighting focused as it gets. Everything it does either has the potential to one-hit kill, or makes a one-hit kill easier to land. This is a decent weapon in Tower Control and Rainmaker, where it's announced to you when the other team is on the objective. Alternatively, if you're a stealthy slayer who likes to hide and flank those who are rushing the objective, this is the weapon for you! We're starting off our equipment with our sucky shout-out of the day! I want to talk about Object Shredder. It seemed good to me at first, and I'd like to debunk it for others who made the same mistake I did. Sure, the damage from blasters is high. But the rate of damage is so low that there's far better ways of dealing high damage to objects. The objects, while shredded by blaster, already take sufficient damage without this ability, since it deals with ink armor and smaller objects 100% of the time. No direct hit necessary. The effective main power up on a blaster is increased accuracy while jumping! Not a particularly helpful effect, but running a little bit, I suppose, could technically do something for you. Besides that, this is a weapon that plays for trades a lot. Anything mobility related or anything that lessens the penalties for dying can be a great thing. Specifically, Splashdown can get its special loss when dying almost to zero with just a little bit of special saver. Our second and final kit today is the Custom Blaster. Its sub-weapon is Auto Bomb, a brand new type of bomb. The name might be a tad misleading. If you're expecting this to replace any other type of bomb, you're probably going to be very disappointed. In fact, a lot of top players thought this way at first and didn't see its merits right away. Auto Bombs are thrown on the ground and stick their landing. Once done, a circle appears to all players. If no enemies are present within that circle, the auto bomb explodes in place. If an enemy is present, hiding in ink or not, the bomb will start walking after them until it's either within one hit kill range or until two and a half seconds have passed. Ties are broken by whoever's closest. The run speed is unaffected by ink colors, though it cannot travel up walls and it might be detecting an enemy atop a ledge, causing it to just dig its face into the wall. The explosion is smaller than a splat bomb, and the splash damage is 30. As stated above, it's not gonna sneak up in one hit kill much. That isn't the point of this at all. The little chicken waddle is a pretty distinct sound, alerting to its presence. Though the circle is big and it can be thrown out of view, it's often still noticed due to just how many tells have to be missed for it not to be. What makes the auto bomb so strong is that it instantly proves if someone is there when you think they are for just 55% of the ink tank, and that's plenty of ink for a follow-up attack. Use it to answer questions. Killing isn't the goal, but it's nice if it just happens. Another good use of the auto bomb is added pressure whenever an enemy is cornered and trying to fight off one of your buddies already. It's a great way to throw in support. If there was ever a time to teach someone about ink recovery lag, it's this bomb. Auto bomb has an especially long lag period, and it's something to be aware of since that means that despite its low ink cost, two in quick succession isn't possible without ink saver sub or giant ink tank. That's a weapon for another day. In other situations, it's good at disrupting the back line since throwing range can often land the bomb in that area, and the lengthy duration of the bomb's threat makes it very helpful whenever the sniper perches are accessible from the center of the stage. It's also nice in tower control and rainmaker for the same reason, since the location of an enemy rushing the objective is outright announced to you. For the custom blaster, the auto bomb is a big difference from the vanilla kit. This is a different take on manipulating enemy movement, but this one is more about watching them react to the bomb and pre-firing where they'll naturally run to. 
This sustains over less time than the Toxic Mist, but is immediate pressure due to the potential for damage or even a one-hit kill. The splash damage on auto bombs is 30, and the maximum splash damage on the blaster is 70, so while it's possible to combo into this and it sounds nice, it's very unreliable and the blaster is often going to do closer to 50. A more consistent use of the auto bombs is the aforementioned pre-firing when you're manipulating their movement. Blasters have trouble against long-range weapons, and a big selling point of the custom blaster is a throwing attack as a way to fight back. Its special weapon is Inkjet for 190 points. The custom blaster is middle of the road for Inkjet charge, but is bad at painting if it isn't scoring a lot of kills. This is yet another way the custom blaster gets more of an identity as the one that can actually fight back against long range or when it's being rushed. It just might be hard to actually get to that point. It's also kind of fitting that it essentially just turns into a long range blaster for the duration of its special. As always, use the flight to stay up high with a good view of the action and turn into a more in your face attacker than a stealthy one. I would say this has good synergy with the main weapon not only because it can throw an auto bomb to space out before activating, but also because it's likely to be hiding somewhere not easily seen before activation and will place its inkjet marker there. If the blaster was tactical and stealthy, then the custom is the aggressive cousin due to its long range weaknesses being covered on multiple fronts. Once again when talking about the modes, I would suggest Rainmaker or Tower Control due to highly telegraphed enemy movement. I don't know when this new weapon class streak will end, but I'm happy it's not because I get to tell you about something else that's fun, the ink brush. This is a new take on the roller. Starting with the similarities, it's a melee weapon that throws ink around in front and has a continuous roll. The devil is in the details. So the swing is a side to side motion that spawns three blotches of ink in a V shape, which then fall to the ground. Despite their size, they're very reasonable, only using up 6% of the ink tank per swing. As general logic would dictate, they suck at damage and range. In fact, this is the weakest attack of any kind. To get just 30 damage, it has the shortest effective range of any weapon, and even being just a little bit away causes damage fall off, bottoming out at next to nothing. The roll is also a lightweight, only doing 20 damage when bumping into a foe, but boasting the best roll handling and fastest kid form speed in the entire game. This makes it the best weapon for moving across grates and uninkable land. We've got good speed, good ink economy, and huge blotches of ink matched with being terrible at fighting. Yep, it's one of those turfing weapons that builds up its special super fast. In order to fight, it has to lean in for a kiss, and no one wants to get the enemy lipstick on their cheek. It's best to be stealthy, and head-on attacks are almost never a good idea for it. Everything else outranges it, and probably outdamages it too, so use the movement to your advantage. Either approach quickly from behind, swim in quickly to overwhelm, or just get away fast when things aren't looking good. As tempting as it might seem, following enemies into their ink with the roll is an invitation for trouble. It's left vulnerable with a trail of ink so thin it's near impossible to swim back through. The roll's main purpose is getting to the center of the map to throw around ink very fast and help assure map control at the start of the fight. Though it's a thin trail that looks like it would have the player stepping in enemy ink, the roll actually ignores the effect of enemy ink, so it moves consistently fast every time. Other than the obvious turfing, the strongest mode-specific application of the main weapon is in Clam Blitz, where it can collect clams very easily with the roll, and then roll up to the enemy goal to pick up easy points. I've recommended against rolling into enemy ink to challenge them, but this is not doing that. The end game is getting points, not whacking them with a wet noodle. And even then, it can still get away after the job is done. The fight is in the sub-weapon, Splat Bomb. Of course it's good for throwing at awkward times for enemies. The ink brush can't fight very well, so it can contribute its sub-weapon to its partners instead. The ink brush is so short range, it doesn't get to use the Splat Bomb for its own gain as often as a shooter or something long range would. It's better used during stealthy approaches along side swings since the splash damage is 30 and that will at least reduce the number of hits to splat. Since the main weapon is so ink efficient, it often gets lots of swings after a bomb even with no abilities. Thanks to the affordability, it can often toss a splat bomb to answer questions and see if it's safe to keep moving. Alternatively, use it defensively to stop a rush as an ink rush can't do much to fight back once noticed. For the special, splash down. Due to being so bad at fighting, the Ink Brush has a dirt cheap special charge at a measly 150 points. This is less so the Ink Brush is the main weapon as it is the Splashdown as the main weapon. 
Since it usually likes to be stealthy and get in close anyway, it gets lots of chances to use this. The Splat Bomb is also great in conjunction with it, either for cutting off an escape route or to manipulate movement into a prepared splashdown. Or toss a bomb after the reload. Since it's often hiding in ink when the heat's rough, it should often be in prime situations to either drop off a ledge and splash down or use the super jump method. Of course, the roll can be used to quickly approach with a prepared special. Now, the way this all comes together is to form a weapon that's bad at fighting, but moves super fast and throws ink around like crazy to do little things to support the team. This is a weapon I keep coming back to because it's fun to troll with, and in fact, that's another advantage. Because enemies just think they can win against it, they'll often just shoot you outright and not focus on the objective or on a teammate in a vital moment. It can be good, I just wouldn't blame you if you said that you didn't like it. The Ink Brush's poor combat and strong turfing make it ideal for turf wars, but its strongest mode specific perk is in Clam Blitz. Play this for speedy stealth and turfing above all else. The effective main power up on Ink Brush is greater inking speed and it also makes it paint better. This is not a very visible effect even with lots of stacking, so I don't recommend it. Ability slots would be a lot better off going towards swim speed to make the movement even better, or possibly to cancel out a ninja squid to make it play an even stealthier game. For the Otzi, we have the Ink Brush Nouveau. Has the same stats as your regular Ink Brush, but with a brand name, darling. We're not quite done with new sub weapons, because this one has the Ink Mine. Well, maybe by some measure we've already finished talking about sub weapons. This isn't considered a very strong one, but you should decide for yourself. Up to two ink mines per user are allowed to be placed within the ground. At 60% ink cost and no ink recovery lag, it's pretty easy to place them in succession. An ink mine will never detonate without being triggered, and the area of effect for it to be triggered is visible to its own team with the circle around it. Two ink mines may not be placed within the radius of one another. It's triggered by enemy movement within its circle or when the mine itself is touched by enemy ink. Alternatively, the oldest ink mine still standing will explode when a third one is placed. When triggered, it's a hybrid of point sensor and burst bomb, though not as strong as either of those individually. It covers the ground very well, does 45 direct damage, 35 with anything less, and acts as a tracker for the whole team for 5 seconds compared to the 7 offered by the point sensor. Though the perks afforded by it might not be as strong as other sources, the fact that it does both at once gives the enemy a massive wound and a target on their back that makes them change their behavior. Since they're visible to their own team and not the enemy, these are traps best laid in the areas the enemy team has to travel through to reach their goal. Stealthy players can keep them between enemy spawn and choke points to the center of the map as a way of making them think twice before challenging you. Another application is using it as an alert system. If the player's back has to be turned to focus on something, preemptively place an ink mine while getting into position so they have to pass through it to reach you. Due to all the tells from the explosion, it's impossible to be snuck up on in some situations thanks to this. In ranked battles, there's only so many ways that the enemy team can get to their stated objective. Because of this, placing them in strategic locations can buy precious seconds to slow them down or straight up lead to their defeat thanks to the tracking and damage. For the Ink Brush, it already likes avoiding direct confrontation and doesn't want to be engaged first in combat. This has some legitimate benefit in not being snuck up on as easily, not to mention dealing damage without having to get close. The problem is that without a throwing attack, and especially without a lethal sub weapon, Ink Brush Nouveau is very prone to getting bullied from a distance since that means every part of its regular moveset is bad at fighting and doesn't make its range game any stronger. Moving on to the Body Cloth, the effective sub power up on Ink Mine raises the splash damage radius and lengthens tracking time. Not great, but maybe your favorite gear has got one sub slot of it, can't hurt to have. I think you know what's next. If the main and sub aren't good, then it's probably gonna have a very good special. And so it does, baller! With Ink Brush being so stealthy anyway, it gets lots of chances to drop onto heads and explode. When it's not doing that, it's yet another tool for ink brushes to get away when the roll seems too risky. With 180 points and good speed, the new Vo has an easy time building up its special. I should mention that Baller's movement speed is affected by the player's current run speed. The ink brush Nouveau is one of only four lightweights with the Baller, meaning that it has inherently fast speed when using this special, and that can be a reason to like this weapon. When you really think about it, Baller would come naturally to players of this weapon since it's basically just the ink brush roll with a shield. 
With such fast movement, with or without its special, it's able to charge through in different situations and get away in others. It gets the baller all the time, so when it gets going, it's a beast and made far less fragile and more capable. Ballers take heavy damage against chargers, so that's a consistent weakness across all three parts. It might still be exploitable, but this kit's pretty darn good depending on the map rotation. Of course the main weapon's incredible movement, stupid fast special charges, and baller makes this an excellent choice for clan blitz. My praises don't even stop there. Thanks to having such an easy baller and good movement, I recommend this highly for splat zones as well. Special charge up is heavily recommended for this weapon because if you don't have the baller currently, you should be trying to get it. As long as nothing is immediately dangerous, be painting. It's so easy to get the special, why would you not play around it? Nouveau is for today. Permanent ink brushes forever. Its sub is the sprinkler. As per usual, throw it at the start of the match for some free points, get easy specials, and use it as bait whenever possible. Ink brushes prefer indirect approaches and enemies tend to shoot at a sprinkler whenever they see it. It's a good method to testing the waters before swimming on and making things a lot safer for the little wet noodle. Its special weapon is Ink Armor. Between the main weapon, the sprinkler, and a 180 point special, the Ink Armor is meant to be the focus. Right away, it's clear that the added defense is a good thing when the Ink Brush has such a slow time to kill, but that's about all I can say about this particular set of Ink Armor. Ink Armor matters so much because it helps the entire team and the user's ability to stay alive and keep building it up matters above all else. While this one doesn't build it up slowly, it faces stiff competition from the Splattershot Jr., the NZAP, and even the .96 gal, which all build it up quickly and sport either longer range, a lethal bomb, or both. I'm gonna be real, I feel naked playing this weapon like I never have any options if there's any long range game going on at all. Definitely save this one for the smaller maps where the sprinkler can do things like paint the middle of the map well. Utterly sacrificing any offensive aptitude for just being a strong team supporter, this one doesn't really stand out against the competition much. A new weapon class in the form of extreme buckets. Slashers are a more tactical cousin of shooters with a manual fire that throws ink up before it splashes down. The trajectory obeys physics and can be aimed up to attack from behind walls or to hit marks on top of ledges. Slosher attacks in general are very committal, coming out slowly and have next to no straving speed while attacking. In addition, most sloshers attack in a very straight line and require practice to not be strafed out. Thankfully, the ink is generated in just the right way that fighting normally is likely to ink the holder's feet, which is a much appreciated trait on something that has to aim up and attack slowly. No shooting at the ground in order to escape here. This particular slosher has pretty decent range compared to the long range shooters and is very capable of being sneaky from behind objects. Aiming straight gets the most out of the range and lots of ink to swim through, while aiming high is advice for close range. A standard hit is 70 damage. Due to the unorthodox way of launching bodily fluids, damage is calculated in very different ways from all other weapons. There is no damage fall off based on distance, but there's significant fall off based on how far the ink falls below the player, bottoming out at 30 damage. Generally, it still comes out to a two hit KO. 70 is just a high powered hit and it has to have some kind of downside. This isn't to say that attacking from the high ground is bad. It's something sloshers can do very well. It just gets a slight nerf from doing it. Attacking outside the enemy's range in any way possible has great value since one hit kill weapons like rollers and blasters make quick work of sloshers. When sneak attacking, it's most efficient to aim high on the first attack and then aim level for the second. The sloshes combo into one another, giving it a super fast time to splat with very little time to react. Plus they coat the enemy in enemy ink on hit number one. I have to credit Captain Astronaut with the term super slosh and slam jam for that one. Its sub weapon is suction bomb. Good sub weapon, good, good sub weapon here. Of course, it forces movement away from choke points, giving you the initiative, but remember that the minimum damage of suction bombs is 30 from a direct hit, and a level slosh is 70. The throwing range is far greater than the slosh. The more I say that, the more it sounds like a club, the slosh. Anyway, it's a combo that makes far more kills possible. Just be careful of ink consumption. Suction bombs are 70%, while one slosh is 7%. It's likely to get empty from a full tank after taking out just one enemy. Special weapon is the Tenta Missiles! Ah, Tenta Missiles on a great main sub combination. Seeing a pattern here? It's like they knew they had to give these weapons indirect specials to make them not all ultimately powerful. 
Sloshers are usually behind a wall or up on a ledge, so it thankfully has a little synergy with the rest of the kit, unlike a lot of other Tana missile weapons. The missile shut down statue-like enemies for a few seconds, while the suction bomb keeps the other team away from objectives. From these points, the standard slosher is a very all-around weapon that can handle multiple types of situations and is geared for very tactical attacks between all three parts of the kit. Though it's weak in direct fights with one-hit kill weapons, it's great at flushing out enemies or using its deceptively good range to attack from out of reach. Aside from painting your own shoes, the slosher is good at turfing and can coat a zone while the other parts keep the other team away from the zone. The effective main power-up on sloshers is less damage fall-off when attacking enemies below. Not super important. I'd like to recommend Ink Saver sub pretty highly here. Just a little bit of this can mean one additional slosh from that suction bomb. And now I ask you, what could be worse than a giant paint bucket? Two giant paint buckets! It's the Slosher Deco! Its sub-weapon is Sprinkler. Not a whole lot to say here. It builds the special faster, is a good use of ink when there's nothing else to do, and useful bait because enemies often shoot at sprinklers even if it's not prudent. Otherwise, that just means more access to the baller! Of course, between the main weapon being good at painting and the sub giving more frequent specials, the cost had to be high, and this is by far the highest baller cost in the entire game at 220 points. That's not to say this is a bad baller weapon. It's one of the best. It's just not quite as free with the specials as it seems at first glance. With the slosher enjoying high vantage points and the baller able to score such easy kill dropping onto heads, this is a pretty good combo. There's not a whole lot beyond that. Sometimes it's a slosher, sometimes it's a baller. The duality of those two allow it to do something in many different times, and this is a favored pick in Clam Blitz. With this combo, you're likely to rank out of the low ranks in Clam Blitz in no time. I would say for abilities, Special Charge Up is more important on this kit than it was on the Vanilla Slosher. Getting more frequent ballers is the whole reason to play this weapon. And we got a third one, the Soda Slosher! Yellow, huh? Didn't know we were launching that body fluid at people. Its sub-weapon is the Splat Bomb! What, no fizzy bomb? Uh, anyway, good strong sub-weapon for it. Splat Bomb on its own is definitely one of the best sub-weapons in all sorts of different maps and modes. The pairing that it hits for exactly 30 minimum damage and the splash area for bombs is huge. This is a deadly combo when combined with the 70 slosh damage. Both parts can even hit at the same time. Just be mindful of bomb defense up, mitigating this slightly. Since it can hit over objects, pre-firing into opponents so they can't see it coming has never been easier. As long as it's got the initiative, it's very easy to land a quick kill, making this a little more capable of dealing with those mean ol' one-hit kill weapons. Of course, splat bombs are good spacing tools in being rushed down, further helping the slosher's vulnerabilities when using its regular attack. Its special weapon is... a new one! Yeah! The Burst Bomb Launcher! This is tied for being the rarest special in the game. Only this and a bamboozler have it. For a base duration of 6 seconds, the player is allowed to freely launch up to 17 burst bombs, the most of any bomb launcher to make up for its low damage. Just so it's clear, every bomb launcher is left-handed and they are the only left-handed attacks in the game. And thus, this cannot work around the same corners that other attackers would. The special has two uses, being able to annoy and pressure outside the normal sloshing range, and being able to coat lots of ground rapidly, since the slosher is vulnerable against long range and likes to play in the center of the map. This is a pretty great special for it. All of this combined with its rarity, and those are reasons to pick the soda slosher for your next battle alone. Of the two weapons that have it, this is 200 points versus the bamboozler's 160, but of course, a slosher is far better at turfing to make up for it. Thanks to the high painting prowess, I want to recommend Splat Zones as the big mode to play this one in. It seems most geared for that purpose. Matching that in the equipment section, Last Ditch Effort is a better ability on it with it being geared for Splat Zones. I could also recommend running lots of little abilities like Quick Super Jump just to make up for the fact there aren't really a lot of abilities to recommend for this one. A weapon I'm sure everyone has played at least once, the Aerospray MG! This is the extreme version of a turfing shooter, having the same range as the Splattershot Jr. with a higher spread shot, an insanely fast rate of fire, and tiny bullets that are easy on the ink tank with less damage. A downright puny 5-hit kill to be precise. This is an easy weapon to illustrate shot RNG with. All automatic guns shoot most accurately when the trigger is pressed, and bullets spread out as the trigger is held since sustained fire usually means turfing is desired. 
This mechanic is especially pronounced on the arrow spray because it has such a large reticle and it starts off with a 6% chance of shooting outward and quickly rises to 50%. Spray and pray leads to a lot of misses with this one, so don't approach in kid form. If they see an arrow spray, they're likely to just stay out of reach because it can't do a whole lot about that. For sure, the weapon wants to be stealthy when fighting, but I wouldn't call it an assassin weapon. With the rate of fire, even outright cuddling with your foe, it's still pretty slow to get 100 damage compared to pretty much any other shooter in the game. It is a lightweight, and while mobility is good in a fight, there are better battlers in the same weight class. The greatest reason to play Aerospray is to cover lots of ground and move all around while doing so to get frequent specials, because it isn't nearly as outclassed in that aspect. It's important to use the turfing together with mobility to reach the center of the map ASAP to code it before the enemy team even arrives. There isn't much to say about the gun. It's pure turfing. If I may divert for a moment, I feel like a lot of new players tend to like this weapon because only turf war is unlocked at first, it covers a lot of ground, and it shoots super fast. The scoreboard is based on turfing alone, so it often just hands first place to an arrow spray even if they didn't contribute much. Plus, it feels very powerful due to the rapid feedback as it shoots something. As a result, it feels a lot stronger than it actually is. This is not a rapid killing weapon at all. Its sub-weapon is the Suction Bomb. Many weapons outrange the arrow spray and plenty more will bully it. The Suction Bomb is a sustained spacing tool for retreat since it likes getting in, painting, and then ducking out. While not as good at pre-firing as pretty much any other shooter, it's still useful to throw a suction bomb before a sneak attack to avoid the enemy traveling in a way you don't expect. It's a pincer attack. In the way of core stats, suction bombs are costly, but an arrow spray generates a lot of shots on little ink, so it'll be able to keep doing a lot in these situations. We got a new special weapon here, sort of. The Curling Bomb Launcher. A maximum of 12 curling bombs with every special. This might be the weirdest special of them all, because it doesn't truly generate curling bombs, but instead look alike bombs that operate on different rules. These curling bombs do not increase in size while the button is held, and always move at a constant distance. Sure, cooking the bomb might not be as desirable when trying to spam them, but it does mean the special has less options than the subversion. Matching the main weapon, this is a painter special weapon, traveling a distance and covering lots of ground as it goes. The special is tied for being the rarest special, only possessed by this and a Tentabrella. With the arrow spray giving such a good paint job and the low, low cost of 160 points, it's definitely the better of the two to spam this with. It already wants to duck out when things get hot, and this gives it something to do from a safe distance likely to cover the center of the map. Curling bombs take a long time to explode, so it can hold an area for a decent amount of time. Though the special is alright for coloring splat zones and popping the Rainmaker shield, the Suction Bomb Launcher is usually preferred due to the higher damage and being thrown rather than roll. Some map terrain makes the special pretty useless. The Aerospray MG is an unpopular weapon choice for ranked battles due to limited attacking options, low range, an outclass special, and just being very vulnerable while doing its job. Turf Wars and maybe a few Splat Zones maps that are flat and allow the curling bomb rush to spam are all it performs consistently in. Stages with open centers that allow for continuous swimming are a must. The effective main power-up on Aerospray is bullets that expand after touching the ground. Not recommended. The effective special power-up on the curling bomb launcher is increased duration. I actually recommend this. It only takes one more subslot for the potential for one more bomb. It's not great outright, but if your favorite movement gear already has it, why not? And also, I want to recommend a new ability for the arrow spray, Opening Gambit. For a main slot on a hat, this gives four subs of ink resist up, swim speed up, and run speed up for the first 30 seconds of a match. The time increases by 7.5 seconds for every kill or assist it lands in those first 30 seconds. After that, it's gone for good. This ability is not the greatest. It's more of a gimmick suggestion, and comeback is absolutely preferred for a weapon that dies often. It just might be easier to reach the center of the map early and cover everything before anyone shows up in a turf war. It's pretty much the only time I even like this ability a little bit, so I wanted to give it its time. Next, we move on to the gold, Aerospray RG. Its sub-weapon is Sprinkler. So, um... The main weapon isn't good at fighting and the sub-weapon doesn't even try. Other than building special juice, the best use for this is bait for sneak attacks. Players go after sprinklers a lot, so 
Using this to predict enemy movements is about the best offensive tool this kit has whenever it doesn't have its special baller. Every part of the Aerospray RG makes it easy to spam this special. With a special charge of 180 points, this is on the cheaper side of ballers too. Plus with the Aerospray being a lightweight, it gives the baller inherently faster movement speed too, a pretty rare trait among baller weapons. This kit wants to coat the ground to build specials within seconds, be stealthy about it when it can't accomplish that goal, and use the baller to lead pushes when it otherwise couldn't. Its purposes are few, but very clear to see. For the maps, while it would seem like this would excel in clam blitz or splat zones due to the frequent baller, I would recommend the slosher deco over it in pretty much any map. That weapon has the same combination of sprinkler and baller, is pretty good at turfing, and it fights a lot better. That's often seen as the best weapon for baller spams, and it's stiff competition. I think the Aero Spray comes in far more handy for baller fans who play turf wars. And now, how strange that the bronze manages to be better than the silver and the gold. Aero Spray PG! Let's be open here. You can tell I don't like the other two Aero Sprays that much. All the way in my words ends here, because the Aero Spray PG is a good weapon. Parental guidance suggested. This is an arrow spray I would actually recommend stealthy play for pretty strongly, and that becomes apparent with the Burst Bomb. We're off to such a good start here. A Burst Bomb is cheap instant damage up to 60 on a direct hit and slaps the enemy with a movement penalty. So it essentially takes no effort to aim the arrow spray at them afterwards since it's so easy to aim to begin with. Due to the economical bullets on the main gun, it's realistic to throw two burst bombs and still get a good number of shots afterward if you just want to make extra sure that you safely get to 100 damage. Throwing a burst bomb and following up with an attack seems like it could offset the bad damage of the main weapon, but even when removing the throwing motions, it's about the same amount of time to get the splat regardless of how, what combination you do things in. Use it to assure the enemy can't run or bop them with easy damage from a distance, not to soften them up for your own attacks. It's not always going to work out so quickly. Burst Bomb is an uncommon sub-weapon, and it gets to have more movement options. Not bad for a gun that can't fight directly very well. It's also just good cheap damage to throw at an already damaged foe so that it isn't necessary to fight directly. Use it to move all around or to attack from outside range. And Burst Bombs also match the Aerospray's high focus on turfing, making it easy to spam the Booyah Bomb! People of Inkopolis, raise your hands into the air for this new special weapon! This is a powerful special that involves the whole team working together. Upon activation, the user floats above their current position, becoming the center of attention, and is given a shield that lasts for 9 seconds or until losing 470 HP. Again, many attacks get damage multipliers against it, so it's more of an abstract concept. Just know that shooters and duelies are useless against it, but chargers, rollers, and fizzy bombs are quite strong against it. Train against different weapons to get a good idea of what's hard to tangle with. Mostly, I would look out for other specials, namely the Tenta Missiles, Ultra Stamps, Ballers, Ink Storms, and Splashdowns. Splashdowns get an enormous 7.5 damage multiplier and will always destroy it on contact. Other than wait to die, the shield is meant to buy time for teammates to send their booyah energy to charge up for the titular bomb. Living teammates are rewarded with special charge for sending their positive energy. First to respond to the call gets six special points, second gets three, third gets two, fourth gets one, and the fifth and final one gives .5. What goes around comes around. The minimum possible charge time for a booyah bomb is not well understood due to latency and human reaction time varying. But the user is free to do their own booyahs, and them spamming alone takes three seconds. And it will likely be faster than that as long as at least somebody chimes in. Without a single booyah uttered by anyone, it takes roughly 8.5 seconds to charge, just barely usable at all. Once the charge is complete, the spirit bomb may be launched, which destroys its own shield. The range on this is longer than any main weapon in the entire game. It travels rapidly to its destination, sits for two-thirds of a second, then expands to a larger size than a splashdown. The attack does 150 damage per second to anyone or anything touching it, coats the ground underneath, and diffuses any bombs caught in the area. It's a very obvious train of thought to compare this to splashdown, since it seems like an objectively superior splashdown, and... Okay, maybe it is one. <laughs> The advantages to picking Splashdown are less startup time, instant damage instead of damage over time, and bonus damage on certain objects. The Booyah Bomb gets no bonus damage, and its 150 damage per second is always consistent, which sounds bad, but it makes it simpler to use. No need to memorize all those other specials that get bonus damage against one another. 
On throwing it, the desired destination must be within the user's line of sight, as it explodes with the first surface it collides with. This means it's functional cover for approaches and enables your own team to easily shoot the fleeing squids. Of course, once it's over, it leaves the holder pretty vulnerable unless the bomb was thrown at their feet. This is a useful special for both offense and defense, very safe to use if the enemy team doesn't have an outright counter against it, and one that you should get used to whenever you play the Aerospray or not. It gets everyone's attention, both changing enemy behavior and letting your team know it's time to get going. Once thrown, it's very likely to color in a splat zone, give cover to teammates to move forward, or just force enemies away from a given point for a while. Sure, you should use it at the last seconds of a turf war to score some extra points. I might not list every situation for every mode, but it's plain to see this is a very safe and strong special no matter the mode. Straight up, people play the PG just to get this special all the time. It's the easiest, most spammable one in all of Splatoon 2 at 190 points on such a good turfing weapon. Seriously, there's not much need to attack directly when you can just focus on building special points in safe places to contribute this thing so frequently. There's a reason this shows up in rank far more than the other two variants. Absolutely consider it if Booyah Bomb is your favorite special. There are only five weapons that have Booyah Bomb, so this having it at all is already a pretty big plus. Maps with more open designs or single large splat zones are what I would recommend the highest. It needs to be able to throw that Booyah Bomb in as many cases as possible. The effective special power-up on Booyah Bombs is slightly reduced charge time, faster throwing, and higher damage. The returns are small and not worth it over plenty of other abilities that you could be running just fine. Run speed up, swim speed up, and special charge up together are the backbone of this entire weapon. Out of not wanting to scare you away with too much damn talking in the first episode, it's the alternate kits for the Splattershot Jr. starting with the Custom! Identical stats to the young boy you used to know. Since it's been a little time, I'm reiterating that the Splattershot Jr.'s unique trait is having a larger ink tank that has 110% the capacity of any other weapon. Unfortunately, this was stuck with the Auto Bomb. It's not a very good match for how the Auto Bomb works. Usually the strategy is to throw the bomb, see if somebody is there, and if they are, fire from range while they fumble to deal with it. This has to get in so close to do anything, and the main gun is so poor at fighting, that it just isn't nearly as rough for the enemies to space apart from the bomb and deal with you. The uses that the junior enjoys most are knowing when to not move a given way after checking, or to go with a buddy and throw an auto bomb on their behalf. But really, at this point, better weapons have auto bombs. The larger ink tank is the only reason auto bomb lovers would want to pick this, as it allows for two to be thrown on a full ink tank without any ink saver sub. But at that point, the weapons that are a big step above it can just run a little ink saver sub and be more tanky. Its special weapon, however, is a first timer, the Ink Storm. Well, there's the theme: making enemies not move a certain way. Ink Storm is a capsule that is held above the Inkling's head until they throw it. Ah. The special duration is infinite until then. Once it hits the ground, it creates a rain cloud that centers around the capsule breaking. Consider that the eye of the storm. The cloud continues in the direction it was thrown and functions as an AoE attack for 8 seconds. The details of how exactly it worked confused me for a while, so let's get specific. There are individual raindrops painting the ground and a circle visible to enemies showing where the rain can presently fall. But this doesn't mean that the raindrops can just be dodged. Within the circle, all enemies take 0.4 damage per frame or 24 damage per second. When swimming in your own ink inside of the ink storm zone, health stops regenerating too, so this data is constant. Staying in for about 4 seconds will always mean a kill on its own, so cockiness is fatal. Multiple overlapping ink storms also stack in damage, and this can get out of control quickly. This paint splat zones well enough to at least stop enemy control and is a pressurizer to keep enemies out of certain areas. While not often used as a killer, it reliably gets some enemies to move away from objectives because it comes out fast, and there really is nothing that can be done about it once it's been dropped. There's not any ability or weapon that suppresses it like a lot of the more in-your-face specials have causing this to be pretty helpful in really any fight. Ink Storm should not be used at the last seconds of a turf war as the cloud ceases producing raindrops on the whistle. If you're going to use it, get the full eight seconds out of it. Special power-ups effect on Ink Storm lengthens the throwing range and also increases the duration of the rain cloud. The returns on the duration are poor, requiring six sub slots just to get one extra second. Wouldn't run this one unless there's some sort of map where you'd want to throw it a longer distance. 
Now, we've got to talk. This means we're three for three on the pieces of the Custom Junior not shining at combat. The Ink Storm is an exceedingly common special on a lot of powerful weapons, too. It's just a main weapon that coats the ground so it can easily earn a quick special that coats the ground, all while getting fewer uses out of its sub than the competition. It's a recipe for instantly losing almost any direct confrontation, so tune your playstyle around spamming the special and staying out of harm's way. I know these words make it sound like a horrible weapon, and I sure don't think it has a place in 95% of ranked battles, but what I will give it is that it's fun to play. Custom Junior is tied for the cheapest Ink Storm at 160 points. The most unique way that these subs and specials interact with this weapon is that giant ink tank. By default, it's able to throw two auto bombs and then drop the Ink Storm for a free reload and drop two more auto bombs. It's almost like having double specials. Nothing else can do something like that without the help of abilities, and it's easy and admittedly really fun to do. This frustrates me because I want this weapon to be great, it's just so outclassed. Fans of the Autobomb probably play a weapon that's good at fighting. Players of Inkstorm have about a zillion better choices, and lovers of the Splattershot Jr. have the Splattershot Jr. In the way of maps, the easily afforded Inkstorm and Autobombs are nice at taking over a splat zone, but that's really all it's able to contribute on its own. And I think it's most at home in Turf Wars, playing a support role to other players. If there is a strong desire within you to bring it into ranked, then it performs best strictly in splat zones that are long and thin, because it can spam the Inkstorm to take those over with ease. And then we have the Kenza Splattershot Jr. I'm gonna give you a few seconds to sit and guess which sub weapon this has. You ready? Torpedo! I'm willing to bet this is the sub weapon the fewest of you have even heard of. It wasn't released until one of the very last content updates to the game. Let's talk about what makes it tick. This homing bomb detects nearby enemies within a given range and moves toward them. Say, that sounds awfully familiar. In a basic sense, it's an autobomb but it has many little properties that set it apart and is anything but basic. First, it's slightly more expensive at 60% ink. What does 5% more ink get you? Well, once thrown into the air, it will pause and lock onto the current position of the nearest target with its landing point indicated by a circle on the ground visible to everyone. The explosion throws ink everywhere! There's an initial explosion that does 60 damage on direct hit, 35 splash damage, and then it produces droplets, which firecracker when they land, dealing 12 damage for each one that lands. The area of turf covered is actually greater than a suction bomb. If no target is within range, it plummets to the ground and goes boom where it lands. No droplets produced either, so it's basically just a weaker splat bomb if it doesn't connect. If it ever touches the surface, it will never activate homing and just do the weak explosion. If it locks on and then connects, it's probably going to soften up the opponent for a follow-up attack and then get them stuck in some goop while it's at it. I say if it connects, because there's a lot standing in its way. It makes distinct noises, it locks onto the enemy's current position, and does not track them as they're moving out of the way. And now for the big one, this is the only bomb capable of being disarmed by normal attacks. It has 20 HP, and if hit by almost anything, it simply disappears. The only stuff that doesn't one-hit a torpedo are things like the ink brush's splash damage and droplets from another torpedo. <laughs> if it gets shot, it's going down. The last mechanic worth knowing is that only one torpedo from a given player may be active at a time. If you're thinking of running Ink Saver Sub to throw two without a reload, that is not allowed. It's starting to sound lame, I know. One lousy bullet wastes your whole sub weapon, but remember that killing is not always the goal of a single move. It leaves anyone it locks onto with a choice. Either take the force damage in enemy ink, or shoot it down. In an effort to avoid damage, most frontliners who are in the middle of something or not at full health will choose to fight the torpedo. Throw it at awkward times where it forces a change in behavior. They can't shoot down a torpedo while also dealing with you coming at them. Throwing them a torpedo gives an opportune moment to take initiative before they can shift their attention. The goal is to distract, but if it happens to do damage too, that's an added bonus. When talking about more backline weapons, it can disrupt them for a few seconds. But again, even an uncharged charger can one-hit a torpedo, so this isn't for long. A minor general use is throwing it at the end of a time limit in a turf war. That huge explosion is worth some nice points, and it will actually still plink off an enemy's head and get the full effect after time is called. For another mode specific quirk, it's easy to pressure in rank battles where objectives are announced and you know where the enemy is. What all this does for the Splattershot Jr. is a mix of good and bad. 
This is tied for being the rarest sub weapon, so that might be a reason to pick this alone. Additionally, out of the only four weapons to have a torpedo, this one is the only shooter, but it's also greatly the shortest range. Not having reach on your side makes it harder to pull off the tricks, so it's forced to be stealthier and get in close. What it's more likely to do is hang back, throw torpedoes to assist teammates, and let them finish the job. Remember that you're a team and not one squid. In the way of niceness, it adds to the Splattershot Jr. being great at turf coverage so that it can build up points for the Bubble Blower. I swear a Bubble Blower is usually reserved for long range weapons. The two rare exceptions just happen to be the first two in a row. <sighs> Similar to the Kenza Splat Roller, this serves as a cover for the Jr. to get in close. With its very fast fire, it can hit these big targets with every bullet to rack up damage very rapidly. The Junior likes to slip in undetected and duck out before it gets too heated, and this allows it to do just that. The Torpedo also does good damage to bubbles, allowing for instant detonations at range. This is one of the pricier bubble blowers, but that's to be expected with how good the Junior is at special spam and how powerful of a special this is. Overall, weird weapon. I think this is one of those sets that might not have the best synergy, but the individual parts making it up are interesting on their own. It's good at covering the ground, so it can use a rare special, plus has a rare sub weapon. I do feel like the longer range torpedo weapons are a lot more played among people who like that sub though. Really, if the regular junior is built for support, the Kenza is more capable in battle when it can find ways in and has corners to hide behind. For equipment, I would like to feature Ink Saver Sub! Why, didn't I just say it was useless? Well, this is a special case. Yes, only one torpedo is allowed at a time, but if it's just being instantly detonated on a bubble, it's easy to afford two torpedoes with that bigger ink tank. This is an uncommon instance where Ink Saber Sub serves a legit purpose on torpedo due to the unique combination of main sub and special. Best burrito I know how! Roller Al Carbon! It's the lightweight roller! Lightweight is right. Compared to the standard flat roller, it boasts better movement stats, considerably lower ink consumption, a faster one hit KO, and a faster roll speed with tighter handling. The most attractive of these by far is the fast attack speed. It's got that small man attitude, splatting in only 11 frames, the lowest of any main weapon in the entire game. Now, this sounds really powerful. But in actuality, it's only just barely the fastest. There's some pretty long range weapons out there that come within two or even one frame of this. And be honest with yourself, it's worth being 1 60th of a second slower in return for long range. A less obvious property of this weapon is the roll speed. It usually takes a few seconds to spin up to top speed on other weapons, yet this roller gets it almost instantly. In return, the roll only does 70 damage, making it far more limited in different contexts. The main attack, on the other hand, can do many possible numbers. The horizontal does 25 to 100 damage, while the vertical does 40 to 120. Look at how close I am to this inanimate target and still not getting 100 damage! Imagine working with that range in a real fight. You can see why I prefer longer range stuff. This is 100% an assassin weapon meant for stealth and aggression with no real strengths elsewhere. It has the potential to kill fast without making a show of itself, but is very easily punished if it misses. Its regular horizontal fling only outranges the epicenters of the Luna Blaster and Clash Blasters, making it downright puny in direct fights and pretty poor at turfing. Even if it's rolling around at the speed of sound, the roller is very small. The roll is poor and its fling's turfing is outclassed by all other rollers and even brushes. As for the vertical fling, it barely outranges an arrow spray. <laughs> while being narrow and difficult to land. This all sounds pretty terrible, but then it becomes apparent just how much so when its sub-weapon is auto ball. <laughs> Going into damage right away, sure. You get 30 minimum damage out of the splash, and that could set up for a roll kill, or an indirect hit to finish off an enemy if they aren't running any bomb defense. And you know, it's also functional as a long sustained way of making sure an enemy doesn't go a certain way when it's hard to land a direct hit with a roll. These things aren't always realistic, but it's something. The real prize here is throwing the autobomb for information when getting into position for setups. The goal isn't to score a cheap kill, but to know if somebody's there before moving forward. Being able to check with absolute certainty like that also plays into outright needing the initiative. Autobombs are inexpensive, and so is the main weapon, so swing away. Throwing range with the potential for high damage also means it can at least stop a sniper for a bit and not be completely useless against it. 
The main weapon has pretty limited capabilities, and the sub weapon isn't likely to get any kills by itself, forcing them to work together. So, it's gotta have some broken overpowered special weapon, right? Nah, it is Inkstorm. Due to the tiny main weapon preferring low places, this isn't the kind of weapon that naturally gets high vantage points to throw at this in strategic locations. If I can give it any credit, indirect hits from a roller are very fluid in how much damage they do, so damage over time could aid in landing a kill from an indirect hit or cutting off an enemy's escape route. Combine that with the auto bomb and the free reload, and it's certainly possible to get annoying with it. As a complete package, the carbon roller is outclassed for sure. This weapon is the custom Splattershot Jr., but turfs worse. Same sub and special combination, main weapon is short range, same weight class. They're even tied with each other for the cheapest ink storm at 160 points. If you want more frequent ink storms, easy aiming, and better range, go with the Junior. If lightning fast one hit kills matter more than those with this kit for some reason, pick the Carbon Roller. Honestly, I don't think you will be. As cool as it sounds getting the fastest kills, again, there are plenty of better weapons that splat almost as fast and have better range, better subs, and better specials. Unfortunately, due to longer range being everywhere, its teeny reach needs some very strong upsides to be worth it, and it just doesn't have them. For stages, I recommend flat maps with lots of corners. It's almost required to make oneself hard to reach or hide in places not often checked by the bad guys, such as little nooks that don't need to be shot to move forward or behind corners. Definitely pay attention to the current map rotation to see if it favors it. The effective main power-up on the Carbon Roller is Damage Up! I'd like to recommend this because the main weapon can definitely do 99 base damage with an indirect hit, and when enemies have just been grazed by chip damage, it loosens the definition of a direct hit. We go from slapping someone with a wet noodle to being halfway decent-ish, the Carbon Roller Deco! Right away, its sub-weapon is Burst Bomb! It needed better tools for fighting and moving around, and it absolutely got one here. Right away, I want to state that the lightning fast regular attack is faster than hitting the foe with a burst bomb and swinging it once, but doing this will soften up the target soundly and slap down their movement options, making it far easier to deal with the main attack's puny hitbox. It won't always land a kill due to both indirect attacks being very low damage, but a direct burst bomb paired with a vertical fling that hits at all will more often than not land a kill. Aim high, not at the dirt. As with any weapon, Burst Bombs grant far more movement options to their user, and with it having such high movement stats, it can definitely get in and out of trouble quickly. Its special weapon is a new one, the Auto Bomb Launcher! In its 6 seconds of base time, it can launch a maximum of 11 Auto Bombs. Auto Bombs are a lot more tactical than other bomb types due to chasing down the targets before they go boom. Generally, due to how the bombs behave and due to the high range that bomb launchers can get, it's best to use the special to hold an objective when ducking out, and when you're not able to contribute in other ways. Slay with the normal moveset when possible, then use this to help when that isn't happening so that it's always contributing in some meaningful way. The Bomb Rush can also strong arm a slip into enemy lines too. There's so much chaos going on that it's easy to swim near foes without them noticing while these bombs are running around. Auto Bomb Splash Damage is 30, and while that can make it easier to land a horizontal roller attack, it doesn't exactly bridge any common gap of damage to allow for easy combo potential. Best to treat it as cover or to scramble the enemies. Carbon Roller Deco is a weapon defined by its rarity. Not only does it possess the rare Burst Bomb sub, but it also is one of only two weapons with Auto Bomb Launcher. This doesn't make it inherently good, but it does give it a definite edge over the vanilla kit, since these are valid things to consider when picking a weapon. This one's all about the speed due to the lightweight, fast time to splat, high mobility options but is certainly get by poor range. Today, we're looking at one of my personal favorites, a long range weapon for the rest of us, the Heavy Splatling. This is a much more approachable chargeable weapon class that has constant range regardless of its charge time. The charge instead determines the number of bullets in its continuous fire, but does low damage and has to keep landing hits. In this case, she shoots 30 damage and 4 bullets to splat at the rate of 15 shots per second. It takes one and a quarter seconds to reach a full charge on the ground. In return, continuous fires for 2.4 seconds at a full charge. Now, you don't have to be dude himself to land more than four bullets in a 40-shot burst, even with how much of a spread shot it is, meaning that less than full charges have their place here and are not often unnecessary, a very big difference from chargers. 
The rate of damage is very high when it gets going, so longer charges are mainly for destroying shields, then continuing to attack after it's gone. Thanks to their sustained high damage, Splatlings are inherently good counters to Brellas. A max burst eats close to one fourth of a tank, but individual bullets are tiny and don't consume that much ink if the job is completed in shorter charges. Charges may be canceled by squidding to make this a reality. After the energy is released, there is an ink recovery cooldown to prevent near constant firepower. Strafing during a charge or release is allowed and this weapon class spends more time out of the ink than any other as a result. The heavy splatling really should be called the middle splatling, because it's a middleweight weapon, has decent movement stats allowing for better strafing than the name would have you think. Moving targets are harder to hit, so make sure you use that to your advantage. Good splatling slang is this. Charge behind a wall, peek out on the right, shoot just enough bullets to deal with the threat, squid button back to safety once the mission is accomplished. That's not all it does though. Small as they bullets may be, they're huge in number and can cover the ground effectively. Due to such long range and continuous fire, it can make it far easier to snipe by painting over a foe's escape route than sweeping fire into them. Splatlings can also handle fighting at closer range better than most other long range weapons due to being able to charge for a fraction of a second, then push out just enough bullets for a splat. This takes practice, but comes with time and is an essential survival skill around your in your face enemies. Due to the fact that this weapon needs to stay out of the ink so much, it's somewhat predictable due to needing to expose itself for long durations to do anything. As always, don't play their game. If a rush cannot be shut down, space out to keep the advantage. It's less locked down than it would seem and can do all sorts of different things from painting to slang. As for anything mode specific, it's good at babysitting a splat zone or a key area in a turf war due to how far and wide the bullets can cover. The effective main power up on a heavy splatling is more shots fired per burst but does not cause any additional bullet to use any ink, resulting in better ink efficiency. Not a good effect, but interesting? Its sub-weapon is... Long range and a sprinkler? Sounds like bait opportunity. That's what we got for the sub-weapon. Thanks to the high vantage points, it's already in spots to toss sprinklers out of reach. Doesn't offer much combat potential, so the splatling itself is the extent of the default moveset. Not much else to say, other than meaning more frequent stingrays. What a wonderful, wonderful combination here. The splatling gun is already hiding behind walls and poking out to shoot, placing the stingray in safety from normal use. If it doesn't manage to get the kill, chip damage is still great when the main has so much reach and it can use partial charges to get near instant damage to finish them off when the special concludes. Just keep in mind that the stingray is about as restrictive as it gets versus the main gun being able to do almost whatever it wants. Between the good turfing and the sprinkler, it's going to earn this all the time. It doesn't even have a particularly high special requirement, landing the middle of the road at 200 points. There isn't a whole lot else to talk about when it comes to the heavy splatling as a whole. The sub weapon doesn't really help it in fights and just help it get a special weapon that's very disconnected from the rest of the kit. There isn't a particularly smooth teamwork between the parts, it's just a good main weapon that sometimes transforms into a good but very separate special weapon. For the equipment, I want to give special attention to Run Speed Up. It is the most important ability on the heavy splatling as it relies on out of ink movement and managing its time. Of course it's good. Let's stick some stud stickers on it and become the fabulous heavy splatling deco. Its sub is the splash wall. Amazing sub weapon for it. Only needs a fraction of a second to charge up, but the preliminary use of the wall gives it insurance against the unexpected. Smart placement of the splash wall makes this a downright annoying weapon to bring down and lets it play the spacing game even better. That's not counting the fact that the splash wall is a manipulation tool, allowing it for easy flank attacks. Splash walls use 60% ink, meaning roughly two full charges can follow it. Full charges are rarely needed, so it might as well lay down splash walls whenever possible. Only downside is the long ink recovery lag caused by both the splatling and the wall. Get used to managing that carefully. It's nice to throw down a splash wall before using the special weapon to get free protection due to the easy reload. It's made even better when this wall is paired with the bubble blower! Finally I can talk about this thing! You never know when you'll need to blow bubbles in a war. It has eight seconds to create a maximum of three bubbles that fill in with their side's ink color and lose mass from enemy ink. They move slowly in the direction blown from bouncing along the ground as they go. Bubbles do 30 damage per second on contact and absorb all attacks that touch them. Any bomb that makes contact detonates instantly. Enemy attacks can make it disappear, but enough allied ink will cause them to explode. 
To be exact, bubbles have 400 HP, but yet again, HP is an abstract concept that can't make up their mind with. Enemies hit for half damage, but their damage grows as the bubbles start shrinking. Your allies do 20% more damage than the kid that created them, encouraging teamwork. Attacks can come from so many places when main subs and specials can all affect it, so it's kind of a mess to be analytical with. Just know that when it fills up with its own color, it goes boom. When it goes boom, the explosion has 50% splash damage and 250 on direct hit! Explosions spread ink, which can cause a chain reaction with other bubbles. If neither side destroyed a bubble for 12 seconds, it fizzles out on its own. It seems weird, and I certainly didn't expect it to be good the first time I saw it, but it's got a lot going for it and has a lot of great uses. For one, it's instant cover due to absorbing whatever attack comes its way. It gives it a way to force through a narrow choke point or just block enemies from taking a certain pathway. You can bet the long range backline weapons will shoot at them to sustain the blockage. The cover can be used for the opposite, preventing a sniper's clear shot at a ranked objective. In splat zones, throwing all three bubbles into the zone and setting up a chain reaction might as well be free points and can turn a close game in the last seconds. In turf wars, bubble blowers should be used as cover or pushing forward. If using them at the end of the time limit, they need to be blown up a little before time is called to get the free points, as bubbles exploding after time spread no ink. The effect of special power-up on the bubble blower is larger bubbles and larger explosions. This is the single best special weapon for special power-up, practically allowing bursts the size of the moon. Heavy Splatling can sustain a high amount of damage over a few seconds at a time, meaning that it's easy to destroy the bubbles. The bubbles give cover, but so does the splash wall, and it might as well be used before the reload if the user prefers to stay put and shoot the bubbles over a great distance. By staying behind and blowing bubbles, it can keep control over the center and color in the splat zone in a hard to counter way. I'm just gonna come out and say it, play this weapon if you play splat zones. It has a little bit of everything. Long range, good movement, a sub weapon to fall back on, and a special that awards free points. For abilities, special attention to Object Shredder. The main weapon is already good at destroying objects. This makes the bubble blower even better and makes it much easier to destroy one's own bullets. With Object Shredder and Bomb Defense together, this weapon is a strong counter to other bubble blowers thanks to its sustained high damage output. And now for a third kit, the Heavy Splatling Remix. Its sub weapon is the Point Sensor. First time seeing one of these. For only 45% ink, this creates a sphere that holds for 2.5 seconds and tracks any enemy who squirms inside until 8 seconds of base time after the point sensor landed. For instance, if an enemy squid comes into the field 2 seconds after deployment, they are only tracked for 6 additional seconds. Time is added if a player is continuously marked with more point sensors before it wears off, but no remaining time can ever be longer than the maximum of 8 seconds. Point sensor spawns no ink. I remember thinking this sounded factually worse than a bomb, and the ink cost wasn't that much lower to offset it, but there are more advantages than just ink usage. The field of effect deploys instantly and goes through walls and floors, making it near impossible to predict when it's going to come out, and makes it a very easy way to know if an enemy is hiding without having to go into their field of view. All other players can see tracked enemies by a point sensor leading to team plays, and this will even show as an assist to make it tangible just how often it's been helping. Point sensors are majorly affected by multiple abilities. Bomb Defense Up DX reduces tracking time. Just one sub will cut it down by 10%, and almost everyone runs this, so expect that. Due to the super cheap ink cost, Ink Saver Sub barely affects point sensors and should not be run with it. Since we're on the subject of abilities, let's go over sub power up a little early. This raises range and slightly increases tracking duration. The returns on this are surprisingly strong, giving a 10% increase with just one sub slot. Not something I'd recommend highly, but I wouldn't disagree with liking a little bit of it. Especially when the heavy splatling gets use out of long range throws too. Point sensor might not seem all too exciting, but consider that no heavy splatling has a bomb, and it's a constant for them to have more tactical sub weapons. This gives it something it can do with a reload when there's no clear shots it can take. It can stop a problem before it starts. You don't need me to go into how it makes a shot easier to land. Aside from that, it's good as a desperation play. Throw it when trying to swim away, and it might just mean their demise even if they bring you down. Really, it's tracking on a sniping weapon, and throwing range enables it to get some good throws from up high. What more do you want? Fine. I guess a special weapon is pretty reasonable. So we got something big here, the Booyah Bomb! 
Since the heavy spends its time either far across from the field or high up on lookouts, it's got the line of sight to throw a Booyah Bomb anywhere it wants just from playing normally. It could be thrown directly at a target in an awkward moment, or it could just become the awkward moment. Due to the length of this special, it can be thrown to cut off a foe from a safe zone, forcing them to either take the bomb or fight you at a huge disadvantage due to how long it takes. With the long range of the main weapon, it can pull this off with ease. For a more defensive approach, if things just won't work out, it can be tossed at the user's feet to get a little space. This is a turfing-oriented set that holds control over a given area just as much as it snipes. The main and special work well together, and the point sensor makes foes think twice before moving into the view of a splatling. Heavy is already good at covering splat zones from a safe distance, and this makes it able to rack up free points and halt the zone whenever it's looking grim. It's most immediately good at that mode, but it makes it more capable as backline support by just tossing it at any telegraphed object in the other modes. For the equipment, a lot of the abilities that helped out the other two sets aren't particularly helpful here. Run speed up, swim speed up, and new to this recommendation is special charge up for more frequent specials. Very, very basic. You want a weird weapon? Ask and you shall receive the Kenza Splat Roller! It's for the unique. Its sub-weapon is the Splat Bomb. Generally, this is for manipulation and pre-firing. Pre-flingling? Uh, throw it to get the enemies to move the way you want and be ready with a roller fling. The minimum damage is 30, and when thrown in most situations, that moves other squids where you want them to go. It shouldn't be hard to aim well enough for 70 damage on a roller if it gets any damage at all. This is actually a rare instance where the roll can be advised in a fight, since it might be easier to just roll up behind them in a hallway as they try to swim away from the bomb. No aiming necessary. Next, we move on to Bubble Blower. The reason why I saved this until now, I wanted to talk about a more traditional bubble blowing weapon before we got to this. When using the special as an attack, throwing a bomb is a very safe way to sustain or instantly detonate a bubble from a distance, doing the job very quickly. Practice with how full the bubble looks when a bomb detonates it. It can trap enemies who can't swim through it or around it, attack from around corners, or just be a safe little bubble to run around inside of and then pop out to attack. This is very appreciated support to frontline fighters when there's a good view of the action, so why is it on a roller? Yeah, this is probably the last weapon I would have chosen to explain it with, hence why some of the footage showed other weapons using it. With only one other exception, every single other weapon that has Bubble Blower is long range. Most notably is that bubbles naturally attract enemy attention, and sneaky rollers can use this to distract them from a tactical roll hit. Kenza Roller has one of the cheapest and easiest to earn Bubble Blowers, if it's your favorite special. Though if it is, I'm willing to bet you snipe instead. This is a unique roller, thanks to the special and the bombs working wildly different from its other two cousins. If rollers seem fun and powerful, but something just felt off about its playstyles of the other two, maybe give this one an attempt. It couldn't hurt. It provides an experience like no other roller and no other bubble blower. Just because it's different doesn't mean it's bad. The myth, the legend, the NZAP 85! This is the super accurate rapid fire gun! It boasts equal range to the splatter shot, but it has teeny tiny bullets that consume next to no ink and hit for 28 damage. It might seem like it wouldn't be good at painting due to such small shots that come out in a straight line, but thanks to the classification of lightweight, it can actually paint decently due to how fast it strafes, meaning frequent specials. Despite the low damage, it still has an all right time to splat, but it's going to need to be fancier to land enough hits. It takes practice to be able to land such precise shots, and is a pick for those who are willing to take more specific attacks in return for better mobility. Substrafing is good to remember for this one due to how quickly it can move and keep foes guessing as it corrects its fire. Its sub weapon is the Suction Bomb! Good for blocking enemies from going a certain way or manipulating movement when challenging them. Due to how much this weapon moves all around, it can approach quickly to take advantage before the suction bomb goes away. NZAP excels at pre-firing as well. 
Throwing a suction bomb and then sweeping fire, the only way they can swim away to guillotine. Further, suction bombs have a large area of effect and bottom out at 30 damage. If they're nicked by the blast, they now have three hit kill. Certainly not a great benefit, but it'll do. More appreciated than the damage is the fact that the NZAP uses so little ink, so the massive cost of a suction bomb isn't felt as harshly as on other weapons. Suction bomb's high object damage out of a good shooter is another big plus when the mode calls for it. And its special is Ink Armor. This kit looks familiar. It's a more combat-oriented Splattershot Jr. Gives up strong turfing and more frequent armor in return for better range and more accuracy. These two weapons have both been popular picks throughout the history of Splatoon, duking it out for whichever set of skills for an armor weapon is currently preferred. Even if the Junior is better at special spam, the 85 still builds it up well and wants to be playing around having the ink armor. Armor allows it to win duels on its own more easily, neutralizing its slower time to kill than other shooters, but it also buffs the whole team from throwing down armor so often. When picking between the two, NZAP is the best if the team needs armor, but would feel like it's lacking firepower from the Junior. Thanks to armor being consistently helpful and being an okay fighter, pretty much any map that favors the middle range is good for the NZAP regardless of the mode. It can play it all. The effective main power-up on the NZAP is increased ink coverage on the ground and increased accuracy while on the ground. I suppose it couldn't hurt to carry a little bit of this. It's all right. In the name of child protection laws, it's the NZAP 89! Right away, you see that this is more tactical because it has auto bomb. It stands longer than the suction bomb and can be tossed behind a foe to rarely score an easy kill, but more frequently prevent them from swimming away once challenged. More often than not, auto bombs are used to check to see if someone's hiding nearby and get a definitive answer if it's safe to go somewhere. The low ink consumption lets it do this regularly. Even better, as long as one watches their ink tank, there's no shortage of bullets that can be fired after tossing a bomb. At 30 splash damage, it lowers the four hit kill down to three, so it's unchanged compared to the vanilla set in that respect at least. A slower, less aggressive sub to be sure, but has a few advantages over the suction bomb. Not great. And its special is the Tensa missiles. What? Uh, this is usually stuck on weapons with overpowered main sub combos, so what gives? This special is unlikely to score kills on its own, just like the sub weapon. It forces the user to back off to use its special and sees no real benefit other than the tracking system. Due to such high movement stats, it can swim after tagged targets and head them off. Might as well toss an autobomb or two just before firing the special to make things more chaotic for whoever the intended recipient is. It's largely out of your control, but it might score an effortless kill once in a while. Even if the Tenna Missiles are one's personal favorite, this isn't a standout weapon for them. At 180 points and okay turfing, it's pretty average at building it frequently since almost all Tenna Missiles have low charges anyway. Undoubtedly, the 89 is the less popular NZAP since it favors more defensive and tactical play. But what's odd is that the ink armor on the 85 was kind of a support weapon as it was. As sad as it is to say, the main gun is the strongest individual part and the rest doesn't work off of it that well. Even if auto bombs or tenon missiles are enough for you to like a weapon, there are better picks that work off of them better. Especially when the 85 was so good, the 89 ends up feeling less than the sum of its parts. I initially disliked this weapon thinking that it had no good uses and was struggling to come up with maps for it. But what I settled on was tower control. The autobomb and tenon missiles are excellent tower cleaners and it works pretty fine in that mode. It's best suited to that mode with the tenon missiles and autobombs cleaning the tower well. Can the NZAP 83 do better? Not with a sprinkler. <laughs> it's bait, it's more frequent specials, it ain't good at fighting. All of that investment so that it can spam the Ink Store! At 180 points to charge and the good turfing of the main and sub weapons, this is one of the most spammable Ink Storms there is. Really? That's all the good that can be said about this weapon. NZAP unfortunately does 28 damage and with no damage increasing effect, it can't blast anyone who comes remotely near the Ink Storm AoE. The main gun is okay at fighting, the sub can't fight, and the special doesn't fight directly on its own. So just being annoying with repeated AoE is all this one's got. 
It's kind of sad to say, but the NSAP 85 unclasses the other two so soundly and is such a team player. There's practically no competition to consider the 83 unless the Inkstorm just happens to be good on splat zone maps and you're okay with extremely limited options in combat. Be cautious at all costs and only challenge when certain. A whole new way to play, the Splatbrella! Serving as the tank. It fires six shots in the form of a scatter shot round if the trigger is pressed. This has varying degrees of damage, anywhere from 14 to 81 damage? Before you say, I wanna see the heavier version of this weapon, while 81 damage sounds like a lot, there's a delay and the bullets are invisible until they're practically on the target. So it's unlikely to hit any kind of moving target with that much gusto. Point blank is the best way to pull off high damage, but is rarely doable. This is a weapon all about follow up and revenge kills. 81 is a golden number, following up virtually any attack for a kill. From a single inkbrush swing to minimum damage from a burst bomb, it's got you covered. Particularly, a Brella teaming up with a Bamboozler is quite dangerous. Bamboozler has 78 range regardless of its charge and always hits for 30 base damage. This is a weapon that shows playing support isn't an insult. One shot uses up 1 15th of the ink and it's quite nice at strafing. Umbrellas ain't heavy. It has no continuous fire, only shooting each time the trigger is pulled. If I had to liken the gunfire to anything, it would be a shotgun. This high damage attack is best used for a follow-up to strike down a foe damage with pretty much anything. If the trigger is held for one-fifth of a second after an attack, it then opens a canopy that blocks all forms of enemy attacks, but gradually drains ink as it's held. Upon being broken, it's an eternity of 6.5 seconds before it will return. The canopy deals 30 damage on direct contact with an enemy, meaning that a point-blank attack can one-hit KO when combined with the shot. You know by now that object HP is an ethereal concept that cannot be understood by our measly cephalopod brains, so I'll keep its workings just to the important points. It has 500 HP, but all weapons get different damage multipliers against it. Each HP is shown by how much of it has yet to be colored in. Shooters, dualies, and splatlings are particularly weak against it, while single high damage hits are strong. The biggest weaknesses are splashdowns, ballers, both contact and explosions, mind you, sloshers, blasters, chargers, and ironically, other brellas. In fact, brellas have extreme damage multipliers against objects to make them able to tank better against other object users. Holding for two seconds launches the shield, which between the shot, two seconds to hold, and then the deployment, requires 36% of the ink to use this move all on its own. It will then travel for 6.5 seconds or until broken. Contact with a moving shield is still 30 damage. It then gets knocked back and then travels forward again. The shield strangely only takes half as much damage once launched, so I guess you were the thing holding it back in more ways than one. Launching actually isn't that nice. It's not as practical most of the time and doing it means throwing away a perfectly good shield until it regenerates. It's mainly in the moveset to prevent the user from just holding up the shield as long as they have ink. It's mostly only useful for protecting a moving objective for precious extra points. This is a difficult to grasp, lifetime to master kind of weapon. It's like some kind of complicated tactical game of chess and every time it gets into a fight. Time to splat is slow and the shots are difficult to land. Plus, everything's got some sort of delay. The main loses ink from shooting, shielding, and launching, so it's a constant ink leech almost no matter what it does. It has some legitimate strengths almost no matter what it's fighting, such as just saying nope to a bomb explosion or a baller or a splashdown, and guarding itself as well as teammates. It requires careful time and ink management to do its job well, not to mention out prediction. The Breller is only as good as the player is at baiting opponents into wasting attacks against a perfectly timed shield. It's downright scary fighting against a Brella who has the mind games down. As a last strength, the Brella is super strong at super jumping, since it can land with the canopy already open, giving aid not only to itself, but whoever you were jumping to. I wouldn't recommend this weapon as strongly when playing with randoms. It's not terrible, but the way the game compensates for latency puts Brellas at a disadvantage, causing them to sometimes just go boom from behind the shield all because the other team had bad internet. It turns performance into luck of the draw, and that's something that just has to be accepted about it. In land play or when coordinating with teammates with good internet, the Brella reaches its full potential and becomes the timing game it was meant to be. 
Its sub-weapon is Sprinkler! It could serve as bait, but the main weapon is such a slow killer that it likely isn't going to keep the element a surprise. It's also rough to fight after tossing it since the Sprinkler uses 60% ink, and both shielding and individual shots use a lot. Really, the strongest draw of the Sprinkler is more frequent specials. Use it only when ink is obviously going to go without purpose for a while. And that special weapon that you're gonna be spamming is Ink Storm! This holds a set area of the map while the Brella is annoying to get past. When putting the two together, it allows the Brella to just be a nuisance that can block from multiple sides. This plays support or takes over an objective in a few seconds. The 24 damage per second might not seem great at first, but when tossed so that enemies can't escape right away, it can really add up to help the Brella land one-shot kills, and that's welcome for such a slow-firing weapon. The Splat Brella gets it rough from the Special Charge Department, taking 200 points to build it up combined with the poor turfing out of the main weapon. That Sprinkler is the way it'll get this, and that again requires careful ink management. Main power-up's effect for Splat Brellas is sped up shield regeneration. The returns are good, but it's generally best to just play around the Brella's HP rather than regeneration time, since you probably wouldn't choose to throw away the shield by launching anyway. Due to the special, I most heavily recommend Splat Zones for this one. But, thanks to the good object damage, this certainly can do well in Rainmaker as well. The alternate kit is the Sorella Brella! Its sub is Autobomb, a much more capable sub that costs less ink than the Sprinkler. Unlikely to land a splat on its own, this has plenty of uses for the Brella. Answers questions before moving forward to make it hard for the tank to be surprised. Splash damage is 30, landing 70 damage is certainly more reasonable of a goal than expecting to land the impossible 81 and bridge that gap though it'll still often be two hits and a bomb to splat. Since this has any benefit to the main weapon at all, you're probably expecting the special to be not that great. You're wrong! We have a new special weapon, Splat Bomb Launcher! Allowing for 11 bombs maximum, this is exactly the same special as a suction bomb launcher, just with splat bombs. Getting it out of the way quick, special power-up is the same effect and returns compared to the suction bomb launcher, so it's the same in that way as well. Longer duration, three subs to get an additional bomb. Each bomb is worse object damage in painting compared to its older brother, but the quicker detonation time makes it more likely to catch someone off guard. Splash damage is also 30, so the same damage facts about the auto bomb umbrella apply here. Nothing else is gained by adding a splat bomb to the moveset aside from just having a harder bomb to react to some of the time. Remember that launchers don't lock out the main weapon, and you're still capable of pulling out the shield whenever the enemy is going to get the better of you in the middle of the special. When playing for a special above all else, this is a rare special, only showing up on four weapons. Sorella Brella is tied for the lowest charge, and it has an okay time building it up. Personally, I think the Suction Bomb Launcher is just better in almost every way because it holds an area longer, coats the ground better, and the object damage is unmatched by any other attack in the game. But that's not to say that the Splat Bomb Launcher is bad. It's still pretty good at all of those things, and it can be viewed as a necessary nerf for the few weapons that got it. This is a more fighting-oriented set, while still being able to play the special and splat zones. Technically, the special has the potential to bring back map control on any of these stages, but I've recommended it most highly on splat zone maps with a single zone and decent vantage points around the center. Since it'll come up, I don't recommend Ink Saver sub for double auto bombs on this set, because it's just not that helpful due to the extreme cost of the main weapon. A precise long-range shooter for more advanced players, or pros if you will, the Splattershot Pro! Its identity comes from its bullets moving quickly across a great distance and landing very accurately, a combination not generally sported by shooter weapons. Each bullet is 42 damage, virtually always winning in three shots and likely to pick off a damaged enemy in two hits. While those bullets are special, they're also teeny and not able to coat the ground quite as well as other guns. The rate of fire is half of that of a regular splatter shot, but it's not so slow that you feel like every shot is an event. It's still very much continuous. While the pro goes up from a splatter shot in some ways and down in others, it's a middleweight weapon and has the same mobility. Its playstyle is based around using that high reach so that the shorter range foes can't get close. Against longer range, it can use its mobility to avoid direct fights if they're slow pokes. This is a weapon with a high skill ceiling due to the strict leeway on aiming from a distance. Always have space to swim backwards, keeping at the edge of your effective range at all times. This is how you'll win encounters and is the best skill to have with the pro. 
Wait for them to show themselves unless you have a very favorable matchup. Being at close range leaves it vulnerable. When it comes to weaknesses, not being able to use its reach against even longer reaching weapons is definitely a big one. Shooters have to watch out for duelies, and the weapon that I always hate fighting with the Splattershot Pro is the Dually Squelchers. This pair of power drills has identical range, only slightly lower damage output, and even similar kit options, but with a dodge roll thrown in as a bonus that you don't get to use. The Dually Squelchers will naturally be less rigid with near identical capabilities to the Pro otherwise. Watch out for weapons with 70 range or above from the start of the match. The Pro also eats through ink a bit faster than other shooters, not one of the worst defenders, but still pretty fast and reload breaks are important. Pros also have considerably slower strafing speed than other middleweights. Swim, don't run. Recovering ink mid-fight is also a help. It's called the Pro for a reason. I've said it's a high skill weapon. If you like sloshers or other weapons that don't require being precise, you won't like this. It takes practice to gel with. Its sub-weapon is Point Sensor. With the gun costing so much ink, this cheap sub-weapon answers questions on the cheap. It exposes stealthy players who are normally at a disadvantage against the pro, shutting down their attack when they're behind a wall or corner. This is best to lay down so you know whether to pursue or back up when attacking at long range. Remember that the timer is extended if you keep tagging an enemy with the point sensor, suppressing a foe for an extended period of time. Don't be selfish. This can aid teammates to just throw every once in a while to point stuff out to them. It's the unspoken callout. If the ink isn't going toward anything else and you don't have a path to shoot, then why not? Special weapon is Ink Storm! This rounds out to a tactical weapon, spacing out with the main gun and simple deterrence from the sub and special. Thanks to the continuous damage of the special and the main's high 42 damage, it's occasionally possible to two-shot someone who spent just a moment in the Ink Storm. I want to skip ahead to an ability here to showcase damage up from main power-up. From three main slots and four sub slots, pros can hit for 49.9 damage. This is a lot of stacking and doesn't allow for much else, but even without stacking it all the way, it'll do well with this two-shotting after minor damage from the Ink Storm or for anything else that a teammate has done. The pros Ink Storm costs 170 points, making it one of the most economical, and while the bullets aren't the best painters, it comes out to being pretty decent at building it at that many points. The pro enjoys the high ground, getting points for a special by painting mid, enabling it to fill in the specials and paint the zone even better. With that vantage point, it should be able to place the Ink Storm well as well. The Ink Storm can be placed to corral an enemy with less range, so they have to either go through the storm or fight you. It's an indirect special when the weapon played isn't a sniper. Now this sub-special combo gives the standard pro a clearly defined weakness. No way to fight back against snipers. It can do little against them or even against squelchers in direct confrontations aside from mild deterrence. It should avoid direct approaches with those weapons at all costs. The standard pro offers support to the whole team with low ink consumption from the sub. The other kits offer bombs and specials that attack directly, so in some games this one might be viewed as outclassed. Splat zones and turf wars are where it shines best. If nothing else, this is a kit that teaches proper aiming with the point sensor and forces you to get good with the main weapon to train for the big games. Right out of the fire, the Forge Splattershot Pro! Its sub-weapon is Suction Bomb! There it is, been foreshadowed, here we go. Holds an area for a short time, either keeps them away or forces them to fight you, but the longer detonation time might make pincer attacks harder to pull off. This is played pretty much the way it would be on any other weapon. Generally, you'll be tossing the bomb for one of these two purposes, swimming in and then shooting. Its special weapon is Bubble Blower! Now, here is the big diff. Bubble Blower plays off the main and sub exceptionally well. With the long range and decent damage, it can create openings for yourself and for the whole team. With good mobility, it can swim into the bubble quickly and use them as a shield. But the best part is how it works off the suction bombs. You can throw a suction bomb just before activating for instant detonation when a bubble touches it. Few weapons have a bomb with a bubble blower, but this is the only one to have suction bomb with it, giving it higher damage and AoE. Not only that, but as long as it has the ink, it can throw suction bombs between bubbles, and they're 180 damage on contact with instantaneous detonation. This is the best object damage in the game from a sub weapon, and this makes the special super consistent. By throwing a bomb, activating, creating a bubble, then tossing another bomb, it's nearly impossible for the bubbles to fizzle out. Strong weapon, fun combination. And then we move on to the bit. 
You just had to leave my favorite weapon out of the game, didn't you? Ken's a Splatter Shop Pro. There once was a time when this was the golden standout of Splatoon weapons, but even though that time is gone, it's still certainly workable. Its sub is Splat Bomb. When using the pro's reach well, short range weapons will naturally back up. Lob it so their backing up finishes them off, or roll it to get space and play for a trade when things aren't looking good. I feel this adds versatility due to being able to toss it in more situations than a suction bomb, or just to try a super jump and see where it gets you. You can throw a bomb in the split second before you die if it doesn't work out so well. Thanks to this, it's a lot easier to keep snipers away than the other two. Its special is Booyah Bomb! Play around this. It gets rid of snipers, makes the other team scatter. Preserving life to use this to create openings is so worth it. Play defensively if you're about to earn it. It crowds narrow spaces, prevents space outs. It's also a saving throw, usually allowing panicking with it more often than other specials. When fighting up close as an Achilles heel, it might save you. With smarter spacing, it's more of an opener for a push. I even say reckless missions are pretty viable with this weapon if Ink Armor is on the same team. Between Ink Armor, Splat Bomb, and Booyah Bomb Shield, and the free reload when the special is over, plus potentially using the Booyah Bomb to cover a getaway, it can fall back on a lot of fail safes and be damn hard to bring down. It's surprisingly big on defense compared to how it looks at first glance. As for downsides, the Kenza Pro has the highest special charge of any Booyah Bomb at 210 points, so it's quite a road to build it up, and it will have trouble getting this early game without making itself obvious. There are only five Booyah Bomb weapons, so I don't consider this as much of a downside as I would for other specials. It's just something to be aware of when considering. The big ol' two-inch brush back once again. Honor thy favorite ASM artist by painting them a happy little picture of their own demise. Octobrush is the middleweight uncle of the ink brush, classified by longer range, more damage, and higher ink consumption. Its range is also longer than it seems and is worth testing its limits. A swing maxes out at 40 damage for a pretty certain three hit splat. 20 is the minimum damage at eye level and 10 is the minimum when the ink falls down below. The roll is 25 damage. Downside is a lower roll speed, slower swings, and lower mobility stats. While the speed is lower, it's still only second to the ink brush in speed, beating rollers and enabling getaways and speedy approaches when the situation is safe. Jumping repeatedly raises the range slightly. Your fingers are dying for a worthy cause. This is also a showy and noisy weapon due to its large attack, so be aware of that whenever trying to sneak up on enemies. Others will likely see it happening. Main power of an Octobrush is faster roll speed and a fatter trail of ink. Can be helpful, I suppose, but not worth stacking a lot of. The effect is beyond slight. Its sub weapon is Auto Ball! So it's a little weird having a sub that chases someone when the weapon is pretty small range. But that's only one way of thinking about it. My goal isn't to kill you, it's to get a foolproof answer to see if somebody's hiding there. With well-placed throws, it becomes much harder to be snuck up on and caught at unfavorable situations. It assures that you aren't in an awkward spot as long as you're checking for them. A stealth player could not ask for a better friend. You won't even need half a tank to splat a foe, so just keep your ink up, toss it to answer questions, and either attack or reload depending on how it looks. Unfortunately, an autobomb isn't going to work as a spacing tool due to how slow acting it is, so it isn't as versatile as weapons with the splat or suction bombs. It checks and is more locked into that purpose. Its special is Inkjet! This weapon hangs out close to the action, out of sight before making its plays, so it'll likely be near some place to hide the jump marker. This is its most lethal way of attacking, but this means being good with the Inkjet is practically a requirement to succeed with this weapon kit. Main and sub aren't too lethal most of the time. Between the short range, slow bomb, and this special, we've got a high skill requirement to play this weapon. It's not horrible, just difficult to reach its potential. 170 points is the charge for this one, making it one of the easiest ink jets to charge up in Inkopolis. I also want to give special attention to Ninja Squid, as different players move around more than others. You might like just being harder to notice and stack lots of swim speed up. Could be a good combination. Ho oh, ho, the Octobrush Nouveau plays in the support role. I'm so sorry. Its sub weapon is Squid B. 
speaking, this isn't that good. Probably one of the worst main sub combinations in the game. It wants to play it safe due to no ranged main or sub weapons, so it'll at least be in spots to lay down beacons and have it easy with placing them down because it doesn't have many other ways to contribute at any given moment. Even worse, the Octobrush's attacks eat up lots of ink, and so do Squid Beacons. It would be harder than most other beacon weapons to use the beacon as bait or as a shield while still getting enough swings in. Its special weapon is Tenta Missiles! Just... ah! Man, I'm being snooty non-stop on this one, I wonder why. The main weapon has a hard time getting in once it's revealed itself, and the beacon does nothing to create openings, so the missiles are the only tool it gets for ranged pressure. Add the short range of the main weapon into the equation, and using the tracking of the special to pick off your foes is rare. Due to the harsh limitations on what it can do at any given time, I would not recommend turfing for the sake of it and making yourself obvious. But that's kinda hard to do because the Tana missiles are its only pressure from any distance, and it has to build that up. Speaking of that, charges 170 points, making it at least tied for the easiest Tana missile to rack up in the game. Yay? There's little synergy here, and the pieces feel at odds with one another. This is a team comp dependent weapon, only helpful if the seven special combination is needed to fill a void. Barring that, this weapon is poor in battles with random opponents and can hold back a team pretty badly, depending on what the rest of the team has. Think about it. Squid beacons don't matter if a random teammate has them as well, and Tana Missiles without voice chat is far short of its potential. You're of no help in gaining map control. Out of every weapon in Splatoon 2, this one probably has it the worst with spawn camping, and it has no way to get out by itself. I genuinely think this weapon is a joke and is outclassed in every sense. If you ask me, a Burst Bomb Octobrush would have worked better if they wanted a support brush. I want to focus on special charge up for this weapon. It sounds silly for Tenta Missiles, but that's the only time that it ever gets a say in anything. Build it up at all costs. And last, it's the Kenza Octobrush. Its sub weapon is Suction Bomb. Octobrush don't outrange a lot of weapons, but when it does, this can cut off escapes for opponents. More importantly, it allows for a nice few second shutdown of long reaching weapons so the user can either get by or make them back up. The splash damage can enable a nice two hit kill from the brush, but it isn't too likely of a setup from a pretty slow killing weapon. With this thing being stealthy, it's helpful to place a suction bomb around corners or in spots not easily seen to pick off enemies that try to approach you. Due to the Octobrush being so showy and the long detonation time of the bomb, it can bait someone into taking an out of sight bomb. Its special weapon is a first! Yeah, even this far in. Ultra Stamp! Drop the hammer! This was the very final special weapon added into Splatoon 2 and is only held by five weapons. Due to this, barely any weapon classes or sub weapons are paired with it at all. This is a lockout of the main and sub weapons to become strictly a melee attacker for nine seconds. The giant hammer moves forward as it swings, like a train painting the ground in its path. Hold ZR rather than tap it to always get the fastest possible repeated swings. While the hammer is down, the user is impervious to attacks from the front, and when swinging repeatedly, this is a near-perfect shield that bullets will only rarely penetrate. Nope, not a good panic button. Swinging does 100 damage on direct hit and 40 on splash. The attack squishes and diffuses bombs with even the splash area. It's also good at object shredding and can pop a Rainmaker shield quickly, but is likely to damage itself due to how close it has to stand to keep outputting that damage. Swimming to reposition is allowed during the special and with such a long duration, it might be worth doing once the initial intended use is over. While in the air, a 360 swoosh that attacks above and below the user is possible. Few things in Splatoon can attack above or below, so it's situationally useful if a sniper doesn't see you right below them, or if you're in a map with grates. Alternatively, you are allowed to prematurely throw the special away by pressing R and tossing it. This has long range, does 120 on direct hit, and 30 to 60 on splash. This is a special with powerful attacks along with surprisingly good defense. But here come the downsides of picking it. Number one, the back is completely exposed and it's bad at turning around. In fact, it's bad at turning, period. The arc on turning is wide, and if you stop swinging, you're left wide open with no other attacking option. If it misses, they can just turn around and shoot you. Might be time to throw it before they get their bearings straight. That's sort of another downside. 
it's predictable because it either has to keep swinging or throw away the rest of its special usage. Use it to push forward in tight spaces or when the enemy team can't swim to the side easily. Moving quickly down an inkable ground is another good choice. The last is just how huge this beast is. No one's going to be surprised by it once it's pulled out. You become the center of attention and everyone's just waiting for you to mess up so they can shoot you. It can't just rush in at any time and expect to make it out alive. There's no shame in activating it just for the throw. The attack area is quite large. It comes out pretty quick and it can multi-kill when enemies are close together, but be aware of it. The effective special power-up on Ultra Stamp is slightly increased special duration. Nah. As a set of three, the Kenza avoids the pitfalls of the first two kits and is the only one focused on slaying rather than on support. Sure, the Ultra Stamp is a big predictable attention grabber, but it's less vulnerable than the Inkjet at least. Between the suction bomb and throwing the stamp, it's got some pretty good options at shutting down long-range weapons. Because the Octobrush needs to play it safe to slay, it's likely to be in position to use that Ultra Stamp from the get-go. Here's the part where I tell you about Special Charge, but four out of five weapons to have the Ultra Stamp have 180 points, and the Octobrush is one of them. There isn't really competition in the way of Special Charge. Consider this weapon if you want that rare special. I'm gonna play it. I came here, had a lot of fun, and I'm ready to have some more fun once the game comes out. It's been two years since that fateful day when the inkling squid species hooked me with its amazing abilities. The shortest ranged fighting focused weapon. You know it's gonna be a wacky one when that's the note we're opening on, the Splooshomatic. It's characterized by good speed, fast firing, widespread fire, and huge bullets that hit for a big 38 damage. Together, this leads to some of the fastest kill times in the game as long as it gives a hug before shooting. And pretty nice painting for a short range weapon at that. An unexpected property of this is high damage against Brellas, able to shred through them with relative ease. The biggest downside of this weapon is the range. It's the shortest range of any automatic shooter in the entire game and it only just barely beats the range of an Octobrush and a standard blaster. That's right, it loses to the Splattershot Jr. and the Arrow Spray. And by a pretty decent amount, too. Due to how tiny it is and how anyone who sees it coming will just swim away, this means damage fall off is pretty likely to occur. But this makes me want to give special attention to main power up a little bit early. Paired with the Splooshomatic, it gives damage up. With the damage fall off, if it can do 40 something damage, this usually can pick off an opponent if they've taken any damage already. If they've been hit twice by pretty much anything, they're over 50 damage already as well. The important thing when playing Sploosh is initiative. Never play fair for an instant. Always be unpredictable and sneak up. Thankfully, this isn't the largest or showiest weapon in Inkopolis aiding in that mission. It can covertly kill and then swim out. It also covers the space around the user's feet well, allowing for quick outs as long as it isn't rushing headlong into enemy ink. If it can crawl up the enemy's back, they won't know it hit him. It's downright scary how fast this harmless looking weapon takes someone down. And you know what? It has a mobility focused sub weapon too! The Curling Bomb! This is a simple main sub combination. It's a quick, quiet way to approach a target, get the jump on them, or to get away if you had to go too far into enemy ink in the first place. Thanks to reloading while swimming and barely any shots needed to score a win, it'll be able to do plenty after deploying a bomb. But remember, I said that this was simple. That's all it's good for. This sub does 20 damage on contact and 30 from splash. Unless it chops off their toe, then explodes near them, it doesn't reduce the number of shots necessary to bring them down at all, and it has almost no combo potential. Use this as a movement option for good object damage because that's all it is. Remember the Trail of Ink can cut off an escape route, allowing for an easy shot. For the special, we have Splashdown! Hey, it's just like the Splat Roller! If it has to get in close to do anything, the Curling Bomb allows it to set up, and this can be used to mix it up if a shot might not work, or if the enemy is cornered and you'd rather do this than exchange fire. Of course, being stealthy and dropping onto their heads is nice too. Remember that you can get control over the main weapon back very quickly after attacking. The minimum damage is 55. If they get ink on their feet and you're running main power up, that's a pretty decent combo. At 160 points and fast shooting, it's one of the easiest splashdowns ink can buy. 
it's very likely to have this and it can mean frequent easy points and splat zones. Through it all, this is a movement based weapon that likes bringing down enemies quickly and quietly. I feel like a lot of people assume that it's all turfing and bad at fighting when they first look at it, but it's quite deadly when played right. The curling bomb can paint a line of ink that makes it harder for them to swim away from a splashdown, and all three parts do powerful damage to objects, giving this set its identity from the other two. On the other hand, this set has absolutely nothing it can do against long range and should always be wary of what they're up to. Strong positives paired with strong negatives. Works best on flat stages. The power of Neo! Bump, bump, bump! The Neo Splushomatic is equipped with Squid Beacon! A short range weapon paired with Squid Beacons when it really works better with a throwing attack or a movement option? This sounds awfully familiar. Well, due to having to play carefully, it's probably already sitting around in good spots to use these and could put the ink to good use. It also gets a pretty decent number of shots after placing a beacon, so this allows it to use it as a shield or as bait and still attack. That's good since it's pretty much all it has to catch opponents by surprise. Speaking of catching by surprise, this is a quiet, fast-killing weapon that likes to get around the map and surprise. The Squid Beacon allows it to jump away once the job is complete and get back into spots it wants to be in. With frequent super jumping, they'll have a hard time locating you. Its special weapon is... Tenta Missiles! What? You know, the very thing we complained about in the last episode? This is just the Octobrush Nouveau again. It's limited, predictable, has no say in anything without the special. It can get in its own team's way in solo queue due to Squid Beacons being useless if a teammate already has them. Ten missiles don't provide useful tracking with no voice chat due to such short range on the user. Pretty much the only difference here is that the weapon isn't as big and noisy, so that may be able to paint without sticking out so blatantly and be sneakier. This is even shorter range than the Octobrush, but I'd say for actual practicality, this is just a better Octobrush Nouveau. Not exactly saying much. And last up is the Splooshomatic 7! Really? I thought it was the Splooshomatic 3! Splat Bomb! With such short range, it's hard to pre fire into this. This is more used to space out and to pressure the long range weapons who are going to see you. This also gives it a good chance to take someone down with it and test the waters before moving on. Not a bad sub weapon, far from it. It's a matter of trading mobility for more powerful and long range attacking which the other two sets don't have. Speaking of things that other weapons don't have, the Ultra Stamp! Hey, only five weapons have this, four of them have 180 points as the charge. This is one of them, and it's the best turfer out of all of them. I can't say I know anyone who bases their playstyle around Ultra Stamp spamming, but this one's here for you if you are that guy. Could always toss the bomb to force someone to the range of the hammer that you have ready to activate. But I feel like the incredibly short reach of the main weapon makes it risky to chase enemies down with. It's vulnerable unless it ends the special in a good spot or super jumps away once it's over. This is a weapon that would play the Ultra Stamp to throw outside of its normal range rather than just use it to push on. I feel like another Ultra Stamp weapon might be preferred due to how weak the sploosh is once it's gotten everyone's attention, and that's a pretty flashy and vulnerable special no one's going to miss sight of. Wholly unique weapon class all its own, Blob Lobber! It looks like a slosher, but shoots bubbles that bounce along the ground and ricochet off walls. Nothing else in Splatoon can do a bank shot. No other main, sub, or special behaves this way, and to aid in this mission, it's one of the longest range weapons almost to the likes of the Hydra Splatling. Each slosh creates one big bubble followed by three smaller ones. The first one is likely to slow the enemy down, causing subsequent bubbles to land. All bubbles always hit for 30 damage. There is no damage fall off. Because of this, attacking from high vantage points is great unlike other sloshers where it reduces it. When aiming high, it can lob its shots over an object and attack on the other side. The bubbles can either be made to come out in a straight line to kill in one dead on slosh, or it can strafe to come out in a less lethal fan shape more likely to hit its target. This is the only slosher with a one hit kill move at all. The sloshes have pretty good object damage thanks to how far away it can attack, how easy it is to hit an object instead of a player, and how it attacks quickly in succession. Despite the long range, it's a middleweight weapon and has decent mobility too. It even has nice ammo economy, able to attack 12 times on a full tank. 
The bubbles come out very large and can attack much more easily at close range than other long range weapons do. Another unique property is just how dang well it colors around the user's feet. No worries about being stuck on slight bits of enemy ink, it just does it. So, those core stats sound pretty end-all be-all. How exactly does this round out if it seems to just be good at everything? Its main weaknesses are bad strafing while attacking and it being ridiculously precise at long range. Those bubbles shrink as they travel, meaning its effective range isn't as high as it would seem when watching it paint. Thankfully, we know damage falloff is non-existent, so if it lands a shot from a distance, it's still going to hurt. The balls also travel slowly, and the crosshair isn't going to help much. It requires even more shot leading than a charger due to the slow travel time. Lightweights and dualies give it trouble, since it has to land so many individual balls in succession in order to make good use of its shots. It's important to kite away from the action, focus on destroying objects when pertinent, and banking shots around corners where you're safe. This is a weapon that I see a lot of new players thinking is overpowered, while a lot of veterans say it's not that great. This is a case where I personally agree with the newbies and think it has untapped potential by the better players. Due to its unique shot properties, you can't apply as much knowledge from playing other weapons to it. It requires far more practice to learn than any other weapon, and because of that, I rarely see players banking shots off of anything. Go into Recon and see how it works in different spots in the current rotation. If there's one strong positive I think everyone can get behind, this thing is a hard counter to Brella's. It's long range, does a lot of damage in succession, has a good object damage multiplier, and the precision of the lobs isn't an issue due to how big their shields are. Plus, it can even lob around objects and hit Umbrella from behind. I feel like this is a good weapon that went unnoticed due to its initial hype being its object damage, which they quickly nerfed, and beyond that, it required completely different game sense in order to learn how to play. Main power-ups! Main power-up on the blob lob and blob lobbers is lob blobs that spread out after fusing with the ground! This stacks with special charge-up, resulting in more frequent specials if a favorite gear piece just happens to happen. Its sub-weapon is Splash Wall! It's long range, and this allows it to hold ground longer than it would be able otherwise. The main weapon shreds down opponent Splash Wall, so it's especially nice at pushing back enemies with Splash Walls while not being pushed back yourself. Due to the long deployment time, it won't get to use this as a spacing tool or part of a combo too easily. If it happens to damage somebody, that's 30 damage and by extension, one less bubble that needs to land since those do the same amount. Tossing it preemptively and showering underneath it can allow the Blob Lobber to swim to the opposite side quickly if needed, giving it a nice way to fight close to the action and not having to fight from as far away. Its special is Ink Storm! On a longer range weapon, this is a good fit. The damage is also pretty nice, and squished up enemies are easy to take out with a fan shape attack if they're stuck for a moment. A Blob Lobber is already pretty decent at painting, and this would make it able to color in a zone quite quick. It's also pretty easy to see from a high vantage point where enemies in an Ink Storm are going to move, and it can pre-fire there. Unfortunately, this is a weapon without anything that lets it space out. Painting and taking advantage of its funky shots are what it does. I recommend any kind of map with Splat Zones or Rainmaker for this one, preferably with ledges overlooking the objective and choke points in the mid. The weapon is very weak at tower control. Imagine trying to attack someone on the tower with such a straight shooting weapon that bounces along the ground. It's not gonna happen, kid. In the way of equipment, we're not done introducing new abilities quite yet, because this is the lone weapon that I recommend Thermal Ink for. Yeah, new ability this far in. Thermal Ink is exclusive to shirts and makes enemies visible to the user through walls for 16 seconds as long as they're directly hit by the main weapon. Since the Blob Blobber can easily attack around corners and bank shots off of stuff, this works pretty well and allows for it to make bank shots easier once it's hit once already. The exception to this ability is that Thermal Ink does nothing for indirect hits from blasters, explosures, and sloshing machines. But because Blob Blobbers have no damage fall off like those weapons, they get around this rule and always see the benefit. As you become a better player, Thermal Ink has less value, but it does a good job teaching how this weapon works and how enemies might move to react to it. I also want to recommend Object Shredder pretty highly because the object damage being so high is one reason that you would play this weapon. Kit number two, Blob Lobber Deco. Its sub weapon is Sprinkler, actually has a tiny bit of synergy. Toss it to sparsely played sections of the map to get free points. High spots are better than low, and with its vantage point, it should be able to do that fine. Its special weapon is Suction Bomb Launcher. At 190 points paired with a sprinkler, this ain't so bad. Suction Bomb Launcher is a good special, and focus of the set is absolutely high object damage. 
Between the main and special, there's nothing it can't break. Simply put, it puts everything else to shame in terms of object damage output, and that is my favorite thing about it. Use the free reload to keep the pressure in particularly heated bounce. This holds an area for a while too, making it good at gaining map control. I'm pretty sure every time you use this, it'll land splash damage on at least someone, and that 30 is a nice bridge for the main to land an easier knockout. weapon class reimagined. The Dually Squelchers! These are the longest range duallys in Inkopolis, and compared to the Splat duallys, they dodge roll faster. These overall are even more mobile than the Splat duallys since they even belong to the middleweight class. I wanted to open with this because usually, Reach is paired with being stiff, and that's the most defining characteristic of this one. They aren't. The Dually Squelchers also have a unique movement option that no other weapon has. It's able to keep moving and strafing immediately following a dodge roll without needing to pause. Additionally, being Dooley's, it's rapid fire and is pretty capable at covering the ground. Now let's get into flaws because boy, it's got some big ones to justify all that goodness. It does lower damage than the Splat Dooley's at 28 per hit. You won't be finishing off anybody with one bullet when shooting at a downward angle. This can easily get damage fall off that gets into five hit territory. When going from zero to 100, it comes up slightly slower at minimum time to splat than the splat duallys do. That is assuming that you manage to land every shot with such a wide reticle. It'll probably miss a time or two unless dodged first. The second big downside is, you guessed it, ink usage. But the big one is 8% from a single roll. It makes rushing down a gamble that requires a lot of ink in the bank. It's not as bad if rolling is used to reposition far away and play defensive, but you probably want to rush down with a weapon that is so long range and mobile at the same time, and it makes reloading and managing ink more important. But that's also kind of a problem. Dodge rolling at all causes a full second of ink recovery lag. Have a plan for your ink. Don't assume you can just rush into anything with such high stats. Speaking of repositioning and being far away, that's what this weapon likes. As long as it's on level ground to prevent the damage fall off, it should suppress things it outreaches and can be aggressive while still being a safe distance away. Due to having to put up a such high shot RNG if it doesn't dodge roll, it's probably not in a good position if it's shooting up close. The standard firing mode is great at turfing, while the dodge mode is what it wants to be fighting with if it can help it. Switch back and forth, this weapon can turf, play aggressive, or go on the defensive thanks to its capabilities being so useful. I consider this one of the most accessible main weapons in the game. Its sub-weapon is Point Sensor. Thankfully, we got a low ink cost here. Due to fighting at mid to long range and not wanting to be caught at close range, use this to see if someone's there before moving into the unknown. This points out enemies to the rest of the team without needing voice chat. Thanks to this, it's easy to avoid being snuck up on and staying at optimal range. Might as well toss them for cheap if you can see them, but not shoot them. Its special is Tenta Missiles. The trend is tracking. This weapon finds guys and rushes them down. Tenta Missiles can function to clean an objective safely when it isn't easy to get in. Its special is 190 points, and it's good at turfing, so it'll have access to this fairly often. You can use the Tenta Missiles to track enemies and pop point sensors on them from far away to point out where they are to the whole team. It's a surprisingly effective suppression tool and a good use of the free reload if you can't shoot anybody. As for a downside, the package has no way to attack directly other than its dual guns. So know where the snipers are and back off if they see you. Maybe give them a point sensor as a party game. You will not beat them easily. Know when it's best to go on the defense to stay alive. With high mobility, point sensors, and tenta missiles, this is a very reliable weapon for solo play, but has hard limits on what it can fight back against. The effective main power-up on the Dually Squelchers is Damage Up! And this gets all the attention in the world! Three mains and five subs makes it do 33.3 damage to score three hit kills on enemies with any damage. You don't need that much, but main power-up should be stacked. 32 or even 31 is just as good at 33 most of the time. And running a little less frees up slots for other abilities that will always help you. The guns have a lot of fall-off damage and this amplifies that damage as well.
Only one other kit, the Custom Dually Squelchers. Its sub-weapon is Splat Bomb right away. Aggressive weapon that's fighting fit. Downside is 70% ink for one bomb, 8% for dodge roll number one, 8% for dodge roll number two, and only 14% at best left to shoot with and get away, which equates to 11 bullets. Bombing, rolling, and shooting in the same skirmish is practically guaranteed to eat a full tank, complete with ink recovery lag afterward. You're tough with that sub-weapon, but you have to win fast to keep on living. Its special weapon is Ink Storm. Due to being pretty far-reaching, it shouldn't be too bad to duck out and pop this onto any objective. Sprinkling any damage on them makes the guns able to work better and bridge the gaps to 100 damage more quickly. Besides that, it could be used to block retreats and force the short stuff to fight you. I believe this to be the fundamental weapon for a learning mid-range play, and is particularly strong in splat zones and clam boots. It's a generally very helpful weapon to learn with. For one, it's a dually, that's already a big plus, teaching you the capabilities of a weapon class you'll be fighting against a lot. It has even better mobility than the splat duallys while being in the upper end of mid-range guns. Two things that make a good weapon that you won't often see together. Knowing how to use a splat bomb well opens up so many weapons to you, and the Ink Storm is a strong special that forces you to be vulnerable to use it. A lot of upper mid-range weapons are ink guzzlers, and this teaches efficient ink management too. It better, otherwise you're dead. Squiffer Wet Jet. This middleweight is similar to the Splat Charger, sporting speedier kill times but has slightly less range, lower object damage, and does not offer a scope. A unique strength of this weapon is its fast charge time in the air, allowing more acrobatic and movement heavy sniping. Combined with the ability to store charges for one second, and it's surprisingly speedy at getting into position and letting loose. Seriously, if they don't see it coming, they're done. Nine full charges are allowed in a full ink tank, but it's unlikely to run into its ink limit as long as the player spent any time getting used to it. An unfinished charge is 40 to 80 damage. Not likely to score a kill, but it could happen if they took splash damage or something and you're just barely under full, I guess. Main power up paired with squiffers increases the range and gives it lines of ink that spread out more once they touch the ground. This is one of the more compelling effects that doesn't raise damage. Personally, I think when setting up to play, strike a balance between this and the mobility buffs. It's good. A squiffer spends a lot of time moving around, playing with enemies at range, and not laying low in one spot like a traditional charger. It has decent movement stats and has to move around to take advantage of its low charge time due to the lower range. Its sub-weapon is... Point Sensor. Huh. So, zero damage. Yeah, we're really doing this! Makes it easier to hit your marks, ink consumption is low, and you'll get more assist with it. It's something to do when you can't make a shot, I guess. Also, it's good for checking behind scenery. I wish I had more advice to give, but yikes. Uh, I don't even think this is particularly good for manipulating people since there's no immediate danger when it's first thrown. And once tagged, they're just gonna pull back no matter how it lands near them. It can be used as a last ditch effort to point someone out when you know death is imminent, but that's about it. It's special is Ink Armor, so here's the failsafe and the good. It makes you able to miss a shot and live to tell the tale, and help the whole team just by being there. 170 points is the lowest charge of any Ink Armor weapon, and it comes out to decently often. Squiffer's pretty speedy, and it's not one of the worst turfing weapons. Now, while the Squiffer sounds like a charger for players who don't like sniping, I'd say it's anything but. Especially on this kit, it has very little way to defend itself, forcing it to land the mark every single time to do a single point of damage. It's got to be clever about its movement as well. Aside from not playing it seriously, it serves the purpose of forcing you to get good with charger mechanics and not over-rely on other sub-weapons like new players the chargers might do. I'd classify this weapon as support. Its can-dos are being able to kill pretty quickly relative to the range that it has, pointing out enemies and giving armor. I'm sure the god snipers in the audience love it, and I wouldn't disagree with you, but I think the classic squiffer is a very frustrating weapon to play if you aren't already into sniping and shooter games in general. Next up, it's the new squiffer! New isn't always better. Its sub-weapon is Auto Bomb. Yeah, we're starting off like this. This bomb is a less immediate threat than the other types, and it's even slower at painting. 
it's not consistent at manipulating enemies since much like the point sensor they can usually just run away from it. It might get some good damage once in a while, but that's more of a bonus than an actual goal. The splash damage is 30 and a partial charge can absolutely do 70, but again, I wouldn't count it on it being a consistent combo move. It's better to just get used to how enemies move relative to where the bomb lands and be ready to shoot a full shot. This is a pretty awkward combination, so what about the special? We fare a bit better thanks to the baller. The squiffer is able to move more forward than it might have otherwise because it can fall back on the baller for a retreat. On the opposite end, it could be used to push into an objective and be more direct in scaring off enemies. I'd say this works best in splat zones and clam blitz, but is definitely a less frequently used squiffer set. Due to the delay on blowing up the baller and the delay on a charge shot, I don't think there's any combo potential here. Enemies are just going to swim away and recover HP too fast. Earns the baller decently often. At best, it might be able to tap shot after it. And next up, his royal freshness, the Fresh Squiffer. Suction Bomb! Well, hey! Finally, a sub-weapon that normal people like! You know what I'm gonna say? The throwing range works perfectly with this thing's good range. You can cut off escapes, force people to fight you, use it to space out, and it can also just be placed out of sight to get a kill without having to hit a precise mark. The downside is the ink consumption. Without any ink savers, it's only two full charges tops after tossing this. So ink efficiency is more important here than ever before. Its special weapon is Inkjet. So yeah, we got a sniping special weapon too. It has higher range than the rifle cleaning supplies. It's sort of nice how its playstyle is very similar in both modes for the marksman and the crowd. Downside is, it has pretty much zero way of defending itself if an enemy gets at the marker, so it's exploitable. The suction bomb just takes so long to explode. Plus, ink jets are wasted if you're just bad with them, and it faces stiff competition from the ink armor set, which doesn't have that problem. I think playing this comes down to whether that suction bomb looks good or if the ink armor would be more helpful for a team comp. 180 is on the low end of inkjet charges, but the main isn't the best turfer once again, so it comes out to, yep, being an average charge for the third weapon kit in a row. Blaster in name only, it's the Rapid Blaster! Something that plays surprisingly different. No duh, it fires small exploding rounds quickly about two times per second and can release 14 shots on a full tank. But the shots take significantly longer to come out in squid form. It has a decent amount of ink recovery lag too, so your onslaughts have a long startup and a long end. The base damage is 35 to 85 depending on proximity, so it's incapable of one hit kills and can't two hit around corners. This is still strong damage from a single hit and can be an excellent revenge killer. When your friends stuck the enemy's feet in some ink that they have to get out of, you'll have an easy follow-up while they're doing it. The range is surprisingly good, making it an assist weapon. Outrange is many common shooters, and the splash damage gets additional range on top of what's stated. The main attack is also an easy-to-aim move that's guaranteed to shatter ink armor. Think of it like poking your opponent. You're annoying them, pulling off their armor, and forcing them to go away. Make that the goal rather than trying to land some slow two-hit kill every single time. Due to the good range and long startup, leading fire is a skill you'll be picking up to learn this weapon. Sparking, that's shooting a wall or floor on purpose to make something easier to hit, will only give 17.5 damage. Make really sure you're doing that on purpose and learning the optimal range. It's not nearly as good if you're not. It's remarkably easy to aim with this weapon due to just how frequent the shots are and how big they are. This weapon is especially potent in tower control, as at optimal range, it will pressure whoever's on the tower without much need to aim at them. By paying attention to their weapons, it may be challenging for them to fight back much at all in that position. This is a pretty nice weapon, right? Well, yes, but its sub-weapon isn't. Ink Mine. Okay, well, it's not that bad. The ink cost is pretty decent, allowing for a good four shots after a use. Due to the weapon having a long startup, not having an immediately helpful sub-weapon gives it less of a backup option. Place it down behind you before advancing further so that it's at your back and prevents an ambush. The damage being 35 to 45 means that you will always two-shot after it detonates and the tracking makes it easier to land the mark. But I said it's not that bad. It does hurt not having a sub-weapon that's immediately useful and having to rely on just the main weapon in order to do damage. That is, unless it's unlocked, it's special. The Splat Bomb Launcher! Woohoo! Good special here. 
So we've got the same great long range that you've come to expect from all launchers, lethal damage, and fast detonation time. A maximum of 11 bombs can be thrown in one use. Downside is less object damage than the beloved suction bomb launcher and less time holding a given area than that. Due to the lethal nature and the faster detonation time, it's more likely to score kills in the suction variant though. You could color in a splat zone or just make enemies back up. The long throw paired with another short throw to make two bombs detonate at the same time to cover a large area applies here too. Since this is a mid-range weapon, the bomb launcher does well at allowing it an in or just contributing in other ways when you've been found out. 30 splash damage from the bomb paired with an 85 on a direct hit from the main means it actually has combo potential too. Remember that your main is not locked out during a bomb launcher. A mere four weapons have this special and at 200 points, this is the steepest of the bunch. It's also pretty middling in turfing capabilities, so it doesn't get the special terribly often without abilities to aid it. Though I would still say the special is a reason to play this weapon due to how rare it is. Without the special, this weapon is useless in a direct confrontation with anything long range, so be wary of that. The launcher also covers a weakness, poor painting, allowing it to downright coat large sections of the map in seconds. The special charge is still a problem, but this is a blaster that can actually take map control every now and then. I'd say this weapon is mostly support. It's focused on ship damage and assists more than it is on actually landing quick or easy kills. Specifically, I want to recommend this one in Splat Zones and Rainmaker. The Ink Mine does a good job taking care of unmanned areas, while the Bomb Launcher is strong at turfing and still has very good object damage, even if it isn't the Suction Bomb version. Main Power Up on a Rapid Blaster gives it a great deal more accuracy while jumping and very slightly more of a splash radius. A little of this ability could go a long way. It couldn't hurt to bring it along. Second, Rapid Blaster Deco! Its sub-weapon is Suction Bomb! Okay, so right away, if they take any damage from this bomb at all, your direct hit kills them instantly. It's a good way to poke enemies away when the main gun isn't going to cut it. It's also a nice move when you're gonna die and you can't get the needed space to use the blaster. Gives you something to do out of range to weapons that might bully it. It's a Suction Bomb on a blaster. You know my main grievance is gonna be ink consumption. You're likely going to get three trigger pulls max after throwing a bomb on a full tank. Watch it. Its special is Inkjet. Blasters already like being behind terrain, so it's in good spots to place the Inkjet marker anyway. Sadly, at 190 points and with the type of weapon that it is, this is a steep requirement for an Inkjet if it isn't landing kills. The special is also easy to waste when you actually do get it, so the special is more of an incidental of the good sub weapon than an actually good addition. But I mean, Maybe it'll land a long distance kill and give you something to contribute once in a while. We got a third one! The Black Kenza Rapid Blaster. Its sub weapon? Torpedo. Ah, an annoying sub weapon. So, never mind tossing it and using the homing. Roll it along the ground and shoot at the same time it goes boom. The splash damage combined with a direct hit is plenty enough to smash them on its own. The torpedo is even forgiving on the ink tank, allowing for multiple chances to land the hit. Oh, did I say never mind the homing? Cause yes, mind the homing. It's nice to have a quick way to prevent an enemy from moving a certain way for a good while. They have to shoot the torpedo and not shoot you when your attack normally has startup that puts you at a disadvantage. This thing is wild. The throwing range is high and the homing range makes it even better. When you can't fight, just chuck it to annoy someone that your buddy is fighting. Only four weapons have torpedo, and with this comboing so well with it, this might be the strongest torpedo option. Making it even better, it's a touch-up tool that can turn extra ink into quick points on a weapon that doesn't turf well. It's also a safety tool, reliably answering if someone is in an area before moving on. It just sort of does it often, doesn't it? By painting, it helps it build up BALLER! Finally something to fall back on when the shots just aren't gonna cut it. This allows a planned retreat to a better spot against those annoying one-hit kill weapons you didn't want noticing you there. Depending on how the ink falls, it's sometimes also easier to just use the baller to take someone down than precise aiming at them with the main weapon. At 200 charge points and pretty weak turfing, this ends up being one of the bustiest ballers to build up. This full kit results in a rapid blaster that can paint kinda decently. I actually recommend it more heavily in splat zones than the other two as a result. Also. Pretty much every part of this is annoying and controlling. If they're going to move forward, poke them. If they're busy doing something, torpedo stops it. If they think they've gotten the upper hand, baller. It's just an annoying weapon to kill.
Gonna kill people with a washing machine! New weapon class, you don't say! Sloshing machine! A hybrid of slosher and blaster. Sounds like it would blend like milk and ketchup, but not at all! This is actually a great idea! First, the sloshes travel straight in a unique spiral formation that travels forward before arcing down. It attacks over objects like a slosher, but delivers high-powered hits like a blaster. Do note the hits don't explode, so precision matters. One hit will do anywhere from 38 to 76 damage depending on proximity, and it can attack 11 times on a full tank. Other than the harsh damage falloff, it can only attack once every half second, so not much room for continuous fire here. But what's kinda wild, is how if just one hit is a direct hit, the other will kill, making this an annoying weapon to challenge. The range is good too, slightly better than a standard slosher. It's still a middleweight like a slosher, but it has better strafing speed than the infamously slow brothers in its weapon type. Optimal spacing isn't quite as important, but you might as well use that good range as opposed to not whenever possible. The regular attack on this weapon is just good. High damage, high range, coats stuff in ink well, attacks over obstacles, attacks directly pretty well, coats the user's feet. What more could you ask for? It just works. Like blasters, it works well in tower control due to the more fixed nature of the attack, allowing it to just poke the tower by sloshing anywhere near it. Pretty much the only weakness I can think of are dualies, which outmaneuver with ease if the sloshing machine user isn't ready, and how the shot disappears upon hitting the target, unlike other sloshers that can damage entire waves of enemies. When going up against multiple opponents, it's best to do so with a teammate. Definitely slosh in the direction of teammates to help them out in general, because your high damage is likely to deliver the decisive blow. As long as your aim is true, it will score a one-hit kill after pretty much any other attack. And it's any other attack is Autobomb! Huh. So this is kind of a letdown, ain't it? Yeah, the Autobomb has some combo potential with its damage bottoming out at 30 and the 76 damage of the main weapon, but in practicality, not really. Autobombs take so long to blow up and have so many tells that they usually aren't responsible for wins. This is more of a tool for additional turfing while swimming around to check if someone's there before swimming on. Sloshing machines have to stand back and attack to take advantage of their power, so it might as well use this to answer questions. Besides that, not gonna do much since it's just a nice bonus if it does manage to hurt somebody. It's nice for the pressure on the tower for a good several seconds though. Its special weapon is the Stingray! Okay, we got a big one here. The sloshing machine thrives hanging back and attacking from behind objects, so the Stingray is a pretty decent fit for it. But really, any weapon with a Stingray is already compelling, let's be honest with ourselves. At 190 points, it's middling charge on something that paints alright. It's one of the shorter range weapons to have it, so not much synergy out there, but it makes up for it in terms of special charge. Besides that, Stingrays don't work well with the rest of the kit at all. All three parts of this kit are lone wolves. This set is strongest in tower control. The main blast is high damage, the sub-weapon's only really fighting use is to keep cephalopods outside of a small area, and the Stingray is... the Stingray. You see the way this thing was designed as clear as I did. Sloshing Machine Neo! The power of Neo is a point sensor. Yeah, it also doesn't do anything. Makes sense. So, for a lower ink cost, you get tracking and deterrent. This set winds up just poking people away from stuff. The point sensor will immediately affect their behavior, as will the regular attack of the weapon. When you just need one direct hit to finish someone off, this makes it easier to land the kill, but sometimes just taking an easy direct shot right in front of you is better. It doesn't come in handy all too often. The best use is tossing it at walls to tag people on the other side, who you can then hit without having to go around the wall. Not always handy, but it's something. This sub-weapon means that you'll take a hit in the painting department to gain specials better. And its special weapon is the Splat Bomb Launcher. There it is! One of only four weapons to have this special. This one has the cheapest charge and is probably the best painter at the same time. Right away, solid reason to play this weapon kit. It controls large sections of the map, gives you space, and colors in splat zones all with amazing range. It's quite deadly too, thanks to the fast detonation times and being able to overwhelm foes in a corner. Particularly, this set excels in splat zones where its special shines the greatest. The sub-weapon is absolutely a nerf to keep it from being too overpowered. This is a one-trick weapon. Does well with its special, but kinda limited otherwise even if its regular attack can be strong. The next kit we have coming up is hard to match up to, which is why I've been a little eh on this one. Hello, Mr. Meta! Kenza Sloshing Machine! 
It has a new sub weapon, the Fizzy Bomb. A bomb that charges up for a combo attack. For 60% ink, it gives 50 damage on direct hit, 35 on splash. But the direct hit area is small and 35 is usually what it ends up giving. It can be charged by holding R before throwing and takes about 3,000 years to charge up. What Big Soda doesn't want you to know is that shaking this thing is dangerous if you shake the controller, the sticks, or jump. Any kind of movement will shake it up faster. There are three tiers of charge, each granting an additional traveling explosion. A fully charged Fizzy Bomb gives three total hits. See what I mean about not expecting 50 damage? It's nearly impossible to land two of those hits consecutively with a direct hit, with the area being so small and everything traveling. But 35 on a three hit attack is pretty good. Not to get ahead of ourselves, but two mains and one sub of Ink Saver Sub allow two Fizzy Bombs to be chucked in succession which is some seriously busted damage thanks to being able to throw an uncharged fizzy bomb right after a fully charged one for an easy quick 100 damage. It's a combo on a combo. Fizzy bombs are even like light curling bombs when it comes to paint. They make thin trails of ink almost instantly with good range and can be swam behind if you just need to swim a given way right now. It does make you obvious but is a legitimate movement option to consider. Attacking into a corner also means the bomb will paint the enemy and keep exploding in the same place as it bounces. Not possible on all maps, but watch for these spots as they can be easier than aiming another move. It's unlikely to land all three hats on an enemy that doesn't move backwards with it, but man, when you get stuck in its ink and have to take those other two explosions, few feelings are more helpless as you slowly see your impending doom coming. This is an assist sub weapon. Throwing range is high and just 35 near instant damage, possibly more if there's a little wiggle on it, makes it pair well with so many attacks other than just your own. If we're talking about ourselves though, the name of the game here is chip damage. The main weapon does 38 to 76 damage while the fizzy bomb does 35 to 50 up to three times. You can see right away just how many different combinations there are to land that magic 100 damage as long as the bomb is cooked ahead of time, or even if you chuck it without cooking for that last little bit after a direct slosh. It helps when an enemy tries to space back due to your throwing range being high. You get 5 sloshes max after a fizzy bomb, and that's more than enough if you're used to balancing your ink in any capacity. Fizzy bomb is the most restricted sub weapon of them all, only existing on 4 weapons, and due to the way the damage works out, this might just be the best weapon to have one. Several entire weapon classes and most specials aren't paired with it even once. Sub power up on Fizzy Bomb is, yep, faster throwing speed, you don't care. Its special weapon is Splashdown. At minimum 55 damage, this is likely to score a finishing blow if you've done damage to the enemy already in any capacity. 70 damage from a near direct hit is especially nice. As long as you land that 70 damage range, this means that any other attack on this set, no matter how indirect, will knock out the opponent. Remember that you regain control before the splashdown animation is over and can chuck a fizzy bomb or slosh their way after a free reload, all while limiting their movement with all that ink you just threw around. Honestly, the potential good of just using the splashdown on this set is so high that you might as well just use it as a panic button. You only lose 25% of the charge instead of 50 if it fails, so just use it when you think you're gonna die because you might just survive. Heck, it's usually hard for this weapon to fight up close due to the windup of the sub and the slow kill time of the main anyway, so this pretty much functions as a backup plan. The splashdown also gets all sorts of crazy damage multipliers against objects, covering yet another weakness of the other two sets. Being upfront about it, this is an evil weapon that's just annoying to play against because it always seems to be able to hit for just enough damage that it isn't worth challenging any further as long as it lands one hit. So many ways to easily hit for small amounts of damage, it can support a shooter or dually weapon and make their time to splat downright tiny, I already went over how the fizzy bomb makes up for the poor damage of the main weapon, but the splashdown rounds it out due to its object damage, making everything just a non-issue. This weapon is the king of splat zones, able to color in the zone and just keep people away from wherever they need to be. If there's a weakness for this kit, it's ink armor. Having to land one additional hit makes it significantly harder for this weapon to overcome a fight. I'd advise backing off and playing it safe during enemy ink armor duration. 
In the equipment, you bet I'm giving special attention to Ink Saver sub for all the aforementioned reasons for the fizzy bombs. No sloshes afterward after one main and three subs, but it could be useful for applying pressure if the main weapon just isn't going to be helpful. Identify these times before using the full ink tank on it. Splatbrella holds on to its shield. Tentabrella uses its shield for the team. And the undercover Brella just waves around a piece of paper. This is the lightweight Brella launching a bunch of small ink pellets. Each contact will do 12 damage, capping at 40 per target per trigger pull. Unlike all other Brellas, this one has continuous fire with the shield opening after the first shot. The continuous fire is quite slow, and it takes three shots to land a kill, but they also must be well aimed at that. Thankfully for the size of the attack, it's pretty cheap to use at only 4% per shot. This also means that it turfs pretty well for what it is, definitely the best at it of any Brella. Contact with the shield is 15 damage, making point blank attack stronger. The weapon has the worst damage per second of any weapon in Splatoon 2 at only 45. As expected, also with it being a lightweight, the canopy has 200 HP, the lowest of any Brella shield. It's likely to block multiple attacks from dualies, shooters, and splatlings, but will crumble beneath a blaster, slosher, charger, and pretty much any special. This isn't so bad though. A lot of those weaknesses, especially specials and charge attacks, aren't easily repeatable. And even if the shield breaks, it does honest to good block something that would have killed you and comes out in a reasonable one-fifth of a second after holding the trigger. Still though, bad damage, bad shield, bad continuous fire, sounds bad. Uh, the thing that separates us from all other Brellas to make it not as rough as it seems is its ability to self-heal its own shield. Normally, the undercover Brella will come back 4.5 seconds after it breaks, which is already a lot faster than other Brellas, but when landing a kill or assist with it, you will fully heal your shield instantly. So you're slow at killing, but manage to pull it off or just help a teammate, and you're good to go like nothing ever happened. When juggling these cooldowns effectively, man, this is an annoying weapon to fight. It's just good at staying alive, even if its fighting is poor. If it gets one kill when fighting a 2v1, the other enemy is going to have an uphill battle against you. To talk about its actual weaknesses and not fair trade-offs, it's weak against stuff with bombs, since those can one-shot the shield and can actually be tossed behind it easily. It's made even worse by something like the Splattershot Jr. that has good ink efficiency and can't be stalled out for a long period of time. Blasters attacking around such a small shield are also similarly hard, as are Sloshers attacking over it. Use that higher movement speed and swim between the shots. Though it can continuously fire while protecting itself, repositioning and pulling out the shield at strategic moments to counter strong attacks has value. This is a lot better than the shield sucking up inconsequential attacks you can handle anyway, losing the shield, and having worse strafing speed than swimming while doing it. If I had to describe the main weapon in a word, it would be stall. You can take a lot of gunfire, make them use up their ink, all while shooting back and painting to afford a special with good movement stats. If its shield is about to break, you've got full health to super jump away, or just good swim speed to swim away. Your job isn't to kill, it's to farm specials, do chip damage, and draw them out. It's the most front of the front line, able to contest with more uncertain areas than other weapons would even be able to start painting. Who named this weapon anyway? Its sub weapon is Ink Mine! Not much going on here. Just place them when there's nothing else for it to do. It can prevent surprises when moving forward when your back is approachable. The chip damage and tracking plays into the undercover being a strong support weapon. And its special is Splashdown! Kills and assists give you back the shield. So whenever the shield is going to break, you can just fall back on this. The risk is low enough that I feel it can function as a panic button here and give you back control of a situation. I stand by this not being a stealthy weapon despite the name, but the Splashdown might be one piece of the set that rewards stealthy play due to just landing you more kills they don't see coming. Even if they don't die from it, they can be boxed in, forced to fight with your shield, and take a quick death due to the splash damage softening them up. I would argue this is the fastest Splashdown charge in the game. 150 points ties it with the ink brush for the lowest requirement, all while being a decent turfer and not having to play it safe all the time. In all, this is an aggressive weapon, able to sometimes land kills, usually land assists, and safely provoke the enemy team. 
The splashdown is frequent and the shield allows it to keep moving forward and lead charges. It's duck in, poke em, duck out. I want to take time here to say that no matter the kit, the undercover Brella functions as a shooter killer. Shooter weapons have rigid movement, their damage to the shield is low, and some of them have poor ink economy. They have almost nothing to deal with you unless they hurl a bomb, which will leave them out of ink if you live. The effective main power-up speeds up Brella regeneration! I wouldn't stack this, but it couldn't hurt if you got a little bit of it on your favorite gear. You ready for a long weapon name? It's the Undercover Sorella Brello, equipped with Splat Bomb! Not always available, but when it is, it's good for pre-firing since you can swim into position fast and whip out the shield to make your pincer easier to pull off. Or, it's good as a spacing tool when getting away, furthering the pokey play style. This lets it pressure outside of its normal range. Its special weapon is Baller. Right away, I want to talk about how Baller is affected by weight class, and this is a rare example of a lightweight Baller, giving it inherently better movement. This is, naturally, a stronger Baller than you will find anywhere else. It can lead a charge or be used for even better survivability since it's a second shield when getting away. Similar to the Splashdown, it can cut away an enemy's escape, soften them up, and then force them to fight the shield. It's a Clam Blitz weapon. Simple as that. It's the fastest baller around, in terms of speed. 180 points is a little on the cheap side, but not the fastest to build. If it seems like I'm just skipping over this one, I kinda am. The individual parts are good and all, it's just not as interesting as the first and third, unless you're a clam blitz freak. All two of you. Now, for the real fight. Kenza Undercover Brella. Its sub is the Torpedo. This is a poke that makes it a lot harder for the enemy team to fight you. They have to shoot the torpedo to avoid taking it, while you have a shield to give yourself lots of hits against certain frontline weapons. It's two separate things they have to shoot first before they can even think about taking down your actual health bar. If you toss this at a charger or something slow, try to throw it so they have to turn and deal with it to maximize the time lost on their part. However, if the foe has good firing or ink economy, they won't even notice a torpedo. Rolling the torpedo is sometimes better than throwing. Can't be shot at, does 35 to 60 damage, and the main gun does 40 at point blank range. Rolling it along the ground means a great advantage in fights when it would otherwise struggle. Its special is ink armor. Aha. Uh -huh. So this means we have a shield that's up when we're painting for ink armor. We have a sub that stalls for time giving them something to shoot besides the shield and then, well, armor on underneath that shield that we can build while stalling them. Despite being a lightweight tank, I'd say this might be the most annoying tank to bring down. It's just a good troll that has so many fail saves with a sub-weapon that pokes them, forcing them to have to back off. The Kenza Undercover Brella is a strong support weapon and just an all-around nuisance to bring down. If I have anything bad to say about its intended purpose, it's strangely that the shield is clear instead of black. It can be hard sometimes to tell exactly how much health the shield has left as a result. But this is such a simple weakness that you can get used to that I don't know if I can even really call it a weakness. It's just kind of a strange thing that you gotta deal with when learning this weapon. It's awesome. Kicking up the damage up a notch with the .52 gal! A middleweight shooter with slightly above average range, slow firing rate, and high damage. True to its name, 52 damage. While the continuous fire is slow and each bullet is more of an event than a stream, the damage is so high that this sports the second fastest minimum kill time in the entire game, only coming in one frame slower than a carbon roller. Of course, the problem is that both of those bullets have to hit. The .52 gal's first two bullets on a trigger pull are far more accurate than subsequent bullets, spreading out quickly after that. It may be better to tap rather than hold the trigger with this guy to make it easier hitting a moving target with so much fixed intervals between bullets. Accuracy in the air is pretty much nothing. This gun wants its feet planted into work. Despite the slow shots, the bullets are large and give a nice even coating. 
Turfing isn't great, but it certainly is not as bad as the other slow pokes. And despite large bullets, they're quite cheap for what they are, allowing for 76 bullets on a full tank. The main appeal is fast kill times at range. It just barely extends past a lot of common threats like splatter shots and splat dualies, neutralizing front range fighters before they can zip all around you. Main power up on the .52 gal is increased shot accuracy while jumping and less so while on the ground. It's an effect that can't hurt, but maybe don't stack a lot of it. Its sub weapon is point sensor, purely for awareness. Once someone is tagged, you know exactly how they're moving and it's easy to take advantage of those fast splat times. Low ink consumption too. It sounds kind of weak, but this is exactly what you want. One of the best showings of a point sensor out there. The ink cost is so low, you might as well just toss it to make it easier to use the baller! .52 gal is a duck in, duck out kind of fighter, not wanting to be caught at close range. Baller means it can get out of an ambush or alternatively capture an objective when things are looking better. Flexible, helping the .52 gal style in multiple ways. With decent floor shooting and the lowest baller charge at 170 points, Pretty decent baller pick. Next we move on to the .52 gal Deco, equipped with the curling bomb. Useful for approaches or mix-ups, as well as easy turfing or getting into mid before the other team. I quite like this sub weapon. It enables easy quick pushes to get into enemy territory and a route to swim back once it's done. The damage isn't anything to speak of for combos, but the goal here is movement. And it's got Stingray as its special. Um, Bizarre choice there for a mid-range fighter, usually having to either super jump out or retreat to use it at all. It's almost never in a position where it would make sense to make yourself so vulnerable willingly. We've got a sub-weapon for approaches, a special weapon that backs up, and a gun that shoots mid-range. Stingray doing damage over time also doesn't have any synergy with the .52 gal. It's more of a support weapon and an object cleaner. I'm not sure what the .52 gal deco wanted to do. There's not much you can do against long-range fighters, it's quite helpless without a throwing attack or a defensive tool, and I would say it only really makes sense to play on smaller maps that enable it to easily reach a snipe for the Stingray. Ever wondered what it would look like if Minnie Mouse turned into a gun? Wonder no more! It's the Kenza .52 gal! Its sub-weapon is Splash Wall! Most played here, I think. As someone who loved the vanilla .52 in Splatoon 1, this is the weapon of my people. Splash Wall gives them something to deal with, forces them to move to the side to fight you, and when it's clear how a foe will move, the main gun is downright lethal. There's certainly an art to it, having to toss it out preemptively. The main appeal is being able to push forward just that little bit further and shoot from behind or around, enabling it to slay things that barely outrange it, or just make shorter range target extra helpless when they want to get in closer. Its special is Booyah Bomb! Strong defense for itself and for the objective. Gets the enemies to back up while shielding for a few seconds. Tossing a splash wall before activation can make it even bulkier if losing the shield is a concern. Charges 180 points, inexpensive and strong. Overall, this weapon is downright irritating to kill, sporting multiple fail saves. Specifically splat zones where it can color in a zone with its special is king. Hey, you forgot to talk about the Range Blaster! That's because it isn't a variant of the regular blaster, but a whole different weapon. Thank god they've redesigned this thing for Splatoon 3 to make it look different. This is a minor variation of the blaster, with identical shots in terms of damage and almost the same radius, showing about twice the range, but has a slower rate of fire and higher ink consumption. Thanks to the range and blast radius, this weapon is meant for safely playing around corners and poking the enemy team away. This is a weapon that takes high commitment to make a move, because it's locked in for the long haul when it does. The first round takes almost half a second to fly out of squid form, and the continuous fire is one shot per second. And the strafing speed is practically worthless, furthering this as a trigger to tap and not to hold. The shots have high RNG thrown over them in the air. Always plant your feet in before shooting, otherwise, you're leaving the weapon largely outside of your control. This makes it a predictable and rigid weapon in how it's allowed to move and attack. And it's okay at movement with the middle weight, but even worse, 
This weapon has no way of reliably touching up the ground as it makes a getaway. Every option it has is too slow. Leading fire is necessary to land a mark, but it's such a long windup that it's one of the hardest weapons to pull it off with. Due to the slow rate of fire and 125 damage with a direct hit, the Range Blaster is quite weak against objects and specials, having horrible disadvantages against the Splash Wall, Rainmaker, Booyah Bomb, Baller, or even Ink Armor due to needing to land an extra hit to get at the enemy's health. The indirect damage is 50 to 70 based on proximity, but what's downright sad is that this can often be a 3 hit kill despite 50 minimum damage. Let me explain. The rate of fire and shot travel time is so slow and health recovery starts ticking up so fast when swimming in ink that if an enemy starts swimming after the first hit, they can usually recover just enough health to survive a second indirect hit. This weapon practically has to one-shot or assist to land a kill at all with the main gun. I guess it does well if you catch someone stuck in ink because you can pick them off from a safe distance, but so does every other mid-range weapon. Ready for it to get worse? Ink recovery lag! It only allows for a measly 9 shots on a full tank, but on top of that, it's a full second before it's even allowed to start recovering one little dot of ink. This means by swimming around to reposition shots, it often won't recover enough ink for even one additional shot. You know, the very way that you're supposed to act in the heat of battle? Main power up on the range blaster is decreased shot RNG while jumping, but look at this! They made it one of the worst main power-up weapons in the game! I am running this much, and still that reticle is the size of Neptune! <sighs> its sub-weapon is Suction Bomb. Only two shots are allowed after usage, without abilities. The splash damage can pair with an indirect hit to sometimes score a kill, but only if it's a close proximity without being a direct hit. I wouldn't recommend this due to it being unreliable. Plus, you're running on empty after that combo if it actually manages to work. Oh, actually, never mind. If they're running bomb defense up, the damage is exactly wrong, so you can't combo for a kill without shooting twice, which takes forever. Did I mention the sub weapon takes two whole seconds to blow up as well? More than anything else, this is to manipulate enemy movement, but even then, both the bomb and the main attack take forever to actually do anything. Pretty much all it does is shut down snipes for a few seconds. This is without a doubt the most ink hungry weapon in existence. Your attacking options are severely limited even after mild use of either of your moves, and it practically requires ink savers to be able to do anything. The only other thing I could recommend this sub weapon for is burst damage against a splash wall or the rainmaker shield. Its special weapon is Ink Storm. Right away, before we get into any damage or synergy, we have to talk. Listen. Listen. Range Blaster. I've been awfully mean to you so far. It's not that I hate you, it's just that you suck. 200 Special Charge! That's right! They gave this awful weapon that barely paints and has so few redeeming qualities the second highest Ink Storm charge in the game! only behind Dually Squelchers and Ballpoint, which are great painting weapons, by the way. This is the hardest Ink Storm to charge up. Did they get one thing right with this weapon? Why would you hurt anyone or anything this much? If you can believe it, this weapon had all of these weaknesses at launch, and it has only been nerfed since the start of Splatoon 2. It's never been buffed even one time, except for Salmon Run. They just made this weapon utter trash at literally everything, and then made it worse! Jeez, did this weapon steal Miyamoto's cookies in elementary school or something? Oh, right, um, Ink Storm. Uh, damage over time at range. Cool, I guess. It likely has to back off to use it, and about all it can hope to do is hurt an enemy's getaway enough that you can score a direct shot. Also, I'd like to point out how no part of this kit produces ink at all with some sort of absurd startup and cooldown. It's worthless if you need to get somewhere now, and that's the funny thing about slaying weapons. That tends to be something you would want to do in a fight. If you want to play range, play the rapid blasters. If you want damage and poking, play the standard blaster. If you want slaying, play Luna Blaster. The range blaster is just nothing.
can the custom range blaster do better? Its sub-weapon is Curling Bomb. I'd say we're off to a better start here. If it just really needs to move into position or swim away, this lets it do that. Splash damage will only combo in an indirect hit if an enemy is running no bomb defense up yet again. And speaking of similarities, oof. This is also 70% ink to use, meaning three shots at best after using it. This weapon should outright avoid fights with multiple enemies because it simply won't have the ink to dispatch more than one target. Careful management is a must. I would say that this is a good way to make a getaway unlike the vanilla, but not really. That ink consumption is too darn high for it to always be an option. Both the main and sub have long ink recovery lags, so swimming behind the bomb to attack isn't always possible either. Its special weapon is Bubble Blow. Bubbles serve a lot of purposes, but I think the best one here is Cover. Swimming into an objective safely or using the curling bomb for better burst object damage than the two main shots, it gives a way in as well as a defensive option. I wouldn't call this weapon good, it's still ink hungry and some kind of struggle to get the special charge going. Don't let the lowest special charge of any bubble blower fool you. The custom range will hardly ever get this special unless it's on a killing spree which is hard to pull off in the first place. And last up, the Grim Range Blaster! We have Burst Bomb! We finally got a sub weapon worth a damn! Burst Bomb gives it the ability to instantly do touch-ups while swimming and keep moving fast, all while not using up too much ink. Speaking of which, a direct Burst Bomb hit followed by any indirect blast spells a kill. Actually a potent combo attack, and you should have a good amount of ink left over after the fact as long as you're doing everything right. Burst Bomb coats them in ink and makes it easier to shoot, or you can shoot at the same time as the Bomb Toss. I would automatically say to always attack in tandem with this bomb in some way, because the blaster itself is so weak by itself. Easily the most mobile and most slayer-like of the bunch. There is the tactic of double burst bombs, which only allows for a single trigger pull if both are not a direct hit. Bomb defense up can ruin indirect burst bombs kill range, so the arc must be just right. And last up, its special is Tenta Missiles! I sort of like this one for this weapon. Whenever it needs to lay low and hang back, this gives it something to do. Unfortunately, 190 points is quite high for Tenta Missile weapons, and you're unlikely to get it without a killing spree. When it actually does get it, the tracking is the best friend a blaster could ask for. Being able to see exactly how they're moving is fantastic, and it might even get a kill on its own without needing to deal with the hell that is shooting someone with this gun. Low object damage is a weakness of the set due to low sustained damage. I wouldn't expect it to shred through anything. About the only edge here it gets is the ability to dispatch ink armor with the sub weapon. A major weakness of the other two sets that need to land a slow additional shot to do so. Hey, I guess one good weapon kit out of three ain't as bad as zero. that specialize in dodge rolling in particular, the Dark Tetra Dooleys! This one is most similar to the Dooley Squelchers, being a middleweight, sporting the same four hit kill damage, just with slightly less range. The main draw is being able to dodge roll up to four times in a row, instead of just two. While the dodge rolls only consume 3% of the max ink. I guess that makes these the splat quaddies. Uh, in fact, the bullets consume almost nothing, being able to shoot over 100 times without a reload. The shots even come out almost instantly after the trigger is pulled. Here comes the however with the trade-offs. These dodge rolls are a little slower than the other dualies, and the pre-roll accuracy is downright shameful. It's so bad, in fact, I'd suggest never firing in the air if it can be avoided. So, we pretty much have to roll before attacking for there to be any consistency, and those dodge rolls are surprisingly committal before they allow for normal movement again at almost a full second. Doesn't matter if you used all four dodges or not, you're sitting there for a while unless you can dodge again. Because of this, I advise not spamming dodge rolls just because it makes you feel harder to hit. Ask yourself if it's actually necessary before using another one, because if all four are used and they're shooting you, you're out of tricks. There's some light ink recovery lag after firing, something not typical of the shooter and dually weapon classes. When dodging and holding the fire button, it does indeed shoot mid-dodge, a unique trait to this weapon. 
It's useful to adjust aim while dodging, hoping to land a shot or two before the quicker post-dodge shots come out. Sadly, these mid-roll shots do not get the accuracy bonus and your feet must be planted in before that can take effect. It is likely to land at least one hit and you might as well take it, just don't expect to land multiple hits in succession with it or anything. Once those feet are planted in, stick to your guns. The faster rate of fire can mean the difference between a win and a trade. Or a loss and a trade. Also, please do yourself a favor and turn on motion controls with higher sensitivity. The frequency and precision of the aim adjust would be maddening to a stick player. Contrary to how small and light they look, they're actually not that fast and require a lot of precision. The main reason to play this is the increased number of dodge rolls, able to mix up and confuse enemies by just zigzagging all over the place. After two rolls, they know what to expect from any other duelies, so take advantage of that change and play mind games. I'd go so far as to say this is a weapon with a huge advantage over slow firing weapons like a .96 gal or even an H3 nozzle nose, though it struggles against anything that can kill quickly and doesn't have to aim precisely. And now, we get into the greatest weakness, the sub and special. Autobomb is the one thing you can do to keep a sniper busy. Then it confirms that somebody is nearby. That's really about it. <laughs> the damage can reduce the number of shots to splat by one, but unless it's a direct hit, not gonna do anything else. This also means the main and sub both have decent ink recovery lag, so don't spam autobombs because it takes a bit to start recovering ink in any combination. You can get a double autobomb due to how fast the special is. And that means we got Splashdown! Due to how fast this can get in regardless of the ink colors on the ground, it can use this a lot more easily than the other weapons. Problem is, if they see you using it, and they probably will, they'll shoot you out of it. Can land easy kills by dropping on their heads, but otherwise not too useful. Super jumps, bomb diffusions, and free reloads are the reasons you would use this. 170 is a pretty standard splashdown charge, and this weapon's widespread makes it easy to build specials. This is a weapon that doesn't require as much map control or floor shooting to be able to play, able to keep sliding around the floor for several seconds, regardless of the color of the floor. I would classify this as a frontline fighter for sure. With its range stat, it barely outranges practically every frontliner in the game. Due to poor shot RNG, this is a weapon that wants to avoid small platforms or choke points that prevent it from dodging around, because it's practically worthless if it can't get going. Big flat maps are the way to go. Strong upsides, strong downsides. It's a weapon that takes practice to get down at a basic level. On to the equippies, our sucky shout out of the day is Swim Speed Up. I actually don't recommend Swim Speed Up strongly for this weapon. It slides around so much and is stuck standing in place afterward that it's hardly swimming at all when it actually matters. I don't think a sub slot or two would hurt, but because it's a rare weapon that isn't helped by swim speed up, its slots are greatly freed up for other abilities, such as main power up. It's possible to three shot an enemy the majority of the time with two mains and eight subs, but this is such harsh stacking that it's hard to recommend over other abilities. Do you want a three shot kill with no perks, or do you want to sometimes shoot people one more time and have lots of perks? Four subs might be better because that breaks ink armor in one hit, Two hit ink armor breakage is definitely a problem for this weapon otherwise. There are two sides to every duelies. The light tetra duelies. Its sub weapon is sprinkler. You were hoping for something better, weren't you? More frequent specials, bait, and approaches are easy to do when they go for your sprinkler. No map control needed. All of this so it can build up the auto bomb launcher. It's for holding a given area for a long time, but isn't likely to do much more than suppression. However, when activating a bomb rush, the end lag for a dodge roll is cancelled. Yes, you can dodge roll eight times in succession with this special if you just need another dodge roll right now and don't care about the lame effect otherwise. It could save you in some situations and is a valid panic special since the intended effect isn't always that good. Just make sure the last roll is completed, otherwise it won't work. All end lag is always cancelled by specials, but bomb launchers not locking up the main weapon causes this one to be unique. 200 points makes this the more demanding of the two weapons with this special, so uh, thanks for giving it a high charge to offset the benefit of the sprinkler. If by some chance the autobomb launcher is your favorite special weapon, I do think this is at least better and more spammable than the freaking carbon roller. Also, you know it's bad when I had more to say about a technicality than I did about using the sub and special weapon combined. Uh, yeah. 
these sub and special combos are pretty equally terrible. The light at least has the fun identity of panic dodges, but that's all it has going for it. Other bomb launchers are better than the auto bomb launcher. The dually squelchers are longer range, and everything else has better sub weapons. Both kits are defined by the unique properties of their main weapon, which are all about the special dodge rolls. I wouldn't call this a bad weapon, just has room for improvement. Maybe another time in another game. The light is worthless against snipers. The Tetris slay low to mid-range weapons well, but don't do anything else. The Tri Slosher is for noobs who don't know how to aim! What? I like this weapon, and even I can acknowledge this is the truth. As the appearance and name implies, it launches three sloshes at once in a gigantic fan shape out in front. Even just vaguely facing something in the loosest sense counts as a hit. The range is short, like next to nothing, yet strangely is less ink hungry compared to other sloshers despite it attacking three times at once. The base damage is 62, a massive blow able to finish enemies who have been hit just once or twice, and it's even able to slosh twice per second. The kill time is fast and effortless to land. It's even able to kill from atop ledges after inking all around the enemy, making a getaway difficult. Here comes the U-turn. The damage fall off is aggressive when attacking beneath the user or outside the effective range, unlike at launch. Bottoming out at a measly 35 damage. Something that may not be expected is that this weapon is classified as a lightweight, despite how huge its attacks are. It has no trouble getting around or into position, only slowing down to strength. This weapon is nice to be stealthy with, because your damage and aiming aren't a problem. It's all about positioning, map control, and having the initiative to work with at the short range. Its sub-weapon is Burst Ball! Right away! Directed from a burst bomb softens them to the point where almost any main attack will finish them, and they won't be able to swim away while you barely have to aim at them at all. This is great, but remember that this is a lightweight paired with having infinitely more movement options than any other sub-weapon. This thing is a speed demon, able to get around in most any situation. As long as you're managing your ink well, you'll have so many things you can do at any given time. Heck. Chuck a bomb at them when they're swimming away after hitting them once. The main's damage is so high that that might be a win all on its own. Only 10 weapons in Splatoon 2 have the burst bomb, and this is the candidate for the strongest of them all. Due to the way the main attack comes out, it is faster to burst bomb and then slosh than it is to slosh twice. This simple technique can land you a win when you would have landed a trade otherwise. So. This is a pretty good combination, right? Did they give it Splashdown or Autobomb Launcher to compensate for this really good main sub combination? They gave it Ink Armor! Yeah! So we have good attacking, good mobility, and now good defense and team support with the most universally helpful special! Now, it's not quite as spammable as the Splattershot Jr., but 190 points is a middling charge for this, and it's not too bad at painting. If nothing else, it's a quick ink refill that enables one or two more burst bombs right off the bat. What's kind of wild is how well this weapon works is anti-ink armor. It counters itself so well because not only does it build up ink armor with relative ease to match the foe's capabilities, but the burst bomb breaks ink armor instantly with almost any hit, and so will the main attack, while both are so easy to aim. In fact, the main weapon is so wide that it might even break multiple armors in one slosh. This is, in my opinion, the best main sub special combination in the game. Just wow. You gave it something for everything. Extra ability options when it has high movement stats to begin with, high damage, good sub damage that pairs well with the main weapon, multiple ways of stopping the enemy from swimming away, a throwing attack that gives it something long range to contribute, the most helpful special weapon that buffs the entire team, Ink Armor makes it able to chase people down in close space, multiple good painting options to charge that special weapon, it's a jack of all trades for sure. The only thing it really lacks is range for its otherwise painful main attack. The effective main power up on Tri Sloshers makes the sloshes spread out more once they touch the ground. Not helpful, and special charge is just better for painters. 
We're seeing sex tuple with another tri slosher, the nouveau. Its sub weapon is splat bomb. We give up our movement options for a more lethal sub weapon. Due to the low range, it can't pre fire into the bomb easily. But I will say that this is a weapon that usually has an easier time coming out, even on trades, because it can toss a bomb just before it might die. This also gives it something more potent to contribute when assisting or when having to get rid of a sniper for a moment. When throwing a bomb at an awkward time, it forces them into swimming. Due to how easy aiming is with tri sloshers, you're practically guaranteed to land at least your first hit. And its special is Ink Storm! This one's more capable to play at range, able to apply big pressure from far away. Generally, this set works better in splat zones where it can lead a charge without having to be in the lead. Funnily, this makes it another anti-ink armor weapon due to both the bomb and the special. 170 points is one of the easiest ink storms to unlock in Inkopolis. With short range, a passive special, and the sub being the only aggressive part, stealth killing is the style of this weapon. When you're poked, it's better to regroup. <laughs> Ready to beat people with a bottle of wine? Ready to be for everyone, it's the Squeezer! This middleweight weapon is considered a nozzle nose internally, but I consider it its own weapon class. How would you feel if you were special and they called you a nozzle nose? The specialty of this weapon is two separate firing modes. If the trigger is held, it's a spread shot with shorter range for painting that hits for 30 damage per shot. When tapped, it is single shot and manual, turns super accurate, and attacks from farther away at 38 damage, shortening the hits to splat by one. This means to do any fighting, you're gonna be mashing the trigger. This will hurt your hand. Sorry, I don't make the rules. To get an idea of the range range, the painting mode is about that of a splatter shop, while a fighting mode is almost as good as a jet squelcher. One more difference, ink consumption is doubled when tapping, so painting is more efficient. Due to the unique playstyle and context sensitive shots, this one has a lot higher of a skill floor out of all shooting weapons. The painting mode has its uses when you aren't gonna contribute much otherwise and have ink to pour into the special charge, but you wanna be tap firing and taking advantage of that long range in any other case. I wanna highlight that reticle to you. Look at that. It's 100% accurate. As long as the range and shot leading is true, it will land a hit by all skill of your own. None of that is outside of your control, which is frequently a weakness for long-range shooters. But I want to state that this too is its own weakness. When a shot is 100% accurate, think about how often someone else has bad internet and it screws with your aiming. It might sound like a spread shot mode is better when up close to get around this, but you're gonna miss. A lot. The last weakness I can bring up is the mashing itself. It's not only physically painful to shoot this gun, but your mashing must be seven to eight times per second to get optimal DPS. Any slower and you're suboptimal. Even worse than that, mashing with so much gusto means that your hands and controller are going to vibrate, messing with that precise aim. Unfortunately, with a pro controller, there's no way to isolate that vibration from motion aiming. Disconnected Joy-Con and custom button mapping is the only way. But when disabling motion controls, you've now made the aiming even more specific. Aren't these unusual and meta weaknesses for something to have? What a strange weapon. It's weak because of your body, not because of anything the weapon does. Its sub-weapon is Splash Wall. With so much range, it's easy to attack safely from behind. Biggest sin would be popping it when being rushed due to the long deployment time not being so helpful. And its special is Stingray. Cheapest Stingray out there at 180 points, and unlike some other weapons tied with it, this thing can paint and paint some more. The Stingray is free points, or a push stopper and tower control, though if played for that, be mindful of the tower shredding the splash wall. Speaking of the splash wall, well, that's a safe spot to use the Stingray without always having to retreat. In choke points, the Stingray can defend you once it gets going, even if they shoot at the wall. I'd like to give special attention to main power up because its squeezer effect is damage up! The only real help this gives is an easy 33.3 on the painting mode, which should never be relied on. It can't hurt you, but I wouldn't really say it's great either. We're providing your foil squeezer with the foil squeezer. Splat Bomb is a good spacing tool, able to pre-fire into it thanks to how much reach it's got. 
Due to the aforementioned reach, usually enemies will just swim away upon spotting a squeezer, so placing a bomb right behind them allows for easy pincer plays. And we've got Bubble Blower, yet another long range weapon with it. It makes openings, protects teammates, gains control of an area when popped. The Splat Bomb paired with this free reload means it's got strong burst damage against its own special. Alternatively, a bomb can be tossed first and then bubbled into for instant detonation. It's all pretty much the same as all other weapons with this special. It's just good. I feel like out of the two, this one's more immediately exciting for general use. More helpful in Splat Zones and Rainmaker for sure. It's not perfect, however. The Foil Squeezer faces stiff competition from the Forge Pro, which fills the exact same role of an accurate shooter and has almost the exact same set. You could do all that extra work for more range than the Forge Pro, but do you want to? The higher potential is definitely with the Squeezer due to the longer range, but it's a steeper slope to learn. Gonna stick my hot glue all over you, glue gadoolies! Their range is slightly higher than that of the .52 gal, the weapon that I would call the most similar to it. The main difference to set them apart from other dualies is variable damage. Without rolling, it deals 36 damage in a fan shape. After roll, it hits for 52.5, reducing the number of hits to splat from 3 to 2, while also being more accurate and quite slightly higher in range. In addition to doing the same damage as a .52 gal and a fast kill time, it's also a middleweight weapon. For what it is, it's quite easy on the ink tank with a roll taking 8% and a bullet taking a little over 1. The weaknesses are even similar. 52 damage is a lot for one hit, but it's just low enough that it doesn't combo with much, making it ideal to just roll and shoot most of the time. And while the time to splat is low due to the hit count, it is the slowest firing rate of any duelies, meaning its attack will have to count. I'm also going to come out and say that dodging before an attack is practically a requirement. The shot RNG on this thing is atrocious! You will miss at point blank range! Often! It's hard to get these to work optimally. Learning the roll is everything. These guns are fast and strong when rolling first, but likely to miss and let foes get away if they don't. There's also, yep, a decent amount of end lag on the roll, forcing you to plant your feet in after one. Its subweapon is Ink Mine. Gross. I guess it provides bonus damage and tracking on enemies to support the team. It's not useless. But without having a throwing attack or a more immediate defense on the sub-weapon, it's just not that helpful. And its special weapon is... Inkjet. So yeah, we have a sub and special that are easily wasted. If you're a jet hero, go for it. It gets a dodge roll after landing from the special to defend itself and can attack far outside its normal range. But besides that, it's a harder to use special for those of us who aren't practiced with it. How about teammates with air skirmishes with this one? 180 points is a good charge, and the standard firing mode gets it frequently. Sorry if it sounds like this one's kinda bad, but it is. The main weapon has a lot of problems that cause it to produce inconsistent results. The sub-weapon isn't that helpful, and the special weapon is highly skill-dependent when in the moment, also producing inconsistent results. All three parts struggle in terms of object damage, too. I'm honestly not sure what they were going for here, because the other two far outshine it and are much better examples of what high-powered duelies could be. Only play this weapon if you're a massive Inkjet fan, otherwise it just isn't very fun to have luck deciding your wins. I wouldn't even call it that skill dependent, this weapon is purely rolling the dice. I don't see any reason to play the main gun over a .52 gun. Both have almost identical capabilities, while the duelies have the same weaknesses much more pronounced. The few advantages it does have are unnoticeable, like one half of a damage more per shot, and only if you meet prerequisites, by the way. They even both offer splash wall sets. The only reason to pick a Gluga set for the main gun is the additional movement option. Main power-up's effect is damage up! 52.5 damage makes it sound like it's not that helpful, but that's not the case. Gluga duelies have aggressive damage falloff and poor accuracy when not rolling first. Look how within range I am without getting my full damage! This ability is insurance. It forces the weapon into consistency it otherwise can't have. Two mains and two subs means a normal shot and a dodge can pair well with a two-shot kill. That's the optimal amount. It's a lot to stack, so some players might not like it. Then again, most players probably don't like this weapon in general. 
And now we move on to the set that I said was so comparable to the Point .52 gal, the Gluga Dooley's Deco! It's got Splash Wall! With good range and high damage, this allows it for a roll approach from safety or for a mix-up to flank someone attacking the wall. Good combination between the main and sub. It is possible to soften an enemy with this if they run into it, but the deployment time is slow and the damage isn't great for this weapon, so I wouldn't rely on it. It's either enemy manipulation or cover for this one. And its special is Baller! Approaches, scaring off enemies, safe escapes. It's versatile. This is good to fall back on when fighting speedier weapons that outmaneuver your shots. I like Baller on Gluga Duelies for more aggressive play thanks to being able to dodge roll as soon as it runs out. Plus the splash damage of the Baller causes it to one hit KO if it gets a roll shot afterward. It's one of the killier Ballers out there even when just fighting alone. Then there's the Baller being good at overwhelming an enemy that's already fighting a teammate. The Splash Wall also provides further cover to safely activate a Baller from behind, assuring that it isn't wasted. And as if all that wasn't enough, 180 points plus the standard firing mode's fan shape equals frequent activation. Really, just due to how versatile Ballers are and how well this weapon's capabilities work off of it, I like this weapon for that alone. It's a Baller fan's dream. Thanks to the baller's uses combined with dodge rolling, I think this is best for splat zones maps with a single zone where it's likely to score free points every few seconds. With the dodge roll, sub, and special, every part of this set is big on defense, making it a good tank. You have arrived at your destination, Kenza Glugadulis. Fizzy Bomb! Right away, compelling sub weapon that almost nothing actually has. When landing merely two hits, it's just one rolled bullet to follow up for a fast finish, all while the bomb paints their feet to make them easier to hit. I'd suggest also tossing this to help teammates. It's just good stuff and pairs well with the range of the main weapon. It's a strong support player. We have long range, a bomb that paints, and pairs well with most moves, and... Ink arm. Beyond the obvious of supporting and rallying the team up for a group attack, I want to add, that this is the only Ink Armor and Fizzy Bomb combo there is. Ink Armor locks you out of other moves for a minimal amount of time compared to any other special paired with a Fizzy Bomb. It's perfectly valid to Fizzy Bomb, Ink Armor, then Fizzy Bomb again. With how much the Fizzy Bomb already helps the others win their fights, you'll be a support mammoth with this set. It's no Splattershot Jr., but 180 is a low charge with good turfing. Absolutely, the Kenza Glugadulis are the support version of this weapon. And that's not an insult. Playing support is important. Or supportant, if you will. Today, we're looking at the highest range shooter, Jet Squelcher. Despite its range, we're looking at a middleweight and some of the highest accuracy of any gun. The trade-off is instead a slow fire rate, slow strafing speed, and because of the accuracy, poor painting. Each shot does 32 damage, making it just barely in four hit kill territory. To answer you right away, no, this weapon is not compatible with damage up. Its main power up effect is better ground accuracy and slightly higher range. It's an effect I don't hate and can certainly help, but man, imagine just stacking two sub slots and getting 33.3 damage. This weapon gets overwhelmed easy when other weapons are within attacking range and it wants to keep adjusting its position as a result. On the plus side, you will always know what you outrange. Your range beats any member from most weapon classes, including the shooter and duelies without having to identify which weapon that is from far away. The first weapon you don't beat is the splat charger. <laughs> In fact, I would call this a sniping weapon. Even though it just shoots and doesn't charge, any other shooter is better at short range, and without prediction, it's going to be ineffectual at that range. Frequently, its slow kill time is reacted to, and they start to swim away, so this is more of a team play. It can get some chip damage to help out its friends without having to get it close, always ready to step in with how far it reaches out. Furthering in this, its sub-weapon is Toxic Mist! Throwing range is similar to the max range of this weapon, so it can make it easier to land all four hits in a row when it's usually a pretty rare occurrence. I also can't stress playing support enough. Toss this to help out teammates. You'll see things from a distance that they might not. But remember when I said the range is similar? Yeah, the range on the Jet Squelcher is actually farther than throwing range. Ask yourself if it's actually going to make them easier to hit first. It may be better to just shoot. Toxic Mist is an ineffective sub a lot of the time and ink cost is pretty high for what it does. 
and its special weapon is Tenda Missiles! Hey, it's support! But let's talk about this as an option specific to this weapon. Tenda Missiles have unlimited range, so that's sort of a theme here. The main gun does well at shooting track targets as they swim around trying to dodge the missiles, but, 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 but. The thing I like so much is the Tenta Missile Toxic Mist combo. Once locked on with the missiles, use the free reload to toss a Toxic Mist right at them to almost guarantee an easy long range kill. This is surprisingly deadly and well worth the ink cost of the Toxic Mist for once. No other weapon in Splatoon has this combo and pairing it with the main gun already hanging in the back so much, you've got pieces that work well together better than it might look at first glance. 180 points is okay for a Tenna Missile, but practically every missile weapon is low charge anyway. The worst part of this is no direct attack other than shooting and no bomb to aid in keeping far away. It's got that combo and the hard shots to land. That's it. Not a lot of attacking potential, it's very much a goalkeeper. In the way of equipment, I'd like to give special attention to Thermal Ink. This is another rare weapon that works well with it because it's so likely to bop the enemy but not actually get the kill from so far away. It's pretty helpful to just have tracking on enemies in general as it's such a rare thing in this game. Onto the custom jet squelcher, it's equipped with Burst Bomb! Wow, good sub weapon. In theory. So, while it's true that it's easier to land a hit than shooting them from far away and throwing range is similar to a shot, allowing for easier aiming, there's a catch. If you don't land a direct hit with the Burst Bomb, the damage is just wrong enough that it takes three shots to kill after landing it. Seriously, it's 99 damage max with two hits. Sometimes it's better to just shoot someone if they're trying to get away and then bop them on the head with the balloon afterward. The sub is a good lifeline, not just for the mobility offered, but also because it can actually land at close range. 60 damage is a good number when the enemy's taken damage during a rush down. And it's special is Stingray! Ah, it's the main event. It's another long range weapon that's hard to land hits with and it's got a Stingray. The Jet Squelter shouldn't be far from a corner that it can use this from behind, it builds specials well enough, and the Burst Bomb allows for the occasional free point. 190 points is a pretty low charge for a long range weapon and this is a weapon for the Stingray Spammer. The vanilla variant is more of a poking weapon while this one's more able to land kills and suppress enemy objectives. Charger in name only, more so its own weapon class, the Bamboozler 14 Mark I! Strap in, cause it's about to get complicated. The weapon is made of exceptions. This is by far the weakest charger, in terms of power at least. Hitting for 30 to 85 damage, never able to score a one hit kill, but has the fastest charge time at one third of a second and the best mobility, since it's the only lightweight of its weapon class. Speaking of mobility, its charge penalty in midair is nowhere near as bad as the others. Despite the usual trend, it sports some good range, squeezing in between a squiffer and a splat charge. It's less obvious when it's charging, as it does not glow like its one-shot counterparts. As for the negatives, it cannot store a charge and does not do enough damage to qualify for the pierce damage mechanics against ink armor. Which is mondo bad because that means at least three shots are needed to dispatch an armored foe. Speaking of not piercing, the bamboozler also isn't strong enough to pierce an enemy it kills, and thus cannot shoot someone on the other side of them like other snipes. It can only finish one enemy at a time. Despite those highs, it sounds terrible and like it would have a high skill floor if you must always land two or even three consecutive shots. But that's where the gimmick comes in. Unlike other chargers, the charge only determines damage. The range is constant. A full charge followed up by anything else will always clutch a win from the same distance. Why fully charge a second shot ever? Its best ability is its spam ability. I've seen this called the to tap in the community and love that self-explanatory name, so let's use it. It's quite a strong revenge killer or able to instantly cover an enemy's escape route to make them easier to shoot at. Ink consumption is pretty high, only allowing for 11 fully charged shots. I would call this a weakness, but realistically, you're not going to be shooting so often that the whole tank gets used. 
It's simply high, so you can't mindlessly spam that constant range. The ink consumption isn't anything you would ever think about, as long as you're sitting in ink when there's nothing to do. When putting all the pieces together, it's not really what I would call a charger, since it doesn't have any of the uses a charger player would enjoy from their weapon. Instead, it's focused on completely separate strengths. Main power up, however, is familiar. It gives damage up! With 44 AP, that is 99.9 .9 damage, but some players might want to stack even higher. Due to the constant range, it can hit for 99.9 .9 with a less than full charge if it's gone all in with main power up. If they have any damage from enemy ink whatsoever, it's a speedy killer. Without main power up, the damage output of the bamboozler is one of the worst of any weapon, yet with it, it becomes one of the best. I know, weird, right? With the sort of damage it can hit and how instantly it can attack at long range, the Bamboozler is an assist specialist. It does well bridging damage gaps, the high damage and instant range of the main weapon is about the best source for assist possible, as unlike throwing attacks, no ability can mitigate it. Its sub-weapon is Curling Bomb! Unlikely to do damage, but gives a way to move all about or give an enemy something to run away from. Go bowling through a long, thin area before advancing to test the waters. Ink consumption isn't such an issue since it'll be swimming around or sitting still a lot in normal play. Combine this with long, thin ink lines the main weapon makes, and it can swim around quite a lot. And we've got Tenta Missiles. Here's where this one really shines. The Tenta Missiles provide tracking of as many enemy targets as you want, enabling for easy shootings. Not only that, but they're pretty likely to at least damage a foe a tiny bit, and that's more than enough for the one-hit kill afterwards. Your instant range can even make it hard for them to swim away from the missile's homing. Overall, this is a slept-on weapon due to how unique it is and how specific its workings are. It's great at getting pickoffs, better at painting than most other chargers, and missiles are excellent for playing support. It's quite strong, but in very specific ways. For abilities, uh... Wow, we're this far in, I'm recommending a new ability today. We are finally, finally covering Ink Saver Main. Ink Saver Main is less ink consumption from the main weapon, as the name implies. Generally, this is a piss poor ability. Think about slightly reducing ink consumption of a weapon that shoots 100 bullets anyway. Versus Ink Saver Sub, giving you several more shots after a sub weapon, or even a second sub usage. Your slots are better used on other things in all but a few cases, so something has to be ink hungry to warrant it, and well, we have that. Two subs of Ink Saver Main enables two extra fully charged shots. Due to not much stacking required, yes, it's finally recommended. I know I said that the ink consumption's not an issue, but you might as well have the option there if it is there, and that's not a lot of stacking. I also want to give special attention to Thermal Ink. Since it cannot one-shot an enemy, this tags them if they get away and can allow for a finisher later on while they're still healing from the heavy initial damage. Ray MK2. That's how I pronounced that trophy in Melee as a kid, and then I learned how stupid I sounded when I was like 14. It's got Toxic Mist. Actually, not too bad of a sub-weapon this one time, as hitting them with Toxic Mist lowers their stats, and that makes them easy to, to tap them. We kind of like this. It also checks through walls for targets before moving on. Most of all, in a long-range weapon, I toss it to keep an enemy away from an objective. At 60% ink, you won't have many shots left after this, and it can get milled through faster than in most any other weapon, due to the constant range incentivizing shot spam. And we've got Burst Bomb Launcher! Only on two weapons, rarest special of them all. Remember that your main weapon isn't locked out during a launcher. This is a dangerous combination, because when the Burst Bomb does 25 to 60, and your main shot does 30 to 85, you could land any hit at all, get them stuck in ink, and then do a full charge. Alternatively, you could plop it on their head and barely charge it all afterward. All while having the allure of the double burst bomb hit as another option. An unconventional strength is increased mobility while the special is available. Don't discount the ability to instantly create ink. Besides that, it's pretty much the only way the bamboozler can shut down a rush with certainty or attack behind walls easily. A burst bomb could lower their movement options, making it easy to snipe, or on the reverse, you can hit them with a full charge and then follow up with an easy to land burst bomb to get the kill. The range is similar, and they should be able to attack in tandem with each other pretty easily. This isn't a particularly popular one, but I feel like it has enough unique about it that it may be worth trying every now and then. 
If only there was some sort of system that recommended weapons for specific maps and modes. Something I have to say about this one on the whole is the terrible object damage output. The Mark I had bad object damage without the curling bomb, but this one just has nothing. And then, Bamboozler 14 Mark III! It's got Fizzy Bomb! Whoa, that's a rare sub weapon. Better watch out with that thing. With long range and good painting, the Toss Soda Can can soften the enemy up nice and easy. After two hits, an uncharged shot can finish them off, all while making their feet goopy and easy to hit. Especially when they have to pass through uninkable ground. With how long range the main weapon is, this makes life quite awkward for them to reach objectives and makes the Bamboozler 14 Mark III a nice gatekeeper. That's just talking about ourselves, though. The Bamboozler's 85 plus damage and the Fizzy Bomb's damage both combo well with practically every other move in the game. This is a weapon that goes together with a buddy to score lots of wins and make life easier on the teammate. And its special weapon is Bubble Blower! Colors in a splat zone, acts as a shield for everyone, and can get less precise kills than the main weapon would normally allow for. It's on a long range weapon too! Now, when compared to the other weapons, this might look bad. 190 isn't a low charge. Plenty of other weapons earn theirs faster or with less points. At least a fizzy bomb on its second tier of charge can insta-pop a freshly made bubble, so there's that, but that's really about it. This is what I would call the most gear-dependent weapon in the game. Object Shredder is a necessity due to poor object damage with that special, but then stacking main power-up is the only reason the main weapon would be good at fighting or popping bubbles. If you've got those abilities, it's a good, good bubble blower with some serious potential. If you don't, then it just kind of sucks. But then Ink Saver Sub for double fizzy bombs is one of the best reasons to play a fizzy bomb weapon. It would be impossible to dedicate equipment slots to all three of these incredibly gear-dependent pieces. In most builds, the fizzy bomb is the one that has to go. But no matter what, you sacrifice one part from living up to what many would view as the standard. It might be the only weapon like this where one piece essentially has to be sacked so the others can thrive. Listen, Short Nose, this gun's been wasting your life since before you were born. The L3 Nozzle Nose belongs to a new weapon class, the Burst Mode Shooter! When pressing ZR, three automatic shots are fired in rapid succession! It takes slightly longer between bursts to shoot again, so leading fire is important to make all three hits land since it's all based on a single input. But for the marksmen who love the precise high skill weapons, this thing is a dream. At base 29 damage, it always takes four attacks to finish an enemy, meaning two trigger pulls. But, 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 I'm going to skip ahead a little here, because there is one ability, one so powerful, so instrumental, so crucial, so worship that it's main power. This gives the effect of damage up, and oh, is it getting all the attention. With eight sub slots, it reaches 33.33 repeating, of course, and just one frame in enemy ink turns this into a one trigger pull kind of kill. Couple that with the longer than normal range for a shooter that just barely outranges all the fast killers and damn L3, you scary. Moving on to the other capabilities besides damage, there is one other way the L3 stands out from other weapons and that's its evasiveness. You don't often hear about this. It's a middleweight weapon, but due to the unique way it works, it can strafe around all zippy-like. Compare this to other shooters, and it's no contest how fast it moves out of the ink. It's actually so good at strafing that it might want to stay in kid form for extended periods of time. Also thanks to this, it's a good turfing weapon. Like, way better than you'd expect when you hear only shoots three bullets at a time. Look at the nice even coating on the cake here. The bullets are small and low on damage, making them easy on the ink tank to keep up the pressure. As long as you know what you're doing, it has lots of ink to move around in, evades anything slow, and outranges most anything that's fast. It's a powerful, yet hard to hit weapon. With all weapons that are a little bit different, there's a small quirk I want to go over. If there isn't enough ink to fire all three shots, you get a burst of zero, one, or two shots. 
Avoid ever needing to fire on low ink and make sure there's always at least a little in the can. After a little time, this becomes subconscious. Now, there's also negatives that are quite big because of course there are. One is object damage. We have teeny weak bullets that can't be fired consistently, so it's walled by, well, walls. For two, any strong one-hit kill is a pretty certain counter to the L3, even if it can be hard to hit. Bumping ahead a little bit, this is especially true on the vanilla kit because this set of three parts doesn't have much of anything to deal with chargers. Be aware of long-range weapons that can blast you and play around them. Its sub is Curling Bomb! While it sometimes runs over someone's toes and softens them up for you, it's not likely and Curling Bombs end up playing off the good mobility more than anything else either by swimming behind it for an approach, a mix-up, or a getaway. In smaller areas, the bomb can be used to fish for sharks and keep them at a safe distance. It's an expensive sub-weapon to use, so be mindful of that and don't launch it just cause. For special, we got Baller! It's whatever the enemy team doesn't want to see. It's a getaway to slay another day, or a trap to fall onto cephalopods heads with. Can take an objective and matches the theme of enemy suppression in this set. The charge is high at 220 points, but that's to be expected from a strong slaying and turfing weapon. In all, a combination of aggression and support. All three parts work well for both of these purposes, and it paints so well while moving all around and just feeling powerful. When combining the range speed, curling bomb, and baller, yeah, it has all the best stuff for clam blitz. It can still absolutely play other modes, but I thought this was worth bringing up. This weapon truly does it all. Your decision to play the vanilla set is based on whether all-out aggression is a fair trade for being worthless against chargers. That's the main quandary with the L3 nozzle nose. L3 nozzle nose D. She likes the D. Ever meet a girl who doesn't like dolphins? I didn't think so. We're mixing burst shot with burst bomb. While it might not offer the same movement options as the curling bomb, different doesn't equal bad. It can get up walls or quickly paint a problem area, plus the bomb is likely to actually do damage. A burst bomb splash damage maxes out at 35, while a direct hit is 60. This means any kind of close hit will only require two burst shots to bridge the damage to 100, and two bullets is easy peasy to land with the ink that they're already going to be drenched in. Though the 35 damage range only barely accomplishes this and is easily countered by bomb defense. Only rely on this tactic when an attack is direct. Brutal sub weapon this is. Plays off the main gun well, consumes little ink, gives more options, and makes everything more consistent. It's less consuming than a curling bomb, and can be used in a myriad of situations as a result. Sometimes do throw it just cuts. Its special weapon is Inkjet. This gives it yet another killing option. While one of the less reliable special weapons, it can assist allies or just score a kill on its own. The main and sub are so strong at movement and fighting as it is, that I'd mostly advise this when you have some sort of advantage and the enemy movement is predictable. While not an always workable option, the special does give it at least something against sniping weapons, so that's another positive. The L3D is another aggressive weapon that uses its range and high damage to land kills, but requires less precision due to just how much ink it tosses around. The trade-off is an unforgiving special in exchange for a good main sub combination. And now, the Kenza L3 nozzle nose. Oh look, it's an edgy garden hose. Why did you make a garden hose edgy? Hang some spikes onto the hose, duh! Splash wall! It's beginning to look like a defensive set here. By placing this in the right spots on the right maps, it makes you difficult to approach, and the L3 has... pretty good range to attack from behind it. Just place it preemptively and don't rely on it as a panic button. It's, um, certainly a different kind of sub-weapon from the other two, but it faces stiff competition from the burst bomb. This means it has to land two trigger pulls to ever get a kill at full health, so it's more limited in terms of offense. It's not a particularly strong sub-weapon and isn't movement-based like the other two. So does it have an overpowered special or something? The train is coming! Ultra Stamp! I feel like the parts of this weapon don't work all that well together. Ultra Stamp either runs around with the enemies or sometimes tosses itself away to get a long range one shot. If it's being the train, then not killing everyone in sight leaves it downright helpless due to the wall's deployment time and multiple trigger pulls required to land a kill. And sure, the long range throw is fun when it works and gives it a legitimate option against the snipers, but that's just it. It doesn't always work and cancels your special to do it. 
It's a fun special to use, but unreliable to begin with and not helped by the other two parts. Plus, it's quite useless when super jumping into a fight. Think about it, no part of this set would be able to fight back in that kind of situation. 180 special points is an amount this weapon should have zero issues reaching, so it manages to have a special spam going for it if the Ultra Stamp is your cup of tea. We're gonna blast you to smithereens with the EXPLOSHER! Or EXPLOSHER, no one's really sure on that one. A combination of slosher and blaster. Sounds awkward and shit. It's better than it sounds, I promise. It lobs an exploding round into the air, able to hit over objects and land for 55 damage on a direct hit and a minimum of 35 on splash. This damage is constant like a blaster, never suffering any of the damage fall off sloshers are normally limited by. The attack area is also large and not difficult to aim. Although, that's not the half of it. The sloshes are unlike anything else in all of Splatoon, able to pass through a target until it hits a solid surface, hitting multiple targets in a straight line. This is why you've been seeing it hit for 90 in this footage, even though I keep saying it's 35 to 55. As long as the aim is dead on, it's capable of hitting the same target twice if they're in both the epicenter and splash zone at once. 55 damage is quite high and would pair well with pretty much any weapon helping it out, but 90 from a single hit without a charge and being able to attack over things and below itself is downright ruthless. Chances are though, it's not gonna land, kid. Hitting dead on with a moving target, sometimes behind obstacles, it's asking a lot. Even if it doesn't land that, constant damage that cannot be reduced by anything makes it easy to know when to attack again or retreat. It's a fantastic weapon to back someone up with due to the humongous range of the epicenter being equal to the bamboozler. With constant damage affecting a large area, it pairs well with so many teammates. You gotta have some sort of Achilles heel to offset all that goodness, right? Oh, we've got one! Mm -hmm. It can only slosh eight times on a full tank, the worst ink consumption of any weapon that doesn't charge. This is a weapon that absolutely requires counting out its attacks before doing anything, frankly. Spamming the trigger for even a few seconds means you will lose encounters, and even if you don't, landing a single kill usually means you'll be at half ink at best. I'll even give you a second weakness while I'm at it. Its strafing speed is practically a stone statue, and despite the size, it's a heavyweight weapon. It won't be getting away from anything that gets in close. On top of that, let's combine all that slowness with the ink usage, and everything besides fighting just feels like a chore. Making ink to swim through, getting away from a special, little ink touch-ups, dealing with a torpedo, or just having to stop and ink a wall. It all sucks. With the high damage and poor speed, maybe go with a buddy for this one. Hang in the back, tossing in damage to help. You most likely won't win a close range encounter alone. Another unconventional weakness is due to the ink just passing on through stuff, it struggles to attack on grates, requiring extreme precision with the epicenter landing dead on the enemy's head. Main power-up's effect on Explosher is sloshes spreading out more on the ground. The trail and not the explosion because that's never allowed to be affected by abilities, it seems. Its sub-weapon is Sprinkler. I would actually say this has good synergy with the main weapon. No, not because 20 damage paired with 90 is a good combo. That will rarely happen at all, if ever. And even if it does, you're better off relying on a teammate's attack to pair well with the main weapon. I say it because you'll be hanging out in high vantage points or behind fences to slosh, thanks to the cool constant damage. From there, the sprinkler can be tossed all sorts of places. It also gives it something to do when a slosh isn't particularly needed, since the element of surprise is good to have when you're attacking from above or behind something. Thanks to the pro sprinkler spots it's already standing in, you can already count on it to earn more frequent specials on the regular. Another cool thing it does is paint the user's feet in a split second. The main is so slow, you likely won't be relying on it to make touch-ups, and no set of this weapon has anything else that makes ink instantly. Its special is Bubble Blower! With the high range and high damage of the main, good Bubble Blower here. Bad movement is about the only way it could be hard to work with this, since you might want to get in close to hide behind the bubbles. 
Normally the set is vulnerable and slow, so this is about the only way it can go close range. Due to the low mobility, high ink consumption, but also having a sprinkler and a large attack area, it evens out to be a moderate painter, I guess. Since specials are always free reloads, toss a sprinkler where the bubbles are going for a more full coat of paint on them right away. It's more doable to pop the bubbles after a free reload, and this is a good weapon in splat zones as a result. 210 is the highest charge on any bubble blower weapon, a necessary evil due to the good damage and being able to hit multiple bubbles at once. Second set out of two, unlocked at level 22. I'm on to you conspiracies. Point sensor! I welcome the cheap sub weapon. Due to the area of the main being surprisingly precise, this is a helpful handout. It would be nice if it had a bomb, but what are you gonna do if it did slosh two whole times after throwing it before you run out of ink? Due to how well the Explosher attacks over walls and up on ledges, the point sensor makes it easy to land hits on normally invisible targets. It helps point out enemies to your teammates, too, when a good Explosher has a good view of the action. I would say to toss this at the feet when getting overwhelmed to tag your killer, but you probably won't have enough ink. I'm sorry, unsolved murders are because of Explosher mains. And we have Baller! This is the worst Baller. I'm not making that up, it's not my opinion, it's not a subjective special charge thing that most competitive players agree on. It's a heavyweight baller. Only one in the game. It has inherently worse movement stats in the special from all other baller options, meaning it has essentially a different worse special from every other weapon in Splatoon. I'd say baller fans are gonna pick another weapon. About the only advantage is tossing a point sensor before activating to know how to behave around those who are swimming around, or the splash damage of the baller pairing well with the slosh. This is a clam blitz weapon mostly, the 7 special help it out in that one. A problem with both sets is that without their specials, the explosures have basically nothing going for them against snipes. The Assassin's Favorite Hair Dryer, the Luna Blaster! The shortest range of all weapons, but the blast comes out quick. After the first one is fired, it slows down and takes two thirds of a second to shoot again. Now, you might look at the trail of ink and say, what are you talking about? The ink brush is way shorter range. But I'm talking about effective range in the epicenter of the blast. The blast area is almost the largest of any blaster, and it's only fastest killing if it lands dead center the first time, which is the only reason it has that deceptive range. If it requires any additional shots to land a hit, it's one of the slowest DPS, with the splash damage doing 25 to 35, and the inner blast area hitting for 50 to 70. If it lands two hits, it will likely get the win without much need to aim. The large blast will coat the enemy's feet with ease just so long as it lands, too. This is a lightweight weapon, enabling it to get all over the map, and the shots have perfect accuracy while on the ground. One limitation of the movement is only having a 50% chance to shoot inward while in the air. So plant the feet in to attack with consistency. If it misses, it's probably dead. Precise and creative movement is everything for a blaster. It's got a slower fire rate, shorter range, and worse painting capabilities than most weapons. So misleading your opponents is what it's all about. As a nice bonus, the shot only consumes 7.5% ink. Blasters are usually much hungrier, so you get 13 blasts with this one. Downside is a long ink recovery lag that goes for a full second. It has to lay low at least some of the time in order to work. Speaking of that, you want to lay low at least some of the time for it to work. It's the shortest range of anything and can't tangle with two at once. Attack from where they can't see you, break them, and then get out before anyone else knows where it came from. Only shoot the unknown when using the large blast area to check a corner. Telegraphing yourself and announcing your presence is about the worst thing you can do because any foe is capable of just spacing you out and won't have to get in close to finish you. Don't challenge Ink Armor, it's pure evil. You're so slow at landing multiple hits and well within everyone's effective range to do so that the armor is going to win. If it sounds like I'm telling you how to shoot your gun like it's an absolute, I kinda am in this case. Being the shortest of all weapons and having harsh penalties from missing means that it's severely limited in terms of when it can attack anything at all. So when should it attack? 
It's great at attacking areas where squids think they're safe. Many weapons struggle to attack around corners, and its blasts have so much horizontal reach they can hit around pretty much anything. Beyond that, attacking up on ledges up close is often a weakness for other types, and it's not so for the Luna. It's all about catching them off guard, mixing up movement, and flanking them. Its sub weapon is Splat Bomb! Normally, this is one of my favorite sub weapons, but because the main weapon outranges nothing, there's not really a way to trap a shorter range foe and make them fight you at a disadvantage. It painting from far away isn't going to trap in most situations either. Generally, this is most useful to get them to drop their ink armor, since that's usually such a problem. Use the sub weapon to do damage when shooting multiple times isn't wise due to an object in the way. I'd recommend tossing it at their feet when you think you're about to die and to suppress range threats for a few seconds. This helps teammates score a win more often than it does for you. Since the Luna is going to be hanging low and keeping the element of surprise, might as well toss this in their way when they otherwise can't get in close and shoot. Besides that, it's a top off whenever you just need a few more special points for your baller. It's funny how themes keep happening between weapons beside another. This is one of the few lightweight ballers. 170 points isn't terribly high of a charge, but its ink coverage is so tiny that it will struggle to earn it without abilities or landing wins. If it fails to rush in and wipe the enemy team members at present, it's a sitting duck, and the splash damage is so low that it might not even land a kill if it misses the direct hit after the baller explodes. Of course, free reload could allow for a splat bomb, but that's really about it. When it's actually deployed, I feel this is better for getting out of trouble. The movement is great, and the baller gives it a shield and lets it get back into position if there's someone else present after your successful first attack. The baller is also about the only way it can be unshackled from a normally restrictive set of movement options. Think about it. You have a blaster and a splat bomb, but nothing but the blaster is going to be able to move you past enemy ink in a reasonable amount of time. Main power-up's effect on Luna Blaster is reduced damage falloff from an indirect shot, causing the minimum splash damage area to be larger and ink that spreads out on the ground while airborne. Confused? So was I. In layman's terms, it makes things more lenient. <laughs> special mention to special power-up. Just a few subs increasing the splash damage area can make a difference when it's so easy to follow up with a bomb or a shot. Luna Blaster Neo, equipped with Ink Mine! I guess it prevents it from being snuck up on. I don't know, it feels kind of naked without a real bomb or anything ranged when dealing with the shortest range there is. It's just kind of cruddy. It might track an enemy and make them easier to blast, but that's so unreliable. Just pop these whenever the enemies have to pass through as a form of suppression, or place them behind where you will be. Suction Bomb Launcher, there it is! An uncommon special with a low charge of 170 points. This allows the Neo to take map control of a large area, particularly helpful in splat zones. In fact, I'd say that's where the set shines most due to the mine painting in the zone if you've placed it, and it being obvious where enemies have to shoot to advance the game state. Hang out in the zone, use the mines and special there to just be a real troll. No object will stand in your way. The main weapon's slow fire rate is a non-issue when it has the special. And the Kenza Luna Blaster with Fizzy Bomb! Finally another one of these! Tossing it without a cook is a better movement option than waiting on a blast, instantly making the most mobile of the three. You're less helpless when needing a small touch-up to move a certain way, too. The Fizzy Bomb is just real deadly when charged, allowing this weapon to attack from far away. You can always swim into range with the trail the bomb leaves behind and then follow up for a quick finish that barely needs to be aimed at all. Alternatively, it's a good distraction for those many situations where Luna just can't get in safely. It gives it something to contribute where the Neo wouldn't be able to. Fizzy's a good paintbrush for your special, which is Ink Storm! 170 is one of the lowest Ink Storm charges there is, all while the Fizzy Bomb is a good painting sub weapon. Damage over time racks up surprisingly quick and can bridge the gap for a blaster to score a splat. Or it's just a way to gain control of a situation far away when Luna struggle with such a task normally. That's sort of this weapon. It helps out the group when it can't exactly fight directly, which is good with how severely limited the main weapon can be. Speaking of which, if it has no goal to go towards otherwise, just throw it where you want an easy way in. The storm does a good job protecting the user. Use a Fizzy Bomb after a free reload for a quite deadly combo that's effective from far away. 
Its whole style changes after the special comes in, where it goes from playing stealth to making everyone move around predictably while it has an amazing and uncommon throwing attack not found on other blasters. For some reason, Sheldon named this the fourth iteration and made it worse than the third in every... <laughs> For some reason, Sheldon named this the fourth iteration and made it worse than the third in every single possible way. The E-Leader 4K. Anyway, this charger you probably won't be playing is the longest range weapon in Splatoon 2. It takes 1.5 seconds to fully charge, and without that startup, lesser charges do 40 to 80 base damage and don't outrange much of anything. In other words, it isn't special unless it fully charges. So here's why I'm pretty down on this weapon. It sacrifices everything for the sake of long range. It's a heavyweight weapon. A full charge is the most costly single shot in the game at 25%, and the charge time is beyond slow. It also translates into being unable to attack in succession, such as against ink armor or an object, and being, well, walled by anything of that nature. You can even make the argument for some flimsy objects like sprinklers or squid beacons making it useless in an instant. About the only thing it's good at besides range is holding charges while swimming, which you can do for a little over a second. For that reason, I personally prefer the non-scoped variant. The range difference brought by the scope is almost nothing, and the trade-off of having one good stat versus two sounds pretty good to me. It sounds like it wouldn't be so bad on paper, right? Range is good. Range is everywhere in Splatoon 2. You beat everyone in a direct fight. Shouldn't you be happy you beat everyone no matter the price? Well, not exactly. Notably, it doesn't beat the range of the Tenta Missiles, Stingray, Ultra Stamp, Ink Storm, and Booyah Bomb. When the mobility is so poor, and the fact that if all encounters are direct encounters, you're not playing a shooter game right, and it does nothing else besides outreach, those are kinda problems, huh? Tenta Missiles and Stingrays are popular choices in nearly every ranked mode, while Ink Storm and Booyah Bomb are huge in splat zones. And I mentioned earlier how much ink armor exposes its slowness, and not to mention throwing range is pretty good in this game. In other words, almost every good weapon possesses one tool to outright cripple it. But it's still got the pretty good range, right? What if I told you that doesn't matter all that much? It isn't the longest range weapon by a lot, and the maps don't have a lot of spots where the E-Leader can actually flex the little range it has over a splatter scope. Many maps are small in this sequel, and lack the areas designed around the E-Leader reach. Plus, the E-Leader outright has to fully charge to beat the competition with other chargers, and the Splat Charger and Splatter Scope both get almost as much range in 60% the amount of time while having higher stats in all other areas. It's kind of sad we're this far in, and I haven't gotten to any tips yet because there were so many downsides that you needed to understand first, so let's change that. Try to get long, thin lines of continuous ink up at the start of the match to aid with swimming into position faster. The team might go with you and love you for it. It could make this weapon a choice that equates to some early points. Beyond that, warning shots to trap an opponent before finishing them off might be slow, but it's a reliable tactic in the right situation. I'd recommend picking off an enemy who is trying to engage a friend, making it easier to land the shot if they get stuck in a little ink. If your buddy hits them with practically anything, a slightly below full charge can get a pick off if they're close enough to hit with it. I'd make sure to hide behind some terrain that can be peeked out from behind to make it less vulnerable. You're gonna be so slow and weak in pretty much every aspect, so having cover and barely peeking out is your best friend. Moving forward can be deadly with how low all of your stats are. With this weapon, I'd watch the squids at the top of the screen and check the map, only acting when your services are needed and when it won't get shut down by a special. It's basically a statue, playing goalkeeper and just declaring an enemy dead on arrival if they don't have their special. For all of the special weapons it's weak to, there's a few it's not so bad against. The main shot is 180 damage, and that's a good baller buster, and can even force a booyah bomb to have to toss their load. Besides that, it's probably the greatest inkjet counter in the game, as their movement is telegraphed and their shorter range than an E-Leader. But I'm gonna say even that isn't so great. They're the two most inconsistent specials out there, making them not always require a sniper to defeat, nor making them the most popular choices. Of course, still try. 
but I'm saying that much like most else, it's not as good as it looks at first glance. I'd like to give special attention to not damage up, because that's exactly what it has. No damage up at all from main power up, yet another way it loses to the splat charger. Main power up increases the range and painting of the main weapon. There's no way to make its short charges suck any less. Ugh, and it has the ink mine as its sub weapon. Place this on the pathway into your perch when there's only one way into the sniper's quarters on the map. That's about it. It will make shooting them easier and make tap shots more workable if it tags them. I would suggest placing them in necessary parts of the map, but you're gonna need a lot of map control in the first place to make it worth the risk of going in that close with an E-leader. Its special weapon is Ink Storm. Finally, we get something semi-good here. Ink Storms are easy to throw from far away vantage points up high and cause enemies to move away from the eye of the storm, which you can see happening well. Why do I say semi-good? Like everything else, we got drawbacks. Mm, third time we're doing this one. Loads of them, in fact. Number one, without a full charge, you only hit for up to 80 damage, meaning that you still need to full charge unless they fumble around in the ink for a long time. Number two, they'll likely be moving away from you and the storm while trying to move around it. This is more to help the team rather than help yourself a lot of the time. Number three, 190 points. This is the most difficult ink storm there is to earn. Ability stacking is downright necessary to work with the steep requirement, but at least you can't stack main power up to tempt you away from using those slots on special charge up. Uh, man, I'm even contradicting myself to find anything worth defending this thing on. This is all about range, but at what cost? No part of the set can do anything up close. It sacrifices everything in the name of being the highest range, and it only has the highest range in one sense. This was a dominant Splatoon 1 weapon that they hit from every possible angle. This set offers no reliable defense, and the movement stats are the worst in the game. So if it's attacked from up close, it's just kinda done unless it gets lucky. And it's so bad they made two of them, the Custom E-Leader 4K. It's equipped with squid beacons. Whenever you've got control and your services are better used further up in the match, drop one of these. If you lose control of the map, you can pull back right away. If you lose your life, you're back on your perch instantly too. I actually quite like this sub-weapon for it. If there are multiple perches that are effective, such as on Arowana Mall, you might as well lay them down whenever you visit one so you can hop between one and the other for whatever the situation calls for. It can even be a good shield in a sniper duel, but it requires ability stacking to even get one shot after dropping the beacon. And we got Bubble Blower. This is gonna sound weird, but I feel like this one is kind of map dependent. If you're on a rare map that takes advantage of the E-Leader's range, it's kind of far to actually use the Bubble Blower to push an objective by itself, which kind of contradicts the other two parts. The shots have such low damage output that it doesn't exactly get to play with the rest of the weapon hardly at all. Object damage is terrible here. At 170 points, at least it's easier on the eyes to charge it up. This is a weapon with little defense unless it has access to its special. Every part of the weapon is slow, requiring a lot of time to produce any ink whatsoever, with high ink usage all around, too. Larger maps with the Squid Beacon's help is probably for the best. Our sucky shout out of the day, other than the E-Leader itself, is the fact that I don't like Object Shredder that much for this weapon. The damage output is so bad that it's pretty much the only bubble blower that wouldn't play it. Meet Dynamo, the heaviest roller. It's a heavy weight that sacrifices speed in all senses. It requires a long windup that leaves the wielder wide open. I mean it. An attack cannot be canceled at all, even by turning into a squid once the trigger is pulled. It's locked in for more than a second and as a result, is blown away by one hit kills that come out faster than it. In return, it shows the greatest range of all rollers. To give an idea of just how long range, I'd describe this as an annoying weapon that feels more like a charger than a roller due to the long startup, precision, and the one-hit KO. The difference from chargers comes in the long attacking arc. An arc so smooth it can actually attack over a Brella Shield or hit an inkjet or splashdown without even trying. 
In addition to attacking over faraway objects, remember that rollers excel at attacking someone on a ledge close by, and that combines to make a weapon with an effective hitbox that just sorta of deals with whatever. Plus, it's also a strong painting weapon that doesn't need to get in close to contribute and can assist teammates fighting in the front. This is a simple weapon when it comes to damage. Both swing types do 40 to 180 damage regardless of the stance, with damage falling off on the sides of the attack and when the ink falls beyond the effective reach. Rolling is a guaranteed one-hit kill at 125 damage, but really... Flinging the ink is this weapon's strong suit. Rolling is so slow with zero range that it won't matter once the user's been noticed, and following up once noticed is borderline impossible. I'd only suggest rolling if a foe is already certainly within range once a fling concludes, or if a bit of turf around the feet is needed before swimming away would work. The horizontal swing goes so long it doesn't cover the feet at all, it's not even close, and two of the dynamo sets lack anything that creates ink in less than a second. That's primarily when rolling around would work. The only exception to know with this one is how it behaves when it has at least some ink but not enough for an attack. In this sticky situation, it will still get to swing its ink, but the damage is reduced to a puny 25% of the normal amount. Managing reloads with this one is a necessity. Even a little over 20% ink and it's not doing a thing. It's important to play to its strengths and use the big range to pressure enemies and stop their advances. If it rushes in, it's probably going to lose against anything and everything. It's also cake for the enemy to read if you just swing and then immediately swim forward into the new ink that it created with how sluggish it is. Be aware of your surroundings before moving onward. Similarly, repeated attacking is a great way to run out of ink and for enemies to react to predictable timing, so mix it up and get used to the reload. Horizontal attacks are huge and cover an enormous rectangle of space, and they even take less time to wind up. Plus, one can jump with forward momentum after pressing the button to make it reach even further. Just don't jump and attack while trying to make a jump over a bottomless pit. It halts the user to a snail's pace in midair, and once again, squidding isn't allowed. Vertical attacks are hard to land from far away and require a lot of practice due to just how slow they can be, but the range is harsh on the enemy and difficult to deal with. That actually sums up the whole weapon well. It's a hard weapon to get used to, but it can sort of deal with anything if its slowness is played around with. Its sub is Ink Mine! Awareness is everything when playing this weapon, and any form of tracking makes the dynamo far easier to work with. Whenever there's a way into wherever you'll be standing, place down one of these on the way in. Heck, even place one down whenever there's a choke point. It can slow down the other team, soften them up for an indirect hit to finish them off, and with smart placement, there aren't too many ways this weapon's high capabilities can get surprised. It's also surprisingly useful in close quarters combat due to just how slow everything else comes out. It's usually the fastest option you have to possibly get away, or hit them with chip damage, or give them a point sensor just before they take you down. Far more effective than trying to swing at close range and getting nothing out of it. Its special is Stingray! With horizontal swings, it builds us up quite easily for a slower weapon. 180 points is a quite small charge too. I find it a little surprising how easy of a time it has building it, as it's long range and can use the areas normally reserved for snipers well. It's basically already in spots to earn free points or pause the enemy timer as long as it's being played smartly. The main sub and special are all useful tools in tower control, which could be a reason to play this. I'd like to give special attention to damage up! Main power up grants its effect and stacking just a little bit can make it more effective in more cases. Our sucky shout-out of the day goes to Ninja Squid. This is such a showy weapon with bad speed that this is really more of a detriment than anything else. Other rollers might play this ability, but this isn't other rollers. And next I'd like to give special attention to Ink Resista. I've said approximately 96 times how slow this weapon is, and it doesn't produce ink in a pinch. So just two sub-slots of this makes a big difference when trying to get away from an enemy. And last up, we are giving yet more special attention away, and ain't getting so special anymore, to Ink Saver Main! Certain heavy weapons get a different curve on their returns from Ink Saver Main, and the Dynamo Roller is one of only seven weapons to have greater effects from this ability. It's one of the few weapons I think actually want to run it, and run a lot of it too. With 18% ink usage from a main attack, it's pretty easy to get a sixth attack out of the main weapon with it, or just afford other things more often. The Ink Mine doesn't get much help from Ink Saver Sub, so this is a rare case where Ink Saver Main is clearly the best. 
Next, we go for the gold dynamo roller. Splat bomb. Good luck attacking more than once in tandem with this. The solution is yet again Ink Saver main rather than Ink Saver sub. But really, this sub weapon is more of a utility than a combo. The dynamo itself will be doing the heavy lifting. <laughs> Mainly, this is to fish someone out because moving forward is so risky with the dynamo. Stay in the ink and see what happens. Or just stop a super jump as it starts. Use this to paint the floor when the ink isn't going anywhere. You're far less vulnerable throwing a bomb than with a regular swing. It's useful for spacing or getting the hell out of dodge, or just helping a teammate with the explosion is faster than a swing. Its special is ink armor. 190 points might be higher than some weapons, but each swing is worth so many darn points. This ink armor feels like it helps the team more than it helps the user. A single high powered hit on the armor will shove you back out of effective range, whereas a bunch of small bullets will do a number on you before a second attack can even come out. It doesn't really allow room for a mistake for a dynamo roller, or give it a strong edge compared to other weapons, where one or two frames can be the difference between winning a shootout. Just treat this as a speedy reload, activating it when most of the team is alive. Such a quick reload that it's able to earn frequently makes the gold dynamo roller possibly the most aggressive painter there is in the entire game. And third is the Kenza dynamo roller. Its sub is Sprinkler, so this has a not so obvious perk. The rest of the set is so bad at producing ink in the snap of a finger that the sprinkler is the optimal choice for producing panic ink to get away. Damn, that's almost impressive. But you see what I mean, there's a little dot of ink on the ground as you place it down. Besides that, it is for the benefit of the Booyah Bomb! This isn't so different from how the main weapon works. A long throwing arc to do variable damage from the back. The main likes hanging back so much already, I wouldn't worry too much about panic activation. You're far enough away and the main attack would take so long to wind up that the Booyah Bomb will likely have time to get in the air and protect you faster than a swing would. 180 points is a good charge, meaning it'll get it frequently. Honestly, Booyah Bomb is the whole reason to pick this weapon. It's all it does. Though, I think if the Booyah Bomb spam is your goal, you probably play the Aerospray PG or Heavy Splatling Remix, as they'll spam it even more and have better sub weapons. Choosing this weapon comes down to how well you like the Dynamo itself, and chances are, it feels awkward at first compared to more accessible choices for Booyah Bombs. I feel like this is a weapon some people are scary with, but most prefer easier stuff to learn. Time to play your hand and roll the dice! The .96 gal is a mixture of power, range, and luck. It is the thirstiest of all shooter class weapons, is held to a slow fire rate, ink recovery lag -like after shooting, and has pitiable accuracy. It's not often that I lead with the negatives, but these heavily define this weapon and are things a gal wielder must get used to before thinking about going into any serious match. So what do you get for adjusting? Sniper-like range with no charge time, amazing kill times for the range, large bullets that coat nicely, and 62 damage per hit. It's the hardest hitting automatic gun of them all. It's also a middleweight, so the movement is pretty zippy for how hard it hits. It's powerful in some sense, but to play it is to fight a constant battle with yourself. I'd say this is a weapon that deals well with telegraphed attacks, no matter how powerful they may be. Something like a splashdown or inkjet can be shot at from great distances, and its high damage slays Booyah Bomb shields. On the flip, it can't do much against Brellas due to fire rate being more important at bringing them down. When playing, it's a normal part of life to accept that some bullets will not land, and when they just won't obey, know when to pull back. Even with knowing this, it only takes two continuous bullets before the weapon reaches minimum accuracy, so pull the trigger in spurts during a fight. There's a sweet spot to playing this. The closer you are, the more consistent it gets, but also becomes more vulnerable. Know when a matchup favors in moving closer and change accordingly. 
it might be better to let them come into your preferred range rather than telegraph your range to them. Shoot low to mitigate RNG. Shooting high means the bullet might arc and land further outside its effective range, lowering the accuracy even more. As much as it looks powerful, and it can be if luck is on your side, I would say this feels more like a long range splatter shot junior. Being able to paint a large area from a safe distance, move around decently well, and build specials. In fact, that's a big part of its identity. It paints well across a wider area without having to move around so much. If an end zap or junior isn't on the move constantly, it doesn't work. Main power up on the .96 gal is damage up. We're gonna run two mains and two subs for 70 damage since 30 is the minimum damage from most other attacks. Makes it a great supporter. Even if that much stacking doesn't fit into the build, it's still worthwhile to run at least some of this ability. This is a weapon that can get easy pickoffs whenever a foe has sustained visible damage. The fact that it doesn't have to charge up to do anywhere from 62 to 70 damage is a big, big deal. Its sub weapon is Sprinkler! I feel using this as bait rather than purely as a special builder has its value. It's only when movement is telegraphed that the 96 can hope to hit its mark with consistency. Besides that, the low ink usage is appreciated by such a guzzler. Using the two halves at once in different spots means it can build armor in just a few seconds. Yeah, ink armor. 190 points is the first thing you wanted to know. While a bit higher than the junior, it makes up for it with its sprinkler, high range, and being able to be a better slayer. Generally, the .96 gal is the third option for an armor spammer if the junior or end zap isn't chosen. The 96 can hang back and survive longer, losing its special points less than the close range options. The main trade-off is not having any other option for offense other than just shooting when the others have bombs. Overall, this is a weapon that can be strong some of the time and is able to support the team by coding the map and building it special. The main issue with the vanilla 96 is lack of options against anything that's even longer range. But hey, everything has its downsides. Our sucky shout out of the day goes to Ink Saver Main. The high ink consumption of the main weapon alone might make it sound like it would be good to stack a lot of it, but it won't be shooting for extended periods of time. We want ink recovery up to mitigate downtime instead. I also want to give special attention to last ditch effort. This weapon excels in splat zones and it's nice having it be much more ink efficient as the enemy team scores points. And now we apply the spit and polish, the .96 gal deco. It's got splash wall. You'll be safer and can move closer to the action to offset the wonky aiming from a distance. Also provides cover for friends with long range. Alternatively, it can be used to block an enemy's escape when they have a disadvantage. And then last up, we have Splashdown. Not exactly a weapon that would be close to the action or want to be sitting up high due to the piss poor accuracy. It's not in positions to use this much, though I guess one could splash while preemptively to trap someone with the Splashdown. Splash damage is 55 minimum, meaning that one shot will always finish them and... I've repeated this so much. Control of the gun is returned before the splashdown concludes. If it can get into a position to use this, it's powerful, it just won't always be able to. I'd recommend super jumping in with it at strategic times than always trying to use it the old fashioned way. 170 points is a pretty decent charge. The unique combination of splash wall and splashdown means it can strong arm its way into key points on the map by using the splashdown, then tossing a splash wall to hold the area before it's even over. Combine this with a super jump and it's oddly aggressive. It even enables its user to shoot more safely behind the wall. In a mode like Clam Blitz or Rainmaker, this can make a difference. The deco is more map dependent than the vanilla. It's a little hard to compete with an ink armor specialist that can just sort of do whatever it wants and throw ink everywhere, especially when the parts of the deco require proper placement to work. Imagine being a GooTuber. What a nightmare. This is a pretty terrible main weapon. I'm sure four of you clicked off of this video. Everyone else is ready for the Dunkening, so let's do it. This is not the shortest range charger. It's tied with the Bamboozler. Its specialty is holding its charge while swimming better than any other charger, only completely losing its progress after five seconds instead of the usual one. 
One thing that's a little disappointing is that it's a middleweight. I know that's probably necessary due to it moving its charges places, but it looks so small and like it would be light. Damage ranges from 40 to 180, but the Goo Tuber is distinct in being able to store incomplete charges and is the only charger that can deal 100 damage with an incomplete charge. Around 70% will reach this threshold without the power. But the range isn't all that good unless it fully charges. With tap shots, it's surprisingly wide and can build specials quicker than most other chargers. This is mainly so it can swim for a second and still hit the sweet damage without having to charge back up. That brings us to the drawbacks. In terms of ink usage, only six shots may be fired without a reload, and the charge speed is pitiful at 1.25 seconds for max. It has no scope variant either, since scopes would eliminate its main feature. Now, this doesn't sound like the worst thing in the world. Just charge up and swim into place. And in fact, yes, that is the first tip I'd give. Take aim before even popping out. It's nice when that works out, but recall how often you charge a rifle for no reason and give up on the charge to instead toss a sub weapon, or keep swimming, or die. And how carrying a charge isn't an issue with a lot of other chargers. Sometimes they don't even utilize it at all while still getting by. You're going through a long setup for potentially no benefit. It also needs to not hold a charge at least some of the time because holding a charge disables reload. The other snipers beat it in range, charge up faster, still can make use of swimming to reposition in most situations, and the splat charger even has the same movement stats. It's just kinda not that special or strong compared to anything else. Its main upside isn't that up, and its downsides are quite down. Its sub-weapon is Suction Bomb! Nice, I guess? Yeah, nice. The high ink consumption isn't so bad given how much chargers need to stop and hide an ink and not give away their position. Cuts off someone's escape or can stop them coming at you decently well. High object damage when chargers struggle to output continuous damage certainly covers one weakness. It's just not too much else. And it's also got a splash down. Like, maybe, uh... It's kind of a weird choice for this weapon. It could get you out of a tight spot, but it could also mean nothing. This weapon doesn't like getting in close due to how slow the other two options are at defending themselves. It's more of a potential saving throw if it's about to die anyway. Yeah, this weapon just doesn't fit together too well. Suction bombs aren't useless in any sense, but I wouldn't say the pieces complement one another. Main power up on GooTuber, as teased before, is damage up! We got something big here. Since a lesser charge is able to do 100 damage, this makes it the one and only charger to reduce its time to reach 100 damage. With three main slots, it only needs a 50% charge to get the snipe. It's wild that this is even a thing, because absolutely, this is how you play this weapon. Partial charges can be dangerous from it, so it has that one legitimate advantage over chargers. Though again, you still have a pretty long startup for how short the range is going to be with partial charges. That's sort of the problem. Bamboozler is just, well, better. Its range is constant and identical to the max range on the GooTuber that takes so long to charge up to. It also gets damage up and can hit for 99.9 .9 damage, either getting a guaranteed pick off or doing a tap shot afterward to get the kill anyway, which makes it behave much like the GooTuber does. It charges up faster, and both of them specialize in pickoffs from less than full charges. The decision to play the Bamboozler is generally if you prefer the sub and special options on the GooTuber, because they're surprisingly similar weapons outside of them. Can we do a little better the second time around? We got a curling bomb! Now we're talking! Swimming behind it immediately isn't possible, but a little charge and then swimming is usually pretty fine. It's also just a nice sub-weapon to get around with or box an enemy in place to make them easier to hit. If it chops off their toe, pretty much any excess charge in the bank will finish them. And then last up, we have Inkjet for this set. It extends outside of the normal range and lets it assist teammates by just shooting where they're shooting. If someone gets at the marker, it's pretty defenseless due to lack of meaningful damage in under a second, so be certain when activating it. The custom set lives up to its pricier pedigree. This set actually works together to form something that works okay. Really, this set isn't too bad, and it's the only one of the two that most people will ever play. If you've ever always dismissed the concept of the GooTuber as a joke, maybe give this one a try if you're a Charger fan.
Blasters, the Rapid Blaster Pro! Why did they call the Range Blaster the Range Blaster? <sighs> This one is easy enough to understand. It's a slower shooting, longer range rapid blaster with higher ink consumption. It's 12 shots per tank, but damage mobility, blast radius, everything else is completely identical. 35 to 85 per hit, and it's a middleweight. The blast has a decently long startup and end lag, meaning it's locked in place for two thirds of a second for every individual shot. With a long startup and shots sailing past the target if they miss, it's almost worthless at close range and strictly has to be spaced out well. Speaking of range, this is an excellent weapon at just poking enemies away when you need them gone. It won't deal with a sniper effectively, but mid-range slayers? Absolutely. Besides those few differences, the Rapid Blaster and Rapid Pro are played basically the same. So I'm just gonna rapid fire from here! 85 from a direct hit won't always land. It does, it's a perfect pickoff from anything stronger than minimum ink brush damage, aka anything. The first shot paints around the target if it doesn't kill, making it easy to finish the job. They're particularly helpless if they're shorter range. I can sum up playing this in one word, anticipation. It takes so long to get an attack out that leading fire and reading where they're naturally going is a necessity. It's long range, but also slow at its job. And it's got toxic mist. Boy. So yeah, if it lands, it can make the enemy easier to hit. But you know what else does that? Shooting them twice. If one is a direct hit, they're done, and it's usually easier to just dump ink on them than it is to try and land a toxic mist and be out so much ink. Generally only throw this if shooting isn't a good idea, and it would either help out the team, suppress a long range target, or block a pathway into an Arab choke point. And it's special as Ink Storm! Damage over time is a great effect, as is the ink that falls around the target. If thrown directly at someone, getting a pick is quite easy. Besides that, it's the usual get away from there. The mission is to annoy. Everything deters, nothing is deadly force. Not being able to make instant splurches of ink for movement purposes is felt strongly on this set overall. Main power up on Rapid Blaster Pro, lessen shot deviation in the air. This is normally a downright terrible downside of this weapon, so running some of this will make it more consistent. One of the few non-damaging effects to run for sure. I'd still advise holding to the ground, but sometimes you just gotta leap of faith. A secondary effect is a slight increase to the splash damage radius. While not a lot, it nevertheless makes the weapon more consistent in multiple ways. And I'd like to give special attention to Ink Resista! It takes a while to produce some ink, so anything that makes movement with enemy ink around better is welcome. Talk about a long name, we got the Rapid Blaster Pro Deco. It's got Splash Wall. This one's a little weird. It can get closer to the action with it and certainly have our teammates, but optimal spacing is so important that it might be better to just shoot than lay down one of these. It's not a bad sub weapon or anything, just not always helpful for the offense. When laying it down, it makes it easier to survive long enough to land two or three hits and makes you less vulnerable to bombs. Give the team some thought too, as well as defense. It is long range enough that it might be able to see someone coming and lay it down in time to block them or help out a teammate. And we got Ink Armor, 180 points. It's okay at building it up and really, this rounds out to a support weapon. Sure, it can use the splash wall and Ink Armor to turn a trade into a win, but it's really more about the team. A blast pair as well with someone else's attack. Everyone can benefit from a splash wall, and everyone will benefit from ink armor. Watch the map and activate it when more power is needed. Lay down a wall, then use the ink armor to make it super bothersome to bring down. Reload on a special allows for another wall without stopping, too. The complete opposite of a minigun, the mini splatling! It's been a while since we've discussed any kind of splatling. Let's recap by saying splatling range is constant and less than full charges are a valid tactic with them. This one charges far quicker than the heavy splatling and sports a full charge of only half a second. But in return, it's the same weight class, its range is quite a lot shorter, and it releases less bullets per round. 
In fact, it can only shoot for a little over one second continuously, meaning it won't be painting a large wide area. Each bullet does 32 damage with no way to increase it, which, honestly, probably gonna be a three-shot kill when there's any heat of the action. 96 and 100 aren't such different numbers when the enemy spent any time around your team. Ink consumption is surprisingly high despite everything else. It's six charges per load. While no one would call this a sniper, it's definitely on the long side of... longness. Point is, it doesn't take long to charge up, and if it pokes out on the right side of a corner, it can catch frontliners off guard with scary efficiency. It's just long range enough that anything .52 gal or below has reason to be afraid of it, and that's a decent chunk of the played weapons. Playing this effectively means being good at tracking enemy movement and keeping shorter range foes at the edge of the effective range, which takes more practice here than with longer range weapons. The good movement and low charge time should be juggled to get in, splat them, and get out. Keep them guessing. It doesn't just poke out from behind stuff like other splatlings, though. It's speedy enough at charging that it can push forward and go with buddies more than other weapons of the splatling class. It's got the best strafing speed of any weapon, so use it. No sense standing still if they can see you. Between the speed, mobility, and constant range, it's played closer to a shooter than a charging weapon. This comes full circle where we started to form sort of a new issue. While the range isn't bad, it's still kinda bad to be saddled with any charge time at all. Even though most altercations will involve partial charges, it is still shorter range and thus a worse trade-off than other charging weapons. The range is about the same as a Splattershot Pro and Dually Squelchers, which also do similar damage and continuous fire for longer without a startup. It's mainly the subs and specials that justify this one. This instantly got more appealing once you heard the name Burst Bomb! Between the stats and this kind of sub, it's easy to move all around. Tagging an enemy at all will reduce the four hit splat to three, while a direct hit or near direct hit reduces it to just two. After smacking him with a glob of ink to stand in, you can land two bullets at a moment's notice, no problem. Charging up during the travel time is particularly efficient and mean. If they're shorter range, which should be quite easy to pick up from the crowd, then there's next to nothing they can do against this play. If they're swimming away or trying to outrange, then chuck a burst bomb to finish them off. Versatility is what makes it so strong. Beyond just ourselves, your team may not have another burst bomb user due to it being so rare. So toss it whenever someone's outside of the range, retreating with some damage on them, or whenever an ally is fighting. Mini does well traveling in a group anyway. Burst bombs have defensive uses too. It's usually quicker to burst bomb to instantly create ink to swim through, making your retreats more doable. That's the other thing that it adds. Better painting when the main can't continuously fire for terribly long. I want to say this whole set is just really easy on the ink tank. It's so simple to just keep shooting and bombing, always having its moves around. Tenta missiles! I won't say this has no redeeming qualities. Splatlings do like using terrain to hide regularly, and the main weapon's long range enough that it might be in these spots naturally. Tracking is also a useful ability, and double burst bomb after a free reload can really get an enemy stuck and prevent them from swimming away from the missiles. The downside is kind of a high charge at 210 points. I get the impression they didn't like Burst Bomb Mini Splatling being better than it already was, so they made this one of the most restricted Tenda Missiles out there. Despite what the numbers say, this weapon has to move and shoot around quite a lot. It will be able to get it pretty often, and the Burst Bomb Tenda Missile combo is nice. It's not as easy to build up as other choices without ability stacking, but it still can work. Main power up on Mini Splatling means more bullets fired per charge, but does not increase ink consumption per bullet. Strangely, it's basically Ink Saver Main, but better. Could even be considered a way of better charging specials, but that still doesn't mean I'd run this over other abilities. I'd pretty much only run it over, well, Ink Saver Main. You don't have enough Zinc Mini Splatling in your diet? It's got curling bombs! Moving all around the map and getting into position quicker is the main benefit. If it gets the teensiest bit of chip damage, it reduces the time to splat, but this is only reliable in certain areas where the enemy can be trapped. Defensively, it lets the Zinc retreat and live to tell the tale. And we've got Ink Storm at 180 points! It's a more reasonable charge number. It can hang in the back and use this to push an opening, or use the damage over time to easily take a three-shot kill. All you need is four damage. 
Besides damage, this is where it gets aid in map control. I feel like between the curling bomb letting it get to the front fast so it can shoot all around, then the ink storm following it up, map control is where this one works best. And the third, Kenza Mini Splatling! Doh, I missed! It hurts me because I knew Disruptor on Mini Splatling, and I loved that. Anyway, it's kind of helpful, I guess. Could help a teammate or just set up for a charge of your own. It does slow them down, sure, but a lot of the time it's just easier to charge up and attack, as I always say. It's quite a lot of ink for what it does, too. About all it contributes otherwise is deterrent to keep the opposition from going a certain way for a bit. Ultra Stamp! Barely anything has this, so we've got our incentive! Object damage and range are the main things it adds to the mini splatling. This is about as good as a mini splatling can do at countering when someone else is coming for it. It can be aggressive, or it can do nothing. With Toxic Mist and having to charge up, it's pretty exploitable if it messes up. However, that's not to say Toxic Mist doesn't come in handy. Tagging someone with it can make it easier to rush them down with an Ultra Stamp and could be the difference between picking them off and not. On the whole, it just feels... naked. Compared to the others, everything is so situational. It's pretty often that the subs and specials just don't give it any help. An initially disliked weapon that ended up being played, the Tentabrella! It provides the ultimate defense! First, I want to get the worst thing out of the way, the speed. Everything is slower and more easily read than on other weapons. The shield is slow to come out and travel. Shooting comes with a long delay and short bursts of droplets, even if the range is upper mid. Then there's a long ink recovery lag after shielding. It's awkward to say the least. If it connects, the damage is bizarre, but can be rewarding. Minimum damage is... 17. But maximum damage? That's 119! Let me explain how the heck we got those numbers. It shoots seven pellets, and each one that connects is 17 damage. And this data is constant. There's no damage fall off, ever. It's extremely unlikely to actually land every one of them unless it's point blank. Plus, the enemy has plenty of time to react before it fires, but it slays in blaster-like times if it lands. I find generally, when it doesn't, it comes out to a two or three shot finish, which is unbearably slow if it attacks alone. It can shoot nine times before needing to refill without ink savers. A consistent weakness across all three sets is mobility. It's a heavy weight, and none of the three sub-weapons offer a way to create ink around itself quickly. It's necessary to shoot to get through enemy ink. Thankfully, the shield and shots paint all around the user, so dry feet is not an issue. Now for that defense. The canopy costs 41% of the user's ink to deploy and takes almost a full second to detach, since shooting to open the shield first is required. If that hill can be crested, then no Brella is better at supporting its team. It's extra wide, protecting from multiple sides, has 700 HP, you know about object damage being variable, and is unlikely to ever be destroyed by a single opponent. You can protect a target or given pathway from practically anything that isn't a blaster or a bomb attacking over it. As for launching the shield, in a word, yes, that's the weapon's specialty. It takes just under two seconds to be launched, but the fact that it can move forward while being so hard to destroy stalls for time and is essentially three points in ranked. Damage received is roughly half after being detached, just like the Splatbrella. They're the only two weapons with this property, so it was worth reminding. In addition to doubling its durability, the shield doesn't disintegrate for six whole seconds, then returns in about the same amount of time. Treat yourself and the shield as two halves of the same player reacting to their movements and attacking either from behind it or moving in a way they wouldn't expect while the shield keeps them busy. Playing this weapon well is to keep people guessing where you are. Deploying the shield at key times to just say nope to any kind of attack is the most important thing. The long startup time and high ink usage are the obstacles in the way of that. This is a weapon that just feels slow at everything, and sure, it is. It can take a lot of practice to even get a feel for how much damage an enemy took from an attack. It's about playing the tactics game and figuring out when to use its tools. Basically, this is a weapon that pushes the line forward, moving into enemy territory. Share the shield and think about the greater good. Almost always go with somebody or another and create openings. 
Its sub weapon is Squid Beacon. Zero chance of using the shield within a short time after using the beacon unless a special is used. So it's risky to use this close to the action. Instead, try to lay these down whenever your services aren't needed so the team has an easy time coming back in. Besides that, it's a nice convenient way to retreat if there's just not much left for Umbrella to contribute because a fight is done and it won't be able to win when clearly outnumbered. This is a good time to mention the possibility of getting a head start on deploying the shield during a super jump, mitigating some of the startup. Hold that trigger on the way in to either defend yourself or the teammate you were jumping to. It might even point blank a spawn camper like a blaster can when coming out of a super jump. On the flip side, deploying the shield and launching it can buy time for a super jump away. Bubble Blower! A special that functions as a shield for the rest of the team too? Well, we're really annoying to kill at least. It's way simpler to get 119 damage with a single shot than in other situations. While the rate of damage is poor, it can still sustain a bubble fairly well. Besides that, there's the option of launching the shield and then using the special from behind it. You're less vulnerable this way, and the bubbles collecting contact damage with the shield can really add up. Bubble blowers force openings and provide yet another defensive measure, forcing enemies to tire themselves out to do much of anything about you. Swimming with the bubbles, then activating the shield from the free reload allows for long pushes forward and for the enemies to back up. Use this in thin areas and they'll be near powerless. 200 points is a pretty high charge for how slow the paint comes out, so be wary of that when picking it. This weapon is at its strongest if it has teammates to play off of and support, but is borderline pitiful if it doesn't. Without a team that knows how to work off of it, it feels like playing a worse blaster. It's awful to try to do damage and use the shield without some sort of attacker to keep the enemy distracted. You complement one another to make this weapon. It's a cure for loneliness. Main power-up on the Tentabrella is additional HP for the shield! Stacking this can be a staggering 43% increase. That's over a thousand HP! Great effect since it likes shielding more than anything else. Maybe not worth the going overkill and stacking only that, but it's worth carrying a little bit. Suction bombs are one of the few things a Tenabrella fears, and this lessens that weakness. I wouldn't recommend this weapon at Turf Wars in the slightest. When team coordination isn't a thing and there's no goal to protect, a giant ink-hungry shield is without much to really do with its capabilities. Squid Beacon as its sub and Bubble Blower as its special are doubly unhelpful with some random teams. They can have beacons of their own or just pop bubbles you had a plan for. Whether it's Splat Zones, Clam Blitz, or Rainmaker, the Tenabrella can either stop an enemy dead in a narrow space or create openings for the team. Second up, Tentasorella Brella! Defense from the sub weapon instead, Splash Wall! I feel like this is kind of unnecessary. It's a defensive shield that takes time to deploy in return for 60% of the ink, but doesn't move, and that's what the whole point of the Tentabrella is. It's basically the main weapon again, just without having to shoot first in return for it having less health. Without ink savers, it cannot use both shields in succession, and both pieces have long ink recovery lag. About the only use this has is to preemptively stop it from being rushed down and swim away, or as an alternate shield that blasters and bombs would have a harder time getting past. It doesn't give the weapon something to contribute when it's not the right time to shield something. And we have Curling Bomb Launcher! I guess it grabs control of an area of the map and pressures. Painting and object damage aren't really a strength of other tent umbrellas, so that's certainly a new one. It actually turns the Tenta into an aggressive painter. Deploy the shield as it moves forward, spam the bombs from behind it, and shoot anybody who tries to flank the shield. Just remember no shielding is allowed during the special without wasting a huge swath of its time. More than that, it's useful for cutting off enemies or launching bombs at objects for instant damage, giving it some aggression from a distance. The curling bombs together with the shield launch means it'll be covering an entire splat zone effortlessly. Also, the special isn't the best in all modes, but it is a non-committal free reload if you just need a shield usage. I'd bring up other weapons with a special and compare them, but it's only held by this and the arrow spray, so this is a valid reason to pick it already. I would say this is more of a Rainmaker and Splat Zones focused weapon, certainly a strange one if not played on a flat stage. Tenta Camo Brella. Wow, that's a good looking brella. Ink Mine! More awareness is always a good thing. Tentabrellas are pretty well suppressed if snuck up on. The damage is nice, able to certainly reduce the number of hits to splat when the damage has such a great variable. You get two of them, so place them in choke points or in the zone if that's your mode, or on whatever objective for that matter. It changes enemy behavior and suppresses them, fitting for a pure tank. It also points them out to teammates, making you more effective at support than the other sets. 
And we've got Ultra Stamp! Been seeing a lot of you lately for a rare special. While not always the most helpful of the special weapons, we've got something big on offense. While risky, it's sometimes possible to activate at close range to turn the tables. It's valid to activate it mainly to throw it. Not a whole lot can outrange that. Besides that, it pushes into enemy territory with a shield from the front, which is precisely what this weapon likes to do anyway. I like the combo well here. It doesn't use up a lot of ink, and it has other uses than just acting as a shield. Just be wary of how vulnerable it is if anybody is left alive nearby when the special ends. It covers the weaknesses of object damage, able to just do a huge burst against something or push through bubbles, destroy booyah bomb shields, or squash a bomb launcher. It might be worth playing this in clan blitz or pushing into enemy territory multiple times as necessary to score points. We are only just now talking about the Splash-O-Matic! You'd think this would come a lot earlier on unlocking order, huh? Basically, the Splattershot Jr., if a cone was placed over it to make it 100% accurate at all times, even while jumping. Good fire rate and a decent 28 damage for how fast it shoots. It's beyond simple and easy to understand with all the other weapons that we've already unlocked. It's a lightweight with a high ink efficiency, and that's the main draw. It's a speedy boy, or gal, that rarely has to slow down, but has slightly less range than every other accurate gun. This is a weapon with a high skill floor and requires practice to perform with, admittedly sometimes frustratingly so. It's a weapon that rewards skill the most, since none of that aiming is outside of your hands, and that's the only actual weak point that might not work so well when the other team has bad internet. I'd say it comes out to somewhere between frontline slaying and support. It might seem like the straight shooting would result in poor specials, but the strafing speed is so high, and the special charges for both kits is so low for what it is, that it's a quick special builder. It can play around its special and help out the team more, though it has to get in close to do much of anything, and it's best having the initiative before trying something. Spray and pray won't work with something this short and thin. Use the movement to your advantage. Either get away or use it to mix it up in a fight. Its sub-weapon is... Toxic Mist. Oof. So, like, it can make someone sluggish and easier to hit, but it's not really a long-range weapon that can punt them shorter-range foes from afar. It kinda has to get in close anyway, so why not just shoot? About the only answer I can think of is if the enemy has lots of different ways they can swim away after reacting. I feel like when it takes swimming in close to someone after they've been hit with Toxic Mist, They'll just move away from it before you get to really get in there and do much. If it gets any use, it's the old blocking the pathway trick. Toxic range on a shooter weapon isn't typical, nor is having it on one this short. But I think this is a case of unique does not equal good. And we have Inkjet! At 170 points, this is probably the easiest Inkjet to build up. With the greater range brought by the special, it's able to support the team nicely! Main downside is no easy way to fight back if someone gets at the marker. The sub ain't gonna do much, and just shooting in a random direction probably isn't going to hit them before they hit you. My reading of main power up for Splashomatic is Damage Up! With three mains and one sub, it can reach 33.3 .3 damage. It's not necessary to stack so much, but stacking just a little will make it easier to dispatch anyone not running Ink Resista. Splashomatic is something of a blank slate when it comes to gear. Its stats are all good, with no defined weakness that a gear piece could make up for, so there isn't one correct, perfect build. You can have it moving around well, painting well, or special spamming well. Honestly, any ability works well on splash -matic. As such, this is the one time I'm only recommending abilities that are notable, rather than every ability I think could be good. You can run anything on this one. Neo Splashomatic is equipped with Burst Bump! Flippin' what? Wow! Oh, this is beautiful! Any damage at all turns it into a three shot kill. Enemies will usually try to space you out, and it's a pretty effective strategy. Just plop them with one of these after landing a couple of bullets, and it'll probably work. With such light ink consumption between both halves, tossing two isn't even hard. Main power-up gets a high recommendation on this set, because 35 is the maximum splash damage, 
and we can get into all sorts of helpful damage numbers like 32.5 or more. That's not to go into how mobile this thing is. It's a lightweight with a burst bomb, seriously. You're an obnoxious flea hopping all around with this bomb and those stats. And for the last part, we have Suction Bomb Launcher. This allows it to gain map control when it can't get in close and just makes it a painting machine. 210 points is kinda high, but it's still reliable enough at special charging that it will come up sometimes. With lightweight movement, it can keep zipping around to throw bombs all sorts of places, suction or burst alike. I would give you an overall view, but the burst bomb is the main draw for how all the parts work together. And the special is an added bonus for whenever map control is neat. It's all been said already. The Neo is a more paint-focused one, while the vanilla specializes more in aggression with its inkjet. Special attention to sub power up! Not a lot of weapons have freedom to play this ability, and just tagging people out of range makes it worthwhile due to just how good the weapon is without abilities. The pen is mightier than the brush! The Ballpoint Splatling! A splatling with two different firing modes and an amalgamation of all we've learned so far. This is probably the most complicated weapon, essentially being two main weapons instead of just one. So hang on and don't yell! For the first quarter ring of a charge, it's a better Splattershot Junior. Seriously. It's equal in damage and range, has a wider spread, and the single best firing rate of any weapon. When charged more than a quarter of a ring, it morphs into a perfectly accurate attacker, just a hair shorter than a Hydra Splatling, and the damage boosts to 30 per hit instead of 28, but slows down its fire rate slightly. It's a choice between turfing or sniping, sort of like an automatic squeezer if I had to compare it to anything. It might seem like the sniping mode is all you'd want it for, since the wide phase is so short, but the technicality that sets the ballpoint apart is the ability to interrupt its charges to continuously keep charging. It can sell its performance like a Splattershot Junior with the second best strafing speed of any weapon to keep moving and building special points. Notice how I keep saying that it's the best at or almost the best at things? Yeah, get used to that. The other mobility is good too. Not many weapons with this kind of range are middleweights. Mobility is generally not something splatlings have a ton of, so this is good. It can splat enemies at close range with a painty mode too without having to aim so much because the rate of fire is so stinking high. Using terrain is good, as is the case with all splatlings. Now let's get into the negatives. It can only fully charge four times on a single tank probably won't fully charge most of the time, opting to just charge however much is needed, but the full charge time is about three seconds. Also, raising the startup time before it can snipe, it will always be the Splattershot Jr. for the first quarter circle of release charge. So it comes out to be more like a balancing act. It wants to charge up enough to shoot far, but not too much that it reverts back to a Splattershot Jr. at the wrong time. In other words, don't play this like a charger. You'll need to be carefully managing ink usage and keeping the charge around the middle at the same time. Otherwise, it'll take a long time to act and might revert when you don't want it. Continuously charging over and over again mills their ink faster than other weapons too, as they don't have this. I like how unlike other snipers, it doesn't just have to sit down if its services aren't needed. It can still contribute by gaining ground with the other firing mode, or move around to get a better position as the line of scrimmage changes. I would also say that having to learn to play it is a downside. It takes a lot of getting used to since it has so many tools available to it, and specific triggers for activating them. A lot of people act like this weapon is overpowered and takes no skill to play because it does everything, but I would argue it takes time to get good with and is a timing game no other weapon has to play around. Not to mention shot leading being highly necessary. Oh god, it has the toxic mist. Thanks to being able to see so many things coming from far away, it can support others with its sub-weapon, either blocking a pathway, tossing it onto people, or guarding an objective. But really, why not just shoot most of the time, I always say it. Interrupting an in-progress charge isn't so worth it, and the high ink usage means barely any charging is allowed alongside tossing the bottle. 
I won't say it's worthless, but it's pretty darn close. I feel like I only ever throw this for my teammates and not so much for myself. Inkjet! Well, this thing's worthless if someone rushes at the marker. Good thing it can hang back so far. I feel like this is more of a support weapon. The main sub and special all sort of work at tossing their power where teammates are fighting. 200 points is a decent enough charge. Between that and the range, Inkjet fans may enjoy it, but Toxic Mist is pretty poisonous to the suit. Our sucky shout out of the day is... Damage Up? While it might seem easy to go from 30 damage to 33.3, the returns are piss poor, and not even three mains of it will give you three extra damage. Honestly, it's kind of the first time I would pass. I guess if it's on gear with good abilities already, it won't hurt you. I just feel it's such a minute help that you're better off running lots of other abilities with good returns instead. Why bother? Now it's the Ballpoint Splatling Nouveau! There's a name and a half. It's got Squid Beacon! Without Ink Savers, it's going to have trouble charging immediately after placing one. Use these when there's nothing to do, or there's multiple spots that you'd like to use the weapon from so it's easy to jump in between them. It's also nice to use it as a getaway whenever stuff isn't looking good so it can get back to sniping. It's a good team support in addition to all the powers that it has normally. And Ink Storm! So yeah, it's good. It's really good. It's likely in high vantage points and able to toss this into good places that can control the flow of traffic. The damage over time is good, bolstering a potential three hit kill after the enemy is in the storm for a short time. But there's a massive caveat. This is the highest special charge of any Splatoon weapon. And honestly, it's slow charging even if it's a good painter. Longer charge time means longer turnaround time to adapt its style for situations that call for an ink storm. And it's not the best to play this for a good long range ink storm weapon. It requires ability stacking to be worth it. Both ball points are kind of bizarre. Basically, they made a weapon that's a mini splatling and a hydra splatling in one, gave it a few downsides even though it effectively has two weapons available at one time, even giving it strengths neither of those weapons have individually like better mobility, and instead made the weakness absurd special charge or bad sub weapons. I find this to be one of the weirdest weapons, and I mean that in a good way. I feel like nothing like this should exist, yet it does. It's seriously two very different weapons usable at all times, and it has an answer to practically any situation. It's just something that you would mainly play for the main weapon and not for the other parts. A set of dualies that works better in tight spaces rather than requiring more space to get going, the Dapple Dualies! One of the shortest range of all weapons, and its dodge roll covers less distance than the others. But to make up for it, it's a lightweight and the roll is quick. Its base damage is 36, and the post dodging fire rate is super fast. Its time to splat is much faster than the likes of, say, the Dually Squelchers. I'd compare this most to the Sploosh of Magnet. It paints well when in normal mode and is short range, but lethal when close up. The ink consumption is practically nothing for how solid the damage is too. A dodge roll is 5% and it can shoot 150 times without a reload. This weapon has stamina to spare, able to move all around and keep shooting for extended periods of time. It won't be stalled out of ink easily. Now that said, this is probably the weakest main weapon of its class due to poor range and not being able to close gaps in larger spaces. The main advantage of playing it is high damage output, either on players or on objects like the Rainmaker Shield. It spends most of its games painting or flanking because it won't win otherwise. It's kind of a weapon for the reckless who fight a lot and die a lot, always on the move. For this specific set, it's made harder due to no sub-weapon that helps it fight. Squid Beacon. You thought I was kidding. You thought that was hyperbole. Nope. <laughs> it can be good to lay low and catch enemies off guard due to the limited range and dodging, so in those moments, a Squid Beacon would be a good use of ink. By just having these, the team will be better on larger maps, and your ink consumption is light enough that I don't see it as that big of an issue. And its special is Suction Bomb Launcher! 
Lots of space to cover and lots of object damage to do. This special is welcome as the rest of the set does nothing to longer range enemies once it's noticed. The strat from the Tetra Duelies works. Activate the bomb launcher to cancel downtime after a second dodge roll. But it isn't as helpful due to shorter and fewer dodges versus the light Tetras. 170 points is the lightest charge possible on this special weapon, and this one has an easy time building up points anyway. It might not be the best user of the suction bomb launcher, but it does give you something to work for when moving forward isn't an option. Main power up on Dappledoolies increases the damage, and it kinda sucks. It would take so much to get from 36 to any kind of higher number that would pair well with anything that I wouldn't run it. Double Dooley's Nouveau. Toxic. Mist? At least the main weapon is ink efficient. This is an unusual weapon that can actually do a lot after a toxic miss, so you might as well take the lowered enemy stats whenever possible. Could be useful to get some distance from someone rushing you down. Sorry, it's just not all that good. Like. It helps more than zero and makes it easier to get the jump on someone who might be acrobatic otherwise. But that's about it. Ink Storm. 170 points makes this one of the most spammable Ink Storms in existence. Unfortunately, like many weapons that can spam it, there isn't a lot of synergy here. This is one of the shortest range weapons to get it, and it's got to back up or have a good vantage point other to use this effectively and without risk. I sort of don't get what the Dapple Dooley's Nouveau wanted to be when it grew up. The little toothbrushes just kind of exist, having poor range, high damage, a bad sub-weapon, and a special that doesn't really do much for it. Nothing here complements one another's damage well at all. 36 is one of the numbers that I feel has helped the least by damage over time, and has virtually no say against longer range foes other than just mildly annoying them when it has its special. When playing this, perhaps go with a buddy and use the parts for their benefit more than your own. The problem with the first two sets of Dapple Duelies is that other weapons with more range do these jobs better, or just have better main subspecial combinations. But I did say the first two. Our third one is the Clear Dapple Duelies! We arrive at our fourth and final torpedo weapon! You can bet this is played already solely because of the sub weapon. It can keep a heavier foe busy for a bit, or give someone more to deal with. I feel like attacking in tandem with it is so the way to go automatically. Dapple Dooley's barely noticed 65% of their ink gone just like that from the reserve due to being able to shoot and dodge so many dang times without it. If it keeps the enemy busy for a second, you can just get the jump on him. If it blows up, any hit other than the droplets will shorten your splat to two hits. It's also nice that they finally gave one of these any bomb at all. It doesn't have to contend with a Splat Bomb or Suction Bomb set, it's just an easy choice because the others do nothing against longer range enemies and are so short reaching. And to round it out, Splash Down! So yeah, more situational special. The damage comes out to 55 or 70 if it doesn't blast them, which can pair well with 38 on the main shots. But that isn't remotely what we want. This weapon excels at super jumping, and the Splash Down is easily built up at a paltry 170 points. When putting it all together, we can super jump in with a splashdown, toss a torpedo along the ground for a quick combo, shoot, or even dodge roll after it ends. It gives so many options and is able to earn it a lot. I'd say you probably want to super jump most times you unlock this because the splashdown isn't the most helpful otherwise. It's kind of incredible how well the pieces fit together when the other two are honestly kind of bad. Special attention to quick super jump. It's downright incredible how good this ability manages to be here. Torpedo can buy time to jump away from certain enemy types. It can dodge roll out of a super jump, and also splash down out of a super jump. Really, you should always be considering a super jump as an option in pretty much any situation with this weapon. Who's that Splatoon weapon? It's Nautilus! The most awkward splatling, because it's deceptively not much of a splatling at all. The Nautilus 47! The range falls closely to a heavy, and the charge is the same as a heavy. It fires almost as many shots per round as a heavy. It does 32 damage, which is pretty much standard for all splatlings, not just the heavy. It's sometimes three, sometimes four hit kill territory, and the ink consumption is the lightest of all splatlings. So it's a worse heavy splatling with better ink efficiency. Where's the butter? 
The main identity is that it's the only Splatling able to hold charges while swimming for a little over three seconds. It's a middleweight, so the movement is the same as the Gootuber. It loses no accuracy in the air, as though it's a charger, and then is able to continuously charge without canceling out of it like a ballpoint. Yeah, these weapons are getting more and more complicated. So many tools and technicalities. So, get used to holding the Splatling trigger down just before swimming. It's a skill you wouldn't use in other weapons as a constant move and is necessary to get used to. Right away, if it's played like a Splatling, it's probably gonna lose. Using those special tools is key. It plays a lot more like a longer range Splattershot Pro, being accurate, able to swim around with charges, and keep charging and moving. As for the ways that it's worse than the heavy Splatling, the Nautilus has the worst strafing speed in the entire game. Its charge time is also atrocious. It takes a lot of charge to get a few bullets out of it. It's going to feel unplayable if used like another Splatling. Swimming is the way to be. Position and reposition like it's a gun. Have ink on the floor to move around ahead of time. What might not be realized right away is that an incomplete charge may be ferried around freely. There's basically no restrictions on charging and it's something of a balancing act to keep it going. Heck, it's just a fun way to catch other players off guard by swimming up a wall, jumping off, and having enough charge to just end them from above without lowered accuracy. When using all this knowledge, it should be pretty safe to stay at the edge of its effective range and just destroy anything smaller than itself. This set doesn't do so hot against range because point sensor. Certainly does the helping in solo play. Weapons that have to charge up aren't likely to use the point sensor due to lack of immediate pressure and having to throw away charges in order to toss them. It's better to just toss this when there isn't anything else to do or when wanting to point something out to the other players. And we got baller. And okay, special, sure. It can be a safer way out after the rush is done, or just to keep the enemy busy for a little bit longer. 180 points is nice and easy to wear. Main power-up on Nautilus is increased duration while firing, that fake ink saver main we've seen in a few other weapons. It's a helpful ability, I guess, but not a really necessary one. And now, for something completely different. The Nautilus 79. Suction Bomb! I think you already like this one better. Suction Bomb adds high damage and better pressure to the set overall, allowing it to do something when it would otherwise be pinned down or just to bust an object. And it has Inkjet. You already like hiding out and charging up in a safe place, so the Inkjet is usable from the spots the Nautilus would want to go to charge up anyway. This set on the whole is good at applying pressure when it doesn't win the range game able to just attack a bunch from far away. 180 points, again, placing it at one of the lighter sides of inkjet users. This is a weapon that cleans up a lot. It does well to follow someone else around. All three parts pair well with frontliners and pick off lots of enemies. plays more like a charger, the Hydra Splatling! Also, come on, yeah, I'm gonna tell you the absurdity that we're fighting using a fire hydrant as a weapon. It's awesome. It has by far the longest range of any Splatling. While the range is constant, the damage is not. A partial charge hits for 32 damage per bullet, while a full supercharges it up to 40. In return, and you know where this is going, it's a heavyweight and the ink consumption is 35% for a full charge, meaning only two attacks per tank without ink saver main or some recharge time. This is the harshest ink consumption of any Splatoon weapon. Then it's also the slowest charge, taking 2.5 seconds to take advantage of its fast three shot kill. If it shoots short of that, it no longer has the fast kill times. If it stops shooting before the charge is done being unloaded, it's slapped with ink recovery lag. So it's forced to just sit there and do nothing a decent chunk of the time. Surprisingly, strafing and shooting isn't all that bad. It's pretty quick compared to everything else of its weight class, so might as well use the terrain to one's advantage. 
It's possible to shoot a single bullet and make the ground more swimmable, but the movement is the least impressive of the Splatling, so I wouldn't over-rely on it. Once it gets going, the damage output is unbelievable! This thing tears stuff up! It's a 40 damage bullet every four frames. Let me break that down. That is 600 damage per second! Let me just illustrate how good that is. Ink Armor is gone in one bullet with plenty of bullets to unload after the fact. Rainmaker Shield can be popped with ease even at a disadvantage as the enemy team is about to do it themselves. Tentabrellas crumble beneath it. It can destroy a Booyah Bomb Shield by itself and still have enough shots left to beat their normal health bar. But of course, in order to do these impressive maneuvers, it must be ready to go far in advance. And while it can reactively charge up for a few bullets, it isn't as impressive without a long charge and isn't going to pull off these. This weapon functions sort of like a statue, sitting still and being ready for when it's needed. If it runs out of ink, it takes 7.5 seconds to fully charge, so ink management is a necessary skill. It's not at all hard to count just two or three attacks out, but it warrants bringing up with such a high penalty for forgetting. Honestly, if you come into this wanting a stronger heavy, mini, ballpoint, or nautilus, it's gonna suck and be bad because it's not like those at all in its role. Play this more like a splat charger or e-leader, using the terrain as a shield when moving forward at all. Unfortunately, much like those weapons, there aren't a ton of maps now that allow it to make full use of its range due to so many maps being small and compact. Also similar to those weapons, you may not have a laser aim assist announcing your charge, but what it has in its place is loudness. Anyone with good awareness will hear it charge. It requires sniping skills to hit due to telegraphing its attack and long travel time for the shots. This serves as a downright cruel counter to other charging weapons, able to outrange any splatling and most chargers without showing a laser aim assist. There's even value in using full chargers as pressure alone. It unloads over such an extended period of time that no one will go near that area, and it can buy precious seconds to take the lead. Its sub-weapon is Autobomb. This stinks. The actually good uses for Autobomb are to check and see if someone is there before moving into position, and the Hydra just doesn't move into enemy ink. Ink recovery lag from the main and sub means even more downtime, and the ink usage is so high that it can only fully charge once alongside an Autobomb. I suppose it can paint for quick points or sometimes land a lucky kill behind terrain when throwing works. It's just underwhelming and highlights the worst of Autobomb kits. Even if it does splash them, there's hardly incentive to not just shoot when its charge is so strong, and it's not like it can buy time for a longer charge like literally any other sub-weapon could. Speaking of underwhelming, it's the Splashdown! It's certainly a close range option. That's all we can say about it. I guess it's better than nothing if it's getting rushed at. It might work on a less experienced player. I feel like the only realistic use is dropping onto someone's head from the perch of choice. The super jump trick is risky due to it being a heavyweight and not able to move much if it doesn't finish off everyone. And it has no sub weapon that pairs with it. 170 points is a low charge, but it also isn't always going to be shooting or on the move. It'll probably have it whenever it finds itself up close. Probably. I'd like to give special attention to damage uh, main power up. It increases damage, but that increase is doubled when fully charged. If exclusively stacked, it can get to 48 damage, which could get a two-shot kill. What's more compelling is one main and two subs capping the incomplete charge's damage at 33.3. Since the range is constant and you can see everyone touching the ink, it works. You can get a three shot kill without needing to fully charge. There's so few abilities that help this set. Anything aids playing around the special or helps lessening the penalties for dying just aren't that helpful because the special isn't the best and it doesn't die if it's doing its job well. Because of this, might as well stack the main power up. There's just nothing else to really give it. And the alternative is Custom Hydra Splatling with Ink Mine. So, this is alright. Place it to your back in whatever way an enemy would travel to flank you. Whenever the enemy is pushed back and the line for a sniper moves up, it can place these in the zone or on a tower if it's safe, giving it something to do when shooting isn't great. Once someone is marked or damaged, it's super simple to take them out with the reach it's got. The theme is stuff that begins with ink. 
Ink Armor! This is a support player. A sub-weapon that points out things to others and a special that gives them armor. 200 points is sadly a harsh charge for something that can't move around much or keep shooting. It's a good special for it. Just stack special charge up or tenacity. Without abilities, I seriously could never earn this special even one time across all the games I played for this footage. What's nice is that there isn't really an ability I'd suggest stacking a ton of, so there's plenty of room for this and it really should be run. If nothing else, it's a quick free reload. I'm gonna be real, you like the custom better. I know you. The capabilities of this set allow it to essentially ignore death most of the time. You're the anchor that gives the rest of the team help and a safe place to jump to. The pen isn't mightier than much. Your awkward cousin's favorite weapon, the Flingsaroar. This isn't too unique of a weapon, so let's just speed through the explanation. Flingsa specializes in vertical swings. Basically imagine a splat roller if its vertical fling was roughly that of a dynamo roller. It's a Frankenstein of those two weapons with many identical stats from each. Starting with the splat roller, both are middleweights and have the same roll speed. The roll handling is slightly worse, but hardly noticeable. The horizontal attack is slightly faster while being slightly shorter range. If it sounds like it's an objectively better splat roller, remember that the dynamo's vertical attack has bad sides to it. It has a long startup, it's harder to hit from far away due to being so narrow, and while the flingza doesn't guzzle ink nearly as strong as a dynamo, it still needs to eat more than a splat roller. One thing I straight up don't get is why this weapon has such harsh damage fall off. Look at how low the damage is, even though I'm landing them several feet within my ink. The Flingza also got ink recovery lag thrown in as a nice bonus, I guess it's just lucky. This feels like a weapon without much of a point. The vertical fling of the dynamo was never the reason to play that weapon. It was already long range without it and could cover so much ground effectively. The vertical fling being its only advantage makes it slow, precise, and no better at most things than a splat roller. Plus, it looks like it certainly hit somebody after all that buildup, then you find out it's a three hit kill instead. Surprise. I feel like this is meant to be a versatile weapon and cover many bases at once, but it just kind of sucks at most things when rollers are already limited in how they work. You wouldn't want to use the roll for much even if it is one of the better ones at it. The horizontal attack is objectively weaker than plenty of other options, and the vertical attack that I feel was supposed to be the main selling point just isn't really the draw of the class and has so many downsides. This is a weapon with low consistency across the board. The vertical attack is good at moving around the map, poking from outside range, painting, and hitting up on nearby ledges. That's about it. If the Splat Roller is your favorite, but you keep feeling like you want a longer range option to move without being slowed down, that would be the reason to try the Flingza. Splash Wall doesn't make any sense for it. This is a weapon that likes moving around, poking, and if it can, surprising. It's good when the area needs to be held for a bit, but any other Splash Wall does this job just as well, and lining up for a vertical fling behind it is pretty slow and easily read by the enemy. Splat Bomb Launcher! This is the set's entire identity. Splash Wall can protect it to get full use out of it and take control of a large area. The special offers a more reliable long range option that isn't narrow and doesn't require a long start. 180 points is good. Not much else to say there. That's the best thing the Vanilla Flingza has going for it. Control over large areas from the main weapon or the special. It's pretty niche. Main power up for the Flingza is damage up! I can't recommend an exact amount to stack because the damage is so variable and wide. Just try it on the moving dummies and see what feels right. Anything that aids in consistency is a good thing. Your foil is the Foil Flingza Roller! It's equipped with Suction Bomb! While ink hungry, having a bomb available at any given time is a definite plus over the others and gives this one a more potent feel. If it doesn't hit, it'll still hold them off. Besides that, good object damage when swinging twice would suck and it can reach places that rollers cannot. And it's got Tenta Missiles! It might not always be the right time to use it, but it gives it a way of being annoying and possibly allowing a way in. 180 points is all right, and it should earn it often. All three parts of this one do a good job poking the enemy team, giving them less room to swim around, and making them scatter from a distance. 
This pairing is a constant nuisance. The heavier, longer nose you didn't want to be born with. Ah, uh, don't worry, it has its perks. The H3 Nozzle Nose! It's a rare burst mode shooter. The bullets are larger than the L3, hit for a massive 41 damage, and will always splat an enemy in one burst if all three connect. As expected, ink usage is higher, but that's not really an issue due to still being easy enough to work with. The big issue is a slower fire rate and a much, much longer pause before another burst can be attempted, making it a challenge to connect three hits on a moving target. This one is a middleweight weapon, but that doesn't mean it's the same as the L3 in mobility. The evasive feel is sacked due to slower movement while shooting. A surprising thing about the H3 is that the accuracy doesn't change in the air. That's one movement option you always have that few weapons can use effectively without running abilities. Being able to splat in one burst sounds like a dream come true, but the overall style of the L3 is sacrificed to just focus on that. Besides that, all mechanics of burst motors apply. Here is the most obvious tip. It is a requirement to lead fire to master the H3. Who could have seen that coming? The range is identical to a Splattershot Pro, but with the bullets being so low in rate, it's quite a time for those shots to travel and land at their mark. It takes much practice for this thing to really work and can be frustrating at first. Pick your battles, use the range well, don't be caught off guard. It's as effective as it is safe. Besides that, it's better to swim and reposition than run everywhere, since you're forced to cool it for a third of a second after every burst anyway. Use that downtime to do more than just stand there and be easy to shoot. It's able to move around thanks to the large bullets creating a nice line of ink without many gaps. It's almost like a curling bomb if I'm being honest. This weapon is surprisingly not weak at close range, able to point blank the three shots for a reliable win. Though I recommend only doing this if you have the initiative. If they're within close range, already have visual on you, and you miss one bullet, almost every weapon will win. Another weakness is object damage. While the hits are high powered, the damage output has so many pauses in it for a gun. All nozzle noses have a damage increase against many objects to mitigate this slightly, but it's still not great. Its sub weapon is... oh gosh, no damage from the sub weapon, we got point sensor! You're naked if they manage to rush you. It's checking an area to make sure it's safe or an aim assist on such a precise weapon. Besides that, it points, I've been making that fun a lot lately, things out to other players and can be a help to the whole team in ranked. That's all it can be. I'd recommend always having more ink to move around in since the sub weapon doesn't offer spacing options. And our special is Tenta Missiles! Tied for the easiest missile set to build at 170 points. It hangs back a lot already and wants to be safe due to no damage from the sub weapon, so it'll be able to get some use here. Though I think the sploosh will do it faster, this one can hang back and not die as much, keeping that special for longer. All parts of this set offer tracking, which makes me think this was intended to teach good H3 gameplay and meant for practice. It's easier to hit the mark when in experience with this one, but it sacrifices basically everything it could have in order to do it more effectively. There isn't really any damage bridging here or combos unless a missile just happens to land nearby. Its only direct attack is shooting, and it's the exact same set as the Dually Squelchers. Main power up on the H3 is downright crazy! Damage up! With three mains and four subs, certainly a lot to stack, but trust me, it's worth it. It can mitigate the damage fall off well, but also get to 49.9 damage in a single hit! This makes it a two-shot kill in darn near all situations, and drastically raises the consistency. Downside is, that's only five sub-slots left over for the rest of your build. As always, experiment before marrying a build. But all this set has is gunfire to attack directly, and it's basically stuck without main power-up stacking as a result. On to equipment, I want to give special attention to... Uh, abilities that have high returns from one sub-slot. I'm talking quick super jump. Bomb Defensa, Ink Resista, Special Save, those kinds of abilities. When there's so few subslots to go around due to all the main power-up stacking to optimize performance, those little abilities mean more for the H3 than other abilities since stacking swim speed up, special charge up, or ink savers are just out of the question on most builds. This also means the H3 will have a more sluggish feel than other middleweight weapons if it prioritizes damage. So if it feels slow, that's normal. Coming to you in H3D! 
It has Suction Bomb! This gets rid of a weakness against weapons that are even further reaching. If the splash damage lands, then a two-shot kill is easy even without damage up. It's also just nice to box people in and make them fight you at a disadvantage. Object damage is normally kind of bad with downtime between bursts and general slowness, so this gives it something to pop their objects. Ink Armor is the special! Playing around the Ink Armor sounds like a good idea for such a long-range weapon, and yes, it can be a good direction to take the playstyle in, and can aid with surviving long enough to get a second trigger pull for yourself. The weapon also paints surprisingly well for how slow it appears, but this comes with some big downsides. One is the charge. At 220 points. That's a steep ink armor charge. The highest of any weapon, in fact. And not even by a small margin. In other words, you're stacking special charge up instead of damage up to get consistency out of it. There just aren't enough slots to go around, and something has to have its consistency lowered in order for the other one to thrive. That isn't to say this weapon is bad. The individual parts are all good, it's just that every part of the weapon is buffed tons by ability stacking, so you're forced into picking one part to center your play around. Heck, the suction bomb could use quite a bit of ink saver sub as well. Equipment looks quite different this time around. With ink armor being so useful, it's arguably worth it to run special charge over main power up. Damage up is still helpful, and I'm sure many of you would say it's absolutely better to two shot kill than playing around a special, it just depends on the playstyle. Both are run quite often. Running two subs of special charge will get the ink armor down to about 209 points. All of my action figures are cherry, H3 nozzle nose. Splash wall! I fell in love with you once on an H3, and I have done so again. Great, great sub weapon, allowing the H3 to push forward more than it could otherwise, and just be a tactical nuisance because walls affect enemy behavior in ways that can be predicted. It's also very helpful to use this near uninkable turf so it can just shoot however it wants without being in danger. Beyond that, it can score free points and help out others. And it's got Bubble Blower. Okay, that deflated. While it is good with the range, and many would compare this to a Splattershot Pro with better damage, it's sadly not the most conventional special for it. Object damage is a weakness, and without Shredder Shoes, it just isn't going to be able to pop these in a pinch. Even with it, it's not great. More than that, the bubbles tend to be used for defenses unless a teammate with good damage over time helps out, and that's unreliable without being on a comp team. 180 points is a low charge for a bubble blower, but that's mainly because it's a more limited set that doesn't play off the bubbles all that well. Another problem is that the cherry doesn't do anything quickly, so if it messes up, it's basically dead. It's to the point where I'd say your decision to play this comes down to how much you value Splash Wall on an H3 more than anything else about it. Yeah, so we have another gear-dependent weapon where either the main or special is getting sacked so the other one can thrive. It's sadly a pattern with these H3 weapons. We're starting off with the weapon that begins every kid's journey to be the hippest and hottest squid in town, the Splattershot Junior! The Splat Charger! The Ink Brush! It's the Blaster! Roller Al Carbon! The NZAP 85! The Splat Brella! The Splattershot Pro! Splatter oh, the the Ink Brush Splatter Roller! Roller. The Kim's the Charger! The Splattershot Pro! The Splattershot Texture! The Two Light Technique! The Stry Slosher! The Jet Squelcher! The Clash Blaster is not an overpowered mess. Our final weapon is the closest thing Splatoon has to a flamethrower. A short range, low damage weapon that sprays AOE in a constant stream. It's such a speedy blaster that it feels more like one continuous attack than a bunch of small ones. About all it's missing is some damage over time that sticks after hitting. Other than that, it's a flamethrower. So, I see a lot of people complain that this thing is way too cheap. It's not a bad weapon. We've got lightweight, low ink consumption for a rapid blaster, and it's really good at pressuring an enemy even if it doesn't beat them. The area of the blast is huge too, so it's likely to at least pressure with any shot. In modes like tower control, it's pretty irritating if it pops up at an unexpected moment. But that's about where the positives end. I hate to say it. The damage per second is simply peanuts. Some of the worst unless it always lands a direct shot. A direct hit is 60, and it shoots three times per second. But 30 splash damage? 
and 15 spark damage makes it one of the slowest at counting to 100 possible. Basically, it can poke around obstacles, but it won't do much more than that. It takes two direct hits in a row to get a decent kill time, otherwise it's three or four or five or six or a seven hit kill. The range is about that of an Octobrush, and the damage is usually quite poor, so it outright requires initiative. The blasts are exceptional in mass, able to reach about that of a splatter shot, but again, it's deceptive because the damage at the end of that range isn't going to do much. We're talking about the epicenter when we compare it to an Octobrush. That's the thing. A Clash Blaster annoys the enemy and gets in their way. It isn't an assassin's weapon. Anyone who notices a Clash Blaster at all will outrange it and do damage so much quicker because it can't shoot back. Seriously, if a Clash Blaster is always getting the better of you, it's because it either caught you off guard or because its annoying style successfully provoked you into a fight. It is an annoying weapon to get pelted by and sounds painful, but it's not at all a fast killer and is exploitable. The area of effect can be dangerous, but just stay out of it. It sounds like I'm giving tips for fighting against it, and I guess I kinda am. But I wanted to show how pronounced both the strengths and weaknesses are, and this was a way that I could do that. Another weakness is strafing speed. It's practically nothing. Though in spite of that, holding fire and W is how you play a flamethrower to keep them inside of the hitbox. Its sub-weapon is Splat Bomb! The old Splat Bomb on a short range blaster. Good sub-weapon for this thing. Any non-shot source of damage is good. It can get a kill all on its own, bring someone down with it, or just suppress the backlog. This is the scrappier fighter of the two available sets from this alone. And we got Stingray. Oh. Uh, not looking so good in your review. It's just not possible to make good use of this without a retreat. I guess when it's noticed and in a no-win situation, it could duck behind a dumpster to super jump away and do this before coming back in. It's something I wouldn't call useless. A Stingray is a Stingray but it feels pretty tacked on. 180 points makes it one of the lowest charges of any Stingray, though the range is so short that it's not the best painter. Main power up on Clash Blaster is better accuracy in the air. We couldn't get one last damage up in. I wouldn't stack a lot of this, but it couldn't hurt, and this is one of the better main power up abilities that isn't damaging. Our final sucky shout out is Run Speed Up. I wish this buffed the Clash Blaster made. I really do but it's downright nothing in terms of returns. Maybe it would have been overpowered if it could keep up with the other weapons or something while holding forward and shooting, cause wow, it's terrible. Seriously, try stacking tons of this. There's no difference. Clash Blaster Neo. Late to the party showing up with its curling bomb. We trade damage from ability and object shredding. This set has its advantages, able to distract, reliably move through enemy ink, or just make it difficult for them to move out of the way and keep them close by. Surprisingly a pretty reliable sub-weapon even if the alternative is a splat bomb. And its special weapon is Tentamissiles. Another special that requires backing up some to use. Though I wouldn't call it as committal as a stingray. The tracking certainly helps and gives them something to worry about other than just shooting back and outpacing your damage easily. It kinda rules if it tags someone close enough to swim up to as well. The blasts are pretty big and make it tough to move around and avoid the missiles even if they do shoot you, which could give a trade when it would be a loss. 180 points is easy enough to work with, not too bad. Has good synergy with the curling bomb able to approach when the missiles are a-flying. Modified weapons, but it's for the greater good! Grizzco weapons! These show up on weapon rotations with question marks. A green question mark gives a random weapon with the possibility of giving one fixed Grizzco weapon when it rolls. There are special days that have only happened a handful of times within five years, where the rotation was four golden question marks. On these days, the team will be using four Grizzco weapons in every round. And we begin with Grizzco Blaster! 
The blasts have 35 minimum splash damage, 50 direct damage, and the range is that of a Luna Blaster, but the rate is that of a .52 gal, making it the fastest blaster of them all. Clears out mobs of enemies incredibly, and often scores multi-kills. As a blaster, it can deal flanking damage to scrappers and bring down a stinger fast. All weapons in Salmon Run have splat bombs for their sub and no abilities allowed. Plus, Mr. Grizz hands you these weapons without any choice, so... Abilities and special weapons and synergy are pretty irrelevant to how it plays. Not a whole lot else to say. It's broken and that's the point. Grizzco Brella. An undercover Brella that has no Brella. So I guess it's just a Grizzco. Holding ZR fires continuously at the same rate as the .96 gal and does 60 damage per hit. It's very ink efficient, able to fire 50 times on a full tank. I'd probably describe this as the least remarkable Grizzco weapon. It's basically just a more efficient, more accurate .96 gal, which is nice, but it doesn't really specialize in destroying specific bosses. It's just a really good gun. Grizzco Charger, a modified bamboozler. As a refresher, or a uh, first time information because we haven't gotten that far yet, Bamboozlers have constant range, and this plays off of that by having instant spammable shots and equal range to an E-Leader. Another unique trait is the high striving speed to make it feel more like a shooter weapon while it spams away. The trade-off is damage. It deals 200, which is good. But it just barely isn't a one-hit on most boss salmonids, since standard chargers get bonus damage against practically all types of salmonids and bamboozlers do not. The ink consumption is 13%, so it can actually unleash seven attacks before having to reload. While it won't be one hitting a steelhead, this is a solid weapon as it takes out bosses from afar while being non-committal. Even if you're bad with chargers, this doesn't take nearly as much skill to just pound on weak points to help out the team. And lastly, Grizzco Slosher. As powerful as they come. It's a crossbreed of the sloshing machine's attack type and the stingray doing continuous damage as it pierces through anything. The damage is utter madness at 150 minimum splash damage and 360 on a direct hit. The sloshes are the slowest continuous attack of any Grisco weapon and travel so slow that they stick in the air over a period of time and then disappear after traveling a fixed distance roughly equal to the dynamo roller. As a trade-off, this has the highest ink consumption of nearly any weapon, legal or not, at 25%. Due to the simply titanic damage and ability to pierce through solid objects, this just ends scrappers and drizzlers without even having to wait for an opening. It damages through the splash walls of a griller or a steel eel and is a rare weapon that can directly attack steelheads and the cockpits of flyfish. It's the ultimate weapon of Splatoon 2. A weapon so strong, they named a mode after it, the Rainmaker. A shield around it must first be broken by loading it full of your own ink color more than the enemies. The shield does damage to all who touch it, and it is lethal if it breaks too close to the opposite team of who busted it. Many weapons have bonus damage against the shield to make up for poor firing rate or damage so that everyone can contribute well. Some examples of main weapons with buffs are nozzle noses due to their lack of continuous fire, or the sploosh matic to make up for it having to get so close to the damage zone. Potent attacks at destroying the shield include bombs, bomb launchers, and stingrays. Popping the shield is worth points, as it covers much of the ground and is likely to give an instant special. Though popping is just an advantage and not a guarantee of objective control, someone else could always run up and take it. Once claimed, the Rainmaker shot properties are unique, having to charge up to lob a ball of ink that does lethal damage within the marked area at a full charge, but it has a slight delay after landing. The shots consume zero ink, so don't think twice. This is a greedy weapon that hogs all the glory for its golden hide. Sub and special weapons are completely disabled, making the main attack the only move the player can execute. This means no super jumping, and picking it up during a special instantly cancels the rest of the special. Make sure that the special has served its purpose before snagging it. 
Pretty much all the help it could even get from another part of a weapon is some form of a throwing attack right before picking it up, or a curling bomb opening a path to swim through it for immediate points. Picking up the Rainmaker changes the player's weight to super heavyweight. It's the only weapon that belongs to this class. It's a mean 20% hit to the swim and run speeds, but equipped abilities still work to lessen these penalties. The holder of the Rainmaker has their location announced to all players at all times, and is at an extreme disadvantage to being rushed due to the bad movement speed. Camping with it in safe places is a no-no to get around this. It must be rushed down the center of the map. Should you run out the Rainmaker's timer, disobey the posted signs, or disobey the Rainmaker speaking into your mind, it kills the player and any nearby teammates. Don't mess with it. Most maps only have one or two pathways for the Rainmaker to reach the goal objective, and requires traversing through uninkable turf for at least a little bit. Go into Recon and see what these force pathways are like. When combining how powerful yet punishing and committal the Rainmaker is, it's best to grab it when there's an escort ready to help or when there's a clear man advantage indicated by the squids at the top. Be mindful that if the Rainmaker Carrier Special is ready to go, this special can never be used once carrying the Rainmaker without dying first. The Rainmaker's 8 can't charge the special gauge either, so all special weapon monkey business gets put on hold. All of this data shows that it's certainly possible to score impressive kills with the Rainmaker, but it's best off working together with other players and trying to pick up assists with that large blast area, since it's so locked down and slow. The other team can outmaneuver anything a Rainmaker tries by itself, all while knowing exactly how it's moving and where it is. For equipment, these abilities are being recommended in a different way. I'm showing you the abilities that help and harm the Rainmaker so you can better select a main weapon that would also benefit from these abilities. Swim Speed Up mitigates the weapon's great weight. Run Speed Up raises the strafing speed, which is a teeny bit helpful when having to charge sometimes at least. Object Shredder makes the shield easier to pop and can make all the difference when both teams are firing on it. Especially consider this if the weapon kit would benefit from it anyway due to having a special like Bubble Blow. I recommend Bomb Defense Up DX, as always, even for this thing! It's a bit of protection against ink jets, which are a decent enough counter to how it works. Our sucky shout-out of the day goes to Ninja Squid. This only hurts the Rainmaker since the location is announced to all players anyway. It slows you down for no benefit at all and makes this a pretty bad ability in this mode. And last up, I don't see any need to recommend any stages for the Rainmaker because you kinda don't get a say in that. A Rainmaker map is a Rainmaker map, that's all there is to it.